the hour of one o'clock having arrived, the uh, Santa Cruz City Council for the meeting of April 25th, 2023 is called to order. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Quorum having been established, we will proceed to our closed session agenda. This would be the opportunity for anyone who is either with us in chambers or online to make a comment about our closed session agenda. Uh, let me ask Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We have nobody online. Uh, anyone with us in chambers wish to make comments? Seeing and hearing none, the council will now adjourn into closed session. We will return on or about two o'clock, not before that, uh, for our regular uh, session of the city council. At this time, we stand adjourned into closed session. Recording stopped.
afternoon. The uh, Santa Cruz City Council is back in session for its April 25th Recording in progress. Third meeting. Uh, let me ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move forward on our agenda. Our first item is item four, a Master Recycler Volunteer Training Program recognition. I'll recognize Ms. O'Malley. Good afternoon. Love my presentation here. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, fellow staff, and members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to come today and give you some information about the City of Santa Cruz Master Recycler Volunteer Training Program. Next slide. So the program was started in 2018 was our first class. It was paused in 2020, and we just resumed this year in 2023. Um, so we started a master recycler volunteer training program because we really started to notice a lot of contamination in the curbside recycling carts. In 2017, National Sword was the operation with China and the East stopped accepting a lot of recycling. So it was important for us to educate the community about recycling contamination. And we also um, got a lot of feedback from tours and people that attended the tours at their facility. We wanted to build community awareness and most importantly, we wanted to stress the priority of waste reduction. Next slide. So our vision originally, the great news is when I first gave this presentation to council in 2017, the vision was just written on a page and there were no pictures, so now we have some great pictures that have come to fill this page in the five years. Next slide. So the framework really is uh, 20, up to 25 people. They attend two-hour sessions weekly over the course of six weeks, and then they commit to 20 hours of volunteer service over the course of 12 months. Next slide. Curriculum is an opportunity to educate our residents that there is a difference between the city of Santa Cruz uh, our recycling and what we accept curbside, but also how it's different in the county and also even for um, those who attend school up at UCSC and our off-campus residents. It was an opportunity to um, prioritize the food education, waste reduction, and uh, compliance with state and local policies. Next slide. Some of the tools and uh, knowledge that we get to leverage with our program through the Master Recycler program is we engage with city schools. We have a dory pole lending program to mitigate litter from balloons, our food scrap diversion program, our newly uh, curbside collection program, food scrap drop off, and our home composting rebate. We have our annual garage sale weekend that's coming up, and then Earth Day, which we just had this past weekend. Um, next slide. Then the master recyclers at the end of their six weeks of training get to decide how they're gonna spend those uh, 20 hours of volunteer time. Many of our newest uh, participants started to fill their hours this past weekend at Earth Day. So they man way stations at city events, community outreach and education tabling. They look for alternatives to hard to recycle materials. And then they bring awareness to the community about some of our policies like our environmentally acceptable packaging and products ordinance. Next slide. We did have to pivot during COVID, as we all know, and are still doing a little bit. Uh, we were able to maintain the participation through online chat groups, uh, in social distance volunteering out on the curb to help get carts restickered so that residents knew what went in there, and then a monthly newsletter and special guest over Zoom. Next slide. So the great news is in 2023, having just adopted our climate action plan, it'll be more important than ever to help uh, our residents understand the importance of recycling, but as we prioritize waste reduction. Next slide. Here's a list we'd like to say thank you to all the participants, almost 100 over these years. And Bonnie, if I could ask you to just click on that blue link reflections. And then there'll be one more arrow to start. Okay. Um, well, when we check back into the, the video that was uploaded, we had some words from some of our master recyclers to share their reflection and their input for our program. 
So thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about this program, and uh, we look forward to coming back in the future with new updates. We're going to see if we can get this. Yeah, just at the bottom, the reflections, if you click on that. Gotta love technology. No, it's all okay. good. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much, and all of the volunteers. It's just wonderful work that you do and providing an opportunity for other people to help make this a stronger, better community. Thank, thank you so much. Let me ask if, if council members would like to make any remarks. So I think on behalf of the council, uh, Ms. Bruner. I just wanted to briefly say thank you so much. I know that I've been up at the uh, recycling center and have um, done one of your tours and not the master recycling program, um, but it's so informative and so important and a wonderful um, community engagement, uh, kind of a light bulb on <laughs> for a lot of people I know that have gone through the master recycle program. And, and what a great way to have those people share with their neighbors and other people and to be engaged in events. And, and I saw them out there for Earth Day, so thank you for all of your work um, around this. Thank you. Very good. Very best wishes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate all the help you've provided to the city. Thank you. We are on item number five, a proclamation declaring the month of May as Affordable Housing Month. And uh, I imagine every member of the city council uh, is excited about that. Uh, I know that every member of the city council has been working on housing affordability for some time as our members of the community. What I'd like to do is invite Bonnie Lipscomb up. Uh, I'll present the proclamation. Ms. Lipscomb asks her to make some remarks. I see that there's some other wonderful people like Mr. Lane and others who work in this space. Thank you, Mayor and um, Bonnie Lipson, Director of Economic Development and Housing for the city. This is our Thank favorite you. month. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is our favorite month of the year, and um, our housing team, I just want to acknowledge, is at the back of the room. Um, so if you guys can raise your hand. We have Jessica, Jess, Andrea, Tiffany, and Emily, and they work day in, day out on affordable housing and housing programs throughout the city, from implementing our CDBG Community Development Block Grant Program to doing housing agreements to ensure affordability on new units that are created in the city, monitoring those units, um, administering programs for housing preservation, tenant assistance, emergency rental assistance throughout the city with many of our community partners. They work hard, so thank you. Um, there are many exciting events this month, and um, I think Bonnie may have something she can put up on the screen, um, which shows all the events, and definitely the, one of the, the most amazing first events, one of the first events is a kickoff, um, and I know that Don Lane, who's here today, um, is, is leading that effort, and that's an Affordable Housing Month kickoff um, with Housing Santa Cruz County. And so you can see the in-person events. We do have this flyer with clickable links to register for any of the events on our website under our housing page. And if you scroll down to the bottom, I'll just mention also there's a lot of great virtual events. Um, we at the city are putting on a couple of virtual events, which are Affordable Housing Finance 101 class and Housing Choice Voucher Program webinar um, with Housing Authority. And so just a lot of great content this month. And so hopefully um, all of you can get out to attend a couple of these events, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lane, come on up. Mr. Lane's the co-founder of Housing Santa Cruz County and, of course, a former mayor of this body. Thank you so much for everything you do. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, sir. And I especially send greetings to the other co-founder of <laughs> Housing Santa Cruz County. Council members, great to be here. Thanks for giving me this moment. I, do, I just want to echo um, the comment about May 6th, Affordable Housing Month, our, kind of our launch event. And it's set, it's going to be big and diverse. We're doing it at Cabrillo to be countywide. We have an author, Shane Phillips from UCLA, who's a policy expert, but then we also have an, a children's book author who's written about housing gentrification in her in her neighborhood in the neighborhood, led by a nine-year-old battling that gentrification. 
We have all kinds of different ways people can engage, and that's what Affordable Housing Month is about, is lots of different ways to engage at lots of different levels. So we invite people to come out for that and on May 6th and then all the other events. And then one final shout out, those guys behind you and you guys right here, Santa Cruz is really kicking butt on affordable housing right now. There is so much great work going on, more to come, but just was reminded by an article I just read that almost half of all the housing units being built right now or have recently built in Santa Cruz are permanently affordable units. And that is not something that many other cities are doing. So shout out to you for that great work. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. Thanks to all of you back there. God love you. I really appreciate all the work that you do. I know that to some extent you you toil in obscurity over in, uh, in that and don't often get the, the kind of recognition we're giving you right at this moment. But uh, lots of what Don Lane just said about being able to hit numbers and, and exercise some real leadership on this is because you're so creative and thoughtful and imaginative about how you can pull in money from any and all sources possible to make uh, the housing that is constructed uh, as affordable as possible. So thank you all very, very much and best wishes to you all. Thank you. Council members, we good? All right, there we go. Uh, our next item is item number six, and this is declaring the week of April 30th through May 6th as Municipal Clerks Week. So Municipal Clerk. Uh, which would, of course, for those of you not familiar maybe with, with city government, the city clerk's office is the small end of the funnel for getting us to this moment every other week, which is to assemble the agenda, the packet, uh, and provide all manner of other support activities for uh, this governing body as well as for the city generally. And we are very blessed to have two outstanding public servants uh, uh, Bonnie Bush, uh, who is our city clerk, and Julia Wood, who is the assistant, that do a great job all the time, and much the same as our affordable housing people. You sit here quietly uh, every other week and help us get our business done, and we literally, literally, not figuratively, could not do this without you and your very fine work. So thank you so much, and we acknowledge your, your great work by declaring this April 30th to first week in May, uh, City Clerk Week. Thank you all, you both, very, very much. I don't have much to say, but I will be the first to say, and I say this every year, I recognize that not a lot of people know what we do. <laughs> so I appreciate you giving a little um, foresight of that, but um, I really appreciate this. And on behalf of Julia and the clerk's team, thank you. Very good, very good. And I understand you have a new member of your team as well. You, yes, uh, we have um, tell us who this Brit is. Brittany, who is our um, admin assistant three, our new um, member of the clerk's team. So swing by and say hi to her if you guys are in the area. Very good. Thank you both very much. Best wishes to you. Thank you. All right, uh, we are on item, uh, we are on presiding officer announcements. I have none, statements of disqualification. Any member have a statement of disqualification on today's agenda? Seeing and hearing none. Additions or deletions, are there, uh, Madam Clerk, any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are none. No. Okay, thank you. City Attorney reports out of closed session, sir. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor good afternoon. Healy, members of the City Council. This afternoon, the Council met in the Courtyard Conference Room at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon to discuss the following three uh, closed session items. The first was a conference with the City's labor negotiators concerning two bargaining groups, the SEIU temporary employees and SEIU service employees. Item two was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, the claims of Brent Barbera, and the claim of Christopher Allen Malsek. Those are also listed this afternoon on your consent calendar as agenda item number 17. Uh, lastly, the council met with legal counsel to discuss one item of significant exposure to litigation. Uh, council received a report 
on that item, and there was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. Council meeting agenda. Madam Clerk, anything we need you need to draw to our attention in that regard? Nothing. No. Nope. All right. Very good. We are on the consent agenda. This would be items 8 through 26 on today's agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with it, the consent agenda, we will take up all of those items on one vote. If you wish to make a comment about or have an item pulled, first let me ask the council if you have any items you wish to have pulled or further discussion on them. Council Member Watkins. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have some uh, proposed language to add to item 12, so I will go ahead and pull that. For item 12, that will be pulled. Any other council member wish to have an item pulled? Any council member wish to make comment on any of the consent agenda items? Seeing and hearing none, this would, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, excuse me. 23. Would you like that pulled? No comment. Comment, please proceed. I just want to say that um, this was brought to my attention by uh, kids at my house and kids outside of my house that go to Santa Cruz High School along with city school staff. Um, and I just want to appreciate that this is more complicated than I think the council initially thought. And I really want to thank Heather and Matt and other members of the team um, in collaborating with Santa Cruz City school's leadership in trying to resolve this issue. And unfortunately, it's not going to be as quite easy as we thought to fix. But I just want to acknowledge that it's people are working on it and working really hard. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else, Ms. Brown? I just have a very quick comment on item 27, which is a confirmation of the city's commitment to uh, using CDBG funds to uh, Oh, I'm sorry. 27. No, I'm sorry. It's the number is wrong. The number is wrong that I just gave you. Um, it's um, I just had it written in my notes wrong. Um, where is it? Um, let me find it. Okay, never mind. I, it's um, no, no. Take a second. Just take a second. It's fine. No, 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 it's okay. We're going to be here all night anyway, so <laughs> another no, two we, minutes we, is I'm matter. good. I'm good. So 27, I've got. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just. Um, yeah, my other comments. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't know what I'm doing. Today. It's all right. It's all right. All good. All right. Anyone with us who wishes to make comment on a uh, on an item on the consent agenda? Good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I have a couple items on the consent agenda, but first I want to say I really appreciate the clerk's work, particularly in this room. Probably dealing with clerks in this county professionally for 25 years and extremely dependable. That's very um, kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah. So, number 11, initiative number 21 0032A1, the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. I don't know what to say except that it's extremely comical. What corporation would want the actual citizens? that are the peasants to actually use the laws against the corporations. So City of Santa Cruz is a corporation, so why would they? I mean, I, I think anybody would really appreciate reading some of the dialogue in number 11. I know I had fun yesterday, and I'm glad that number 12 is coming up for more discussion. I do not support Senate Bill 331 or SB 311 about the child custody. There's just a lot of stuff going on that it just seems to be becoming more and more of a bureaucracy and not open dialogue between parents. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else with us today wish to comment on the consent agenda? Mr. LaBerge, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Shields and Council. I'm here on item 16. Sure. Can I ask you to get to the microphone oh, up there, please? It should be in the board's packet, the letter that CFSC been asking for forgiveness. Yes, of that it's all law. here. Yes, and we I'd do have that. I'd ask the city council to pull that from the consent agenda. Okay. I think we have a very strong argument for right. board forgiveness. We'll pull that. Thank That's you. item 16. We'll go ahead and pull that. 12 and 16, we will, we will take up separately. Further on the consent agenda, questions or comments? 
I do have somebody online. Uh, whoever is with us online, you are now recognized. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Garrett. Hey, as to item 11, I need to consider this public ballot initiative more, but I will say for now, you are opposing control limits on actual cost or reasonableness in fees that the city charges, meaning you would prefer the option of milking the public with both hands like a big fat cash cow when and however you can. One of those radical fee hikes is on the agenda today. Okay, I'm planning a little, but the essence of the initiative you oppose is that there should be a high bar with rational cost-based reasons and public authorization to raise taxes and fees, because in California, we pay a national max of those, and the people are mad as hell, and they won't take it anymore, it would seem. Not surprisingly, you don't prefer these limits, and I think your answer to a fiscal imbalance is always to raise taxes and fees, and no size limit of government is too big, or any joke justification will do. Well, it's on the ballot, and the people will vote this time around, not you, because you don't get a deciding vote this time. Some initiatives show up by special interest, but I also see the people's interest in this so far. I'll give it real consideration. When I think about your gigantic 400% increase in green building consultation fees, your most convoluted vapor-like connect the dots between developers and child care impact fees, and so forth, uh, I can see where the citizens are getting the idea of federal government-style corruption has finally filtered down to the state and city level, and they've had enough. Government is a monopoly, lacking free market competition, which can and does lead to abuse unless there are either uncommon ethics with goodwill or legal controls that produce similar. I believe the people really, really, if they want something, they will pay for it. It is not uh, the only important taxpayer initiative on the ballot. The people will have much to consider. And why you're sending an opposing letter to other representatives is strange, since really it's up to the people to decide what kind of government they want, not you. Uh, the item 1415 parklets is more of the city raising revenue while benefiting some very special interests while sacrificing and permanently denying the public its public property right of way. It supports unfair competition and has no real public need anymore. It doesn't matter. Soon the public will tire of dining at full fare on the street in parking spaces. One wonders if these parklet incentive subsidies that remove parking and create parking fund deficits are essentially paid for now by other people's higher parking fees. The accounting is a mystery in Santa Cruz, at least to me. Uh, I would mention the minutes of the special meeting last week could not possibly have been written to convey less of what was said or decided about the city's important five-year strategic plan. The meeting had no recording, I don't think, and some outside consulting agency hired by I don't know who uh, that will, quote, prepare a draft strategic plan, and at some future meeting you will all be voting I, 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 probably on the consent agenda, and the only people who are in that room, uh, they're the ones that know what the meeting was decided why or whether Baker Tilly, whoever they are, has it right or is just as instructed. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Nobody else. Anyone else with us on the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items 12 and 16 would be in order. Is there a motion? Motion oh. by Ms. Contar so Johnson, second, second by, by Council Member Brown. The clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We will now take up the consent item to agenda items that were pulled. Let's start with Ms. Watkins on agenda item 12. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. And thank you to my colleagues who brought this item forward. I appreciate the thought that went into it, and I do agree with the direction. I think it's going to be really great for our system. I knew this was forthcoming, given conversations I had had with our staff. Um, and I wanted to also just propose um, additional direction for consideration. And the context before I make that motion and mm -hmm. proposal is essentially when we move to proposing to our community to have a directly elected mayor and a district process, um, that we knew that compensation was something we wanted to look at but didn't necessarily build in and know that there goes uh, a lot of work into that as well. So um, I think it's appropriate having consulted with our city manager to add this to this item. And so I'll go ahead and make that motion if I may, Mayor. 
Start with the motion. Okay, so the motion is to accept um, item number 12's recommendation to approve the City Council Policy 6.21 District Engagement with the additional direction, and Bonnie, I could send this to you, to request that staff conduct a market comparison of mayor and count council compensation amongst comparable cities and bring back their findings along with outlining the process for the council to consider proposing potential changes to council compensation to ensure we continue to stay competitive with the market as well as attract higher caliber candidates to these important positions. <laughs> it's very hard. Is that possible? <laughs> well, <laughs> Second. And I, I will say, thank Second. you. Thank you, Council Mayor. <laughs> I will say um, it is really hard to get individuals interested and this won't necessarily impact myself or others right now, but as we move forward, if we want a diversity of representation, we have to understand the impact of compensation um, that that has, especially in our high cost community, and um, has been brought to my attention from community members as an interest uh, of theirs to explore Let as well. Let me see well. if I can get a second. Oh, Council Member Brown, is there a second? second. She Council Member Brown seconds yeah. that motion on the motion itself, Ms. Watkins. Yeah. Thank you. And so, uh, essentially, to have this additional direction within this item seems appropriate for our consideration so that we can understand what choices we might have before us um, that will ultimately lead to a representative government of our community. So, um, I appreciate the second and uh, any conversation that. Thank you. Ensues? Further debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, put this in context. This is something that um, I know since uh, Council Member Watkins and I have been on the council has come up in various, uh, through various channels and, and we've provided some direction that's been pretty general about uh, looking at this over time and we just haven't quite, um, we haven't done that and I, I absolutely support the, um, and I think it, it's, it's a goal that we've had collectively, um, the different iterations of this body. And for myself, it's a good time given that um, okay, it won't affect, you know, I, I don't have a personal interest in uh, this because I won't be on the city council by the time we kind of review that. And of course, the, the city uh, voters would have to approve something. So um, just want to make say that as well. Uh, and then <clears throat> um, I did have a question since this got pulled. Uh, which I'll ask related to your your thinking, and I appreciate it, and I I've also have been supportive of efforts like this. I know uh, Mayor Terrazas, when he was mayor, wanted to try to get something like this going. Um, again, uh, take take some time, right, to to make it happen. So here we are. Uh, there are uh, several of us who um, are just two of us. No. No, four of us. It's still who are at large um, representatives who are kind of not really formally assigned to our district. So I'm just wondering how that would work for the coming year, you know, whether we would be engaging in that as well with, with district representatives or, um, or if that would just be uh, kind of transitioned in. I, I think as luck would have it, um, each of the at-large council members are residing in uh, what will be the new districts and so my interpretation of it would be that it would also apply to council members elected at large thank you for the question or comment seen and hear none clerk will call the roll on the amended motion um did we have public comment or not yet i'm sorry thank you very much anyone with us today wish to comment on this item anyone online no that always happens i always clerk bring will, it up and no, nobody's quite all right to clerk will call the roll Hello. Uh, it's great to have a little bit greater understanding of what this actually meant. I really couldn't understand it when I was reading it yesterday. Um, it's just kind of amazing, you know, that Santa Cruz County has a lot of really best in show individuals. Some of you have some really fascinating bios. I, I, I think that this county, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse to have so many corporate entities that are supporting the U.S. and California corporate flags. Um, I'm just a little peasant citizen that uh, is an observationist stuff. And the city council and the county is really pretty amazing. You know, this morning, speaking publicly, being polite, I suppose, 
got into a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation with Gail Newell, and I said we should continue this conversation over coffee. That's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item number 16, which was uh, requested to be continued by, excuse me, moved to this part of the agenda by Mr. LaBerge. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you again, Mayor Keeley, City Council. I'm here to argue for the forgivability of the $74,500 loan that was originally given in 1991 to create what we call the Darwin House, which is an AIDS housing project. I'm the chair of the board of CFSC. We've been in existence since 1981. We have over 70 units of affordable housing. So we appreciate May being Affordable Housing Month in Santa Cruz, and we're a, a key player in that. We have housing on Broadway, on Darwin, on Water Street. Uh, we have housing throughout the city of Santa Cruz and throughout the county. Right now, we're applying for a $4 million loan in the Freedom Area to provide transitional housing for termed out foster children. We've been a reliable partner for over 40 years. And back in 1993, when the note was, the promissory note was written for this, the city council that sat in this very room agreed to potential forgivability for that loan. And the reason we're asking for that is that freedom from that debt load will allow us to continue to provide more housing, more affordable housing in the city of Santa Cruz at absolutely no cost to the city of Santa Cruz. The original seed money was from the Red Cross grant following the earthquake. So I think we've proven we're a reliable partner. We want to continue to provide affordable housing in the city and county, and the forgivability of this loan will put us in a much better position Ms. LeBurge, thank you very much. Let me ask if Ms. Lake is here and if she would like to make any comments on this item. She's on Zoom. And I can speak to the philosophy behind that if, if I uh, could. Uh, let me ask them, it. and then you can make whatever comments you wish. Good afternoon, Ms. Lake. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, so the, the language that uh, Mr. LeBurge is referring to, did add a clause to the loan saying that the determination of forgiveness could be made at a later date by city council. Um, but in contrast, we had another $105,000 loan that at the time city council decided to convert to a grant. So really what they did was just sort of delay the decision to forgive. Um, that was sort of a common practice back then at the time. Um, and now what a best practice is considered to be really is um, keeping the loan, keep having leverage to ensure continued affordability over time. And the current staff recommendation is to, again, defer all payments so there should be no impact to their operations. Thank you, Ms. Lake. Ms. LaBerge? Once again, CFC picked up this in 2012 when the AIDS uh, program SCAP ended up disbanding, and we picked this up in 2012. And the minutes of our meeting said that part of our understanding of picking this up was uh, that forgivability provision. And the city council thought about that, discussed, and authorized it back then. And I understand the city's concern for some providers, but we're not that provider. We're a nonprofit that's been here for over 40 years, and we're, we've consistently provided year after year quality affordable housing. So it'll put us in a much better position if this loan is made affordable or given and we're put in a position where we could instead not having this debt loan that we could actually use money to provide more housing in the city and county of Santa Cruz. Thank I you. Think we should be considered a one-off from that philosophy because we've proven our reliability and we, we've proven our passion for low-cost mental health housing in the city. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Thank you and uh, thank you Mr. LaBerge for saving me on the CDBG <laughs> item that I had a comment and question on. There's, we have two CDBG, and I just found the wrong one. So I wanted to ask you about, because I recall this being before us, and at the time we did decide to continue along the uh, same path that's being recommended today. Um, and uh, and I recall there was some discussion, but I don't re recall the um, kind of the conclusion to that discussion about um, the potential to um, provide loan forgiveness in exchange for affordability for that property in perpetuity because as we heard 
uh, Ms. Lake mentioned, their you know, best practice is, is intended to try to maintain that, to preserve that affordability, and we know that's what you're doing, um, but how do we sort of ensure that continues over time if we're uh, making this, uh, if we were to make that move? I think that's a good question, and in legal parlance, there's a rule against perpetuities just for that precise reason. This is a 1947 house, the next year we're in the process, or this year we're in the process of putting almost $30,000 into the rehab. And this is CFSC money we're putting into the rehab of that. The concept of perpetuity somewhat boggles the mind of a day-to-day -day homeowner. The concept that forever and ever and ever, and this housing is gonna destruct through termites and passage of time. And on a yearly basis, we're putting in maybe thirty to $50,000 of that to forestall that day. But to have it in perpetuity, doesn't really make common sense to any landowner in the city. We want to be in a position where someday we may rebuild on that land, but we're not going to have that housing. And I'd say, and I understand the city's concern, but when we've been here for over 40 years providing affordable housing, we're not cutting and running. We're going to stay in and we're going to do more affordable housing. And not having that debt load is going to put us in a position to make more housing. So that's, that's my response. To that. For the questions or comments by council members? Let me, uh, if, if uh, Ms. Lake could, could join us again for a moment. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon again, Ms. Lake. Thank you. Uh, I think that the city's policy, what I understand to be the policy about not forgiving, uh, I understand the notion of protecting the city's assets, which that loan is an asset of the city's. Um, and I think that that's the right policy. I also think that the reason for that policy is not as persuasive to me in this case. Mr. LaBerge has articulated it. Uh, they're not going anywhere. He's been our partners for 40 years. Uh, I understand if we make an exception here, somebody else is going to come in and say, well, we've been here 32 years and somebody 18 years, whatever it may be. Well, that's why we're asked to exercise discretion from time to time. So, Ms. Lake, I think the policy is quite good. I, I, I think it makes sense. I think in this instance, having an illiquid asset at the bottom of our pile of assets as the city of Santa Cruz is misleading in the following regard. That's, we're never gonna liquidate that asset. It's simply not gonna happen. So it's irrelevant that it's on our books from my point of view. Well, if we're not going to liquidate that asset and we've got a partner who is trustworthy and it's going to be in their interest to help us get more housing of a, the most difficult kind to undertake, I think it may make sense, and I'm going to need a bit of guidance here, about whether uh, we can today make a different decision here and now. My preference would be to accede to the request of uh, Mr. LaBerge and, and the Darwin Street housing project and, and go in that direction, making some kinds of findings that while we respect our own policy on this, it does have, uh, we do have discretion. And in this case, we're exercising that discretion because we do have a long-term partner. And because this is an illiquid asset that is unlikely to ever become a liquid asset for any other purpose for us. So I'm asking Mr. Condotti, uh, would the appropriate motion be to do that or to continue the item and have it come back in some way? Uh, consistent with the general direction that I'm trying to move in. I would prefer the latter because okay. uh, I would want to look at what legal mechanisms we need Fair to Fair um, ensure that this is done in a, an appropriate way. Am I, am I correct, though, in believing that we have the discretion to do what I just described? I believe so, but I would also look into that question okay. prior to um, the council taking formal action. Let me ask if the council would have any objection to continuing this item until our next regularly agended meeting, uh, agendized meeting, scheduled meeting, with direction to the city attorney to and, and the other appropriate staff members, and perhaps Ms. Lake and others, 
uh, to meet with Mr. LaBerge and others from your organization uh, and uh, uh, see if it is possible to structure a forgiveness of that loan with certain findings uh, that would not make it a precedent that we would always do that, but instead here's a narrowly cast exception around which we have jurisdiction or discretion rather. Is that agreeable to council members? Would you make that motion? I'm happy to make that motion. And, and I'd motion, like is there a sec motion? A second motion by Ms. Watkins, second by Ms. Brown. I'd like to add additional language to ask our staff to explore if we were to move in that direction, are there any other um, unintended impacts that could be associated with that direction as well? Okay. I'd like to have all of the information before I decide. Well, and I would motion, just. So you get to agree to it. Fair enough. I would just ask, given that I expect that we will be speaking with Mr. LaBerge and also having some internal discussions that the council direct that it be brought back at the May 23rd meeting. Um, given our current uh, okay. timeline for agenda preparation, okay. it's a little tight to get it back by the 9th. That's fine. I'd be more than happy to meet with you before then. 23rd will be the report back date. Debate or discussion on this? Seeing and hearing none, clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Do we need public comment? Because we do have someone online. Anyone with us wish to make public comment? Anybody on the phone? Clerk will call the roll. I have one person online. We will listen to that person. Good afternoon. Are you talking to me? Yes. <laughs> I'm Tim Fitzmorris. Uh, I'm, I, I'm actually calling about 481. Is, is this the inappropriate time to do that? About the... Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm so, hold on a second. I'm sorry. Did you say item 31? I, uh, on the, uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm getting the numbers wrong. But uh, on the gun issue, I was calling about that. Well, so I, I, let me tell you the item we're on. We are on item 16, 223 Darwin Street. Is that the okay. item you wish to comment on? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay, we'll be back with you when, when we get to your item. All right, thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. Yes. We're going to stand in recess for two minutes.
Council is back in session following a brief recess. We are now, uh, I'm going to recognize Council Member Watkins uh, for a motion for what reason? Yes, thank you. So I'd like to make a motion that we postpone until the first meeting in June, item number 33, which is the tobacco product waste update, and have that discussion at that time. Is there a second? Second. Second by the vice mayor on your motion. Yeah, I just, I, um, it was brought to my attention that we have a very full agenda today <laughs> and most likely would have this request come before us when we got to the item. And I wanted to acknowledge and thank our county partner who's here, but also wanted to save you hours of your afternoon, not necessarily needing to sit here until we actually had this question come before us at, at item number 33. So essentially looking at how we can move this item up in our agenda and then have the discussion forthcoming at the first meeting in June. It was an update, but then discussion, and, and I mean, Matt, you're welcome to speak to it. It was just essentially saying that we don't have a good, we have a full agenda, so this was okay. one that could potentially be moved at this time. Do you have anything you were to say on this item from the county? No. Yeah, what we're trying to do here is, is get through our agenda and not have you wait until 8 or 9 o'clock tonight to testify we're going to postpone it. <laughs> going to postpone it all the way to June rather than 8 or 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, but when we do hear it, we'll hear it in a more timely fashion for you. You won't have to wait around. Do you have any objection to that? No. You okay? Okay. All right? Okay. Good. Uh, further question or comment? Clerk will call the roll on the motion. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on the consent public hearing. This is items 27 through 29 inclusive. Uh, we will be uh, taking these items up. Uh, let me ask if there are uh, council members who wish to pull an item or have a comment on these items. And I would, Mayor. Yes. To finally Brown. make my comment. Ms. Brown. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say uh, that this is, uh, this is a much bigger item on the uh, HUD annual action plan. Uh, within that, we have committed to funding uh, improvements at the Civic Center, and we have, we've heard from uh, folks from the community about this, and I just wanted to um, Day, since this is going to happen with a little fanfare, I absolutely, I very much support this. I'm glad that we're able to do it at this time, and appreciate your um, your love of our civic center, which I also love, and uh, your continued uh, patronage of of the facility. So, um, thanks for for being here and speaking up. Anyone else? Any consent? All right. Any public comment on these items? Anyone with us on the phone or online? No. No. Okay. Okay, these are uh, public hearings on items 27, 28, and 29. Last call for any input or comment, testimony. Seeing and hearing none, motion to approve those items as presented would be in order. Ms. Brown moves. Ms. Kalantari Johnson seconds. <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome very much. Thank you. Uh, just messing with Gary Reese, just messing with him. Yep. All right. We are on item 30. This is a public hearing item concerning 530 Front Street and other related matters. Uh, Ms. Stanger, uh, oh, it is not Ms. Stanger, it is Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor. Lee Good Butler, afternoon. Director. How are you, sir? Doing great. How are you? Very well. 
Hello, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And just as a brief introduction to this item, um, back in 2017, uh, the City Council approved uh, height increases to the area um, roughly between Soquel and Cathcart Streets uh, south down to Laurel Streets in our downtown area plan. And um, that has spurred a, a significant amount of redevelopment. Um, and this project is, is one of those um, projects that was spurred uh, as a result of those height changes. Um, and we just issued building permits uh, two or three weeks ago for the Front Riverfront project at the uh, easterly terminus of Cathcart Street. And we're really excited about the, um, the results that we will see as these sites redevelop, as these sites redevelop on the east side of Front Street between Soquel and Laurel in particular because they're going to be offering the opportunity for us to um, change what uh, the development pattern was um, many decades ago, which is where we had turned our backs to the river. And um, these projects are really going to offer the opportunity to celebrate the river and the great asset that we have in our downtown with that river as the, the second level of these development projects um, will meet up with the, the newly filled area between the current river walk and the levy, uh, or, or in the second level of the, um, uh, the new construction. And so I, I think that's a really exciting component and something that um, our whole community is gonna have the opportunity to enjoy. And I just wanted to, to point out that um, the, the council's efforts back uh, five years ago six years ago now, um, have really made a difference. And as these projects um, move forward, I think uh, we're going to have a, a really great asset um, for our whole community to enjoy. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Clara to present the project. Sorry for the delay. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Clara Stanger. I'm a senior planner with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation on 530 Front Street. That's a mixed use. Um, it's a development application for a mixed use um, building, eight stories, 276 apartment dwelling units, and 6,865 square feet of commercial space. Um, so, starting with community engagement, the project completed a pre-application review in early 2020. After the pre-application review and before formal submittal of an application for entitlements, the applicant held a community meeting on May 19, 2020, consistent with the city's community outreach policy for development applications. So this community meeting had about 40 attendees. Um, committee members expressed questions and comments about design for climate change and solar panels, automobile and bike parking, unit size and affordability, project timeline and building lifespan, accessibility to open spaces, bird safe design, and flooding potential. Um, then um, after the initial project review of the formal application by staff, the applicant submitted revised plans that showed a substantially larger project um, than that was shown to the community um, because the applicant had an, now incorporated a, a request for a 50% density bonus. Um, so at staff request, the applicant held a second community meeting. And this meeting ha also had about 40 attendees. Um, questions and comments from the public included bike parking, bike lanes on Front Street, um, building design, programming along the levee, design of artistic light bollards, landscaping, water supply, unit affordability, developer profit, and wage standards for construction workers. Um, and then while a planning commission hearing 
was not required for this project, the applicant consulted with staff and decided to bring the project to the Planning Commission at the March 2nd meeting to obtain feedback and a recommendation. So the Planning Commission recommended approval of the project with some additional conditions of approval, including um, for any color or material changes <coughs> to be approved by the planning director prior to application for building permits. For the planning director to refer any significant design changes to a planning commission subcommittee for review, um, a condition to select the mural artist and ensure that the mural proposed for the building is completed along with building construction, and conditions to increase the number of electric vehicle charging stations and reduce the potential for clutter on residential balconies. So these recommendations are all included as conditions of approval. Okay, so the project site is located in the downtown at the corner of Front Street and SoCal Avenue. It's surrounded by mixed use and commercial uses, and it's also adjacent to the San Lorenzo River. The project area includes four lots, as well as an area of city-owned land between those lots and the river walk. The lots have a general plan designation of regional visitor commercial slash downtown, which supports mixed use developments and other uses allowed by the downtown plan. The city-owned land has a general plan designation of natural area, and that accommodates undeveloped land, including land designated for public recreation. In this part of the project site, the project will fill the levee, um, or fill the space between the levee and the building, and construct a public extension area connecting the new building to the river walk. Okay, so the proposed building is eight stories and a little bit over 92 feet tall. I'm gonna describe how the project got to this size, um, how the building's this big, and also how the amount of, and also um, talk about the amount of housing and affordable housing that we'll get as a result. So the base height for projects in the Front Street Riverfront area of the downtown plan is 50 feet. This is the maximum building height that would be allowed without an approval for additional height. And the base height is shown uh, by the red line that you can see across the elevation drawing. The site is located in additional height zone B, which allows height above the standard 50 feet up to 70 feet when certain criteria are met with a recommendation from the planning director and approval by city council. So this project includes a request for additional height and the resulting building is, um, the additional height is shown by the pink line in the drawing. And then if the additional height is approved, the project then, um, that project then constitutes the base density project from which the applicant is requesting a 50% density bonus. And so the density bonus, which is the ultimate project that the applicant's um, proposing here, is shown um, with the green line on the top. Um, so as you can see in the chart, um, the resulting project, the density bonus project, has many more units and also more affordable units um, than a project that conforms to the base height or the additional height, um, which is the base density project. The additional height project adds 13 more low-income inclusionary units compared to a base height project. Um, the density bonus doesn't add a greater number of affordability compared to the additional height base density project, but as you can see, quite a number of those units are now very low income instead of low income. Okay, so talking a bit about the project design, the ground floor along Front Street and SoCal Avenue has commercial uses, a residential lobby, and an internal parking garage. Floors two through eight have the residential units that range from studios to two bedrooms. The project is um, generally designed to meet the design standards of the front riverfront area of the downtown plan. The downtown plan um, on this site specifically calls for the SoCal and front intersection to be treated as a gateway to the downtown. And this project accomplishes that with a pedestrian plaza at that intersection, um, a well-articulated building wall along SoCal Avenue, and um, a couple of outdoor dining patios along the SoCal Avenue frontage. This is a view of the building um, from the south on Front Street. You can see there's a consistent and detailed design that wraps around this side of the building. 
This is a view of the east side of the building facing the river walk and also the north side facing SoCal Avenue. On this side, the ground floor has commercial and also active residential amenity uses. The upper floors are all residential. Um, there's the public plaza extension area um, that has stairs and pathways connecting it to the river walk. And then in the northeast corner of the project, which is on the bottom right of the screen, um, there are accessible pathways connecting the extension area, SoCal Avenue, and the river walk. So here you can see um, the shaded area near the bottom of the screen between the river walk, SoCal Avenue, and the proposed building which um, this area has been identified by the Public Works Department as the location of a future pump station. Um, the new pump station is in the conceptual stage. It's for um, pumping storm water um, in high storm events. Um, it's in the conceptual stage, and at this point, staff doesn't know how much of this shaded area the pump station will take up. Um, as you can see, this area includes the outdoor dining patio, the accessible pathways, um, and a substantial amount of landscaping. The project um, in this area was also proposing to use, um, to implement some stormwater infiltration uh, to meet stormwater requirements for the project. So in an effort to facilitate development of this project while the pump station design is still not known, staff and the applicant have collaborated to include a condition of approval that will allow the applicant to construct a portion of the restaurant patio, install temporary landscaping in this area, um, and move the stormwater and accessibility features further south on the extension area. Once the pump station design is known, um, the city will install other public amenities in this area, such as lighting or pedestrian pathways, and will collaborate with the applicant on enlarging the dining patio if that's possible and mutually desired. The applicant has also been working on a concept to show how this will be addressed, and I believe they're going to present that today. Okay, so finally, staff is recommending um, minor changes to two conditions of approval. Um, condition number 11 is a standard condition regarding vacant buildings. Um, this standard condition um, got some updated language late last week, and that's shown here. And then, in addition, staff is recommending some slight changes to the wording of condition number 12 um, regarding the pump station and indoor noise attenuation for the new building. So in summary, staff recommends that City Council adopt the resolution acknowledging the environmental determination and approving the project with the proposed conditions of approval and the revised conditions 11 and 12. This concludes my presentation, and staff is available for questions. Well, thank you very much. Do we have questions at this time from council members? We'll also reserve the right to ask you some questions a little later on during this presentation. But let me see if there are initial round of questions at this moment. Okay. So thank you very much for your presentation. Let me ask uh, Mr. Bristow and the Swenson Builders uh, for your presentation. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sorry. So first of all, I uh, just want to say good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, Vice Mayor, and City Council members. Uh, my name is Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders. I'm the Development Project Manager for this project, and uh, we really appreciate your time today and taking this uh, proposal, development proposal, under consideration. So while staff's pulling up the presentation. Um, just want to first off say thank you to, to planning staff and public works. It's, it's been a long road. Um, there's been some unforeseen things that have happened, but I think we're able to get to a project that um, is meeting the overall intent and design of the of the downtown plan. And I think we we came to a, a, a final project that um, that meets uh, city's goals, staff's uh, desires and, and our intent for the project. So we, we appreciate that uh, very much. I'm ready to open it. It's some, oh. Since somebody else has it open, I just want to make sure the intention is for me to do it. I think that's a question. Uh, I'll do yes. it. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm executive decision. I'll open it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Well, I'll try to be um, relatively quick. Um, I, I think uh, Clara's uh, staff report was uh, very thorough, and uh, we'll just try to highlight where we started and, and how we got here and uh, today. So we, we first originally submitted an, a pre-application in 2020, and that had 170 units. That required a community meeting where we received feedback from planning staff and city staff, and we received feedback from uh, the community in general. And so uh, taking that into account through, through 2020 with, you know, everyone was dealing with um, kind of an unforeseen situation that no one had ever been in before with the pandemic. Uh, we, we took that time to, to implement new design, take that community feedback, and, and I think somewhere between mid to the end of 2020, we submitted a, a full application of 170 units. Um, during, during the time between 2020 to 2022, um, during 2020, the, the state density bonus was 35%, um, California state density bonus. And so our original application didn't include a, a state density bonus. But um, in 2022, a new law went into effect where the state density bonus was 50% uh, increase on, on your conforming model. And so that, um, that was an incentive for us to, to kind of redesign the project. And that's when we uh, submitted a full application of 184 units with a 50% increase, uh, giving us 276 units. And uh, at the end of 2022, we were deemed complete and I uh, believe in March, we went to planning commission and received a five, five to one approval, um, recommendation of approval to the city council, and we're here today. So uh, next slide, please. So this is a very rough design early on with our preliminary application. We feel we've come a long way. We're <laughs> happy with the design that we, that we have today, but this is what we first presented, and, and it's obviously it's evolved quite a bit with, with staff and community input. Uh, next slide, please. So this, uh, this was our full, first full application in 2020. So this was a six-story building and uh, at 170 units. And one note I'd like to make in the front, we see that uh, triangular green, um, we call it a pizza slice. It ended up being um, a parcel that was owned by Parks Department, staff, planning staff, and Parks reached out to us and asked if we could incorporate that into the gateway. Um, they felt that you know, it was, was being underutilized, so how could we do that? So. We took that into uh, our consideration, incorporated it into our design, and, and took that time and resource to, to get where it is today. Uh, additionally, we were told to open up the, the interface, the levy interface that um, we call it the levy deck. And um, right now it's a little closed. There's a lot of landscaping. Um, the next slide, uh, you'll see it's it's been opened up where we have the ramping, we have some lighting. We actually added an amphitheater, which I'll speak to a little bit more in detail later. And, and we opened up the staircases. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would like to highlight before we go to the next slide, the south two towers go straight up. And um, we were asked by planning staff to have this step back even further to ensure that we have, um, we're more in line with the design standards. Uh, I believe this is a standard that we could have waived with the density bonus, but we elected not to. So um, if you go to the next slide. So they, they step in to, to um, have the building wedding cake a little bit more, and this is the, the final design that uh, you're hearing uh, today. So next slide, please. So just a quick overview, we have um, uh, 184 units in the conforming model and 20% through the city requirement is 37 below market rate units. So we have 15% that are very low income and 5% that are low income. Um, so we're gonna have 28 very low income units and nine uh, low income units. And with that density bonus, we're receiving 92 uh, extra units. So in total, we'll have 276. Next slide, please. And I just wanna highlight, um, this is just a quick summary of uh, the unit programming, but um, of the six units, or the six commercial spaces, those are all conditioned to be food ready if, if we have the appropriate tenant. Um, we do have the designated restaurant space uh, at the north end of the building. That's because we wanted that to be the attraction. It's where we wanted the activity, where we would lead people up from more um, the core downtown, such as Front Street and Soquel and Pacific Avenue, leading people up to, to the levee. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm not sure if Clara mentioned this, but uh, we have 100% rental. I'm not sure if that was brought up. 
Um, so this is a 100% rental project. It's 100% electric. There will be photovoltaic solar on the roof. Uh, we did have 22 electrical vehicle charging stations at the request of Planning Commission. We upped that to 36, and we have 372 Class 1 bike parking spaces. That means that they're actually secure in an in enclosed area, such as a bike cafe or a storage locker. And then we have 12 um, bike spaces that are you know, your standard bike lock that you'd find outside. We're really trying to encourage multimodal uh, transportation with this development. Uh, next slide, please. So just want to highlight uh, a little bit about the, the step backs that I discussed. So with our conforming project in those 92 units from the density bonus, we essentially took the third and fourth floor and doubled them. So our fifth floor and sixth floor became the seventh and eighth floor. And the top floor requirement in the conforming model requires 60% um, of the floor below. So it can only be 60% of the floor below. We're requesting it to be 74%, um, and that's because we, we made the building fatter, but we still wanted to make sure that, um, that we're meeting that, that step in. We wanted to be respectful of the downtown design. Uh, again, I think this is something that we could have waived um, as far as that design, but we're just asking to go up a little higher and make some adjustments as far as these standards. We still want to meet them. What we build is our, is our reputation and has our resume on it, so um, you know, we're very conscious of, of what we do here. Next slide. Uh, this is our typical uh, first floor. Uh, one thing I just want to highlight on the south end, or the bottom right of this, of this photo, is uh, next to the lobby and leasing, is there are two transformer rooms. And that's because it is 100% electric. So the gas that is not normally sent or historically sent to residential now needs to be made up with more electrical capacity. So it does require more transformer rooms. And we just want to as we develop the downtown and make changes within our city um, and try to have a, a greener future, that's just something to uh, be conscious of. We're gonna have larger rooms with, or walls with, um, I think they're blast doors that uh, can't be painted and it's part of the utility requirement from pg &E. So it's kind of out of our hands, but again, we, we, we think it's a, a good concept for it to be 100% electric. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight some of the amenities here and what we've added to the public interface. We do have the two private courtyards on the interior, but everything out of those courtyards is publicly accessible while those businesses are operating. We as the applicant and the developer are required to maintain and keep that as a safe area. Um, we, we have added the, um, an amphitheater, which I'll speak to a little bit more. Um, and, and so just want to highlight the, the public interface that's going to be built here and, and everyone's going to be able to use. So thank you. Uh, next slide. And here's just the, the top floor that highlights that instead of it being 60%, it's 74%, but we also have a rooftop garden which is accessible to the tenants and it also serves as a stormwater uh, control uh, method. So thank you. Next slide. And so briefly, just want to highlight some of those things that I spoke to. So on the very south end is that amphitheater. So we, we've met with the uh, Coastal Watershed and planning staff um, mentioned that um, the San Lorenzo Urban Plan, I believe it's called the SLURP, um, has a long-term plan to build an amphitheater in the river. Um, that's not feasible with its, its sensitive habitat. So uh, we did have a a switchback there, a pathway, which wasn't very open. So we feel this is a passive staircase. Um, it can be somewhere where people just sit, and it, but it also can be programmed for a play, for people to play music. Uh, and there is a little bit of a bulb out, and that is a utility requirement for um, utility vehicle. So it has mul multiple functions, and we think it serves the levy well. Um, and additionally, this just kind of highlights where we've stepped back the building, uh, and we have those open staircases and, and pathways up. Uh, next slide. So um, this was brought up during planning commission, and I'm um, not sure if Clara brought it up, but uh, I think often when you look at one project independently, uh, it can be a little daunting with the height. So what, what we wanted to do was just demonstrate what is what is coming today. Right now we have the Anton project, which is on, on Laurel in front, and that, that's 85 feet. And what we want to do is just give it a little bit perspective of, of how that looks to scale. So if you go to next slide, please. So um, this is very rough, but and it's from a SketchUp model. So I apologize to the other projects architects. We weren't able to articulate it. 
but it, it just shows that that you know of all these buildings that you see right now there's an existing building that at 68 feet and everything else that's being built um, except for the potential cruise hotel is going to be 80 feet and above or between 80 and 90 feet and, and our project sits at 89 feet so um, you see the relationship that will exist uh, as we move forward with 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 these types of projects uh, next slide please and just want to show the relationship between the riverfront project south of us that was i believe approved in 2019 might have been 2020 and then you can see in the foreground the library that's at 84 feet so um they're relatively similar heights so thank you and uh, one more thing I, I just wanted to speak to is that you know we are providing 37 affordable units um, that uh, levy interface that we're building and required to maintain, that's probably about $2 million worth of construction. But additionally, you know, we do know we're building for lots of people and we understand that there are impacts. And this is, I would say, 30% of what our total costs are gonna be um, with city fees and, and processing and, and whatnot. But I just wanna highlight that, you know, 50,000 is going to the Green Building Education Fund. We're gonna pay about $200,000 in the traffic impact fees. The school district's gonna have uh, 750,000 uh, dollars, uh, child impact, uh, child care impact fee, which I believe was implemented last year through the city. I might be wrong, but that's a hundred thousand dollars there, and we're paying 176 to fire department safety and almost 180 to police uh, um, safety. So just that one subtotal is 1.4 million dollars. We just want to highlight that we we do contribute in multiple ways, and and we're happy to do so. We're happy to be here and invest, but we just want to highlight that we're not just building market rate housing and that's it so thank you next slide and um, this is our conceptual design for the potential minor modification uh, I do have the actual file if you want to it might be hard to read but um, essentially the the light blue area would be public works and we have a little bit of a cutback for the restaurant so the, the restaurant deck is that purple area where we can still have some tables we can still have a pass-through and the stormwater control that Clara mentioned, we plan to move it over to the area in front of the bocce ball court. So potentially we'll have a switch back there um, for people to ramp up to, to the deck. And because that ramp that's in the public uh, workspace, we just don't know yet. So in order for us to move forward with our project and our uh, requirements, we're trying to accommodate so. And uh, so potentially the bocce court might ha have to go away, but we could probably replace it with some benches or maybe somewhere to play cornhole or something like that. So um, we, we would like to present this as potentially um, something, if city council has concern about not understanding what's gonna be there, we would like to present this as, as a condition of this, you know, you would like to see this happen when we come back for the minor mod. That allows us to keep moving forward with our design. And next slide. And that's it, so I'm here for questions, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. Very much appreciate that. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. Uh, we will be back on this item in five minutes time.
Council's back in session after a brief recess this afternoon. We're on item number 30. This is a an item regarding 530 French Street development proposal. We have received a staff report. We've received a presentation by the applicants, Swenson Builders. We are now on council member questions of either staff or the applicant. Let me ask if there are questions. Ms. Brown, you have your microphone up. Yeah, I'll, Ms. Brown. I'll um, I, the applicant is here. Do I see the applicant here? Yeah, Jesse, thanks. Um, so I, I did want to ask a question. Uh, we had a conversation about the project. I, um, I recognize the uh, incredible work that you've done to try to create a project that will accomplish our need for housing and, uh, you know, also, um, you know, be uh, viable for you. <clears throat> I, um, and when this project was in a different iteration, uh, uh, we, we talked about this as well. <laughs> so I, I wanted, I do want to ask you though, because, and I, I ask about this pretty much every, any time we make a decision that involves uh, a project approval and how it relates to our inclusionary ordinance. And I recognize that um, I'm not going to go through that whole conversation. People kind of understand where I am coming from. Um, but what I see here is, uh, um, you know, the new project uh, with a 50% density bonus. Uh, kind of a lot of uh, benefits have kind of been included in the new state laws. Um, so significantly reduced risk for building a project like this, I would, I would argue. Um, the costs um, are, you know, there's a lot of benefits, a lot of financial benefits uh, uh, and incentives associated with the new state laws. You know what they are. Um, and what we have here is a project that is now um, significantly greater height and significantly higher number of units with, um, you know, the change I see is, um, you know, pretty minimal number of affordable units. The level, I get that the, the depth of the subsidy for very low income units is important. Um, and, but what we're talking about here are units that are gonna be, if I'm looking at the figures, you know, I'm trying to figure this out and it depends on the unit size and the, you know, whether it's a single person or not, but essentially you gotta earn $27 an hour to qualify for the very low income units. That's, that's the cut, that's the um, uh, percentage under HUD guidelines of our median income. That's a lot of money um, for, uh, you know, uh, very few, I mean, very few units at that, that level of affordability. So we're not, we're talking about, um, you know, again, 13% of a project being either low or very low, meaning that people who earn 27 to $37 an hour will be able to afford those units. And then uh, another 87%, which are gonna be market with whatever that means, we'll, find, we'll, we'll know when that time comes. So I just wanted to um, hear from you a little bit more about um, why we can't <laughs> work towards achieving that 15% in a project um, again, recognizing the kind of the, the rules, um, the framework that we're in, um, it seems like we've got a significantly bigger project, significantly greater height, um, significantly higher community impact um, as a result of that, which I am not opposed to, but in the context of the affordable housing crisis, we just, I feel like we need to use every tool we can. So I'd just like to hear you comment on that. I recognize there are other community benefits um, in the project. Uh, sure, certainly. Thanks. So, um, thank you. So, um, right, we, we did highlight the the public benefit of this interface and the cost to build and maintain that. Um, we, we did highlight the impacts, the impact fees that are going to the city, a part of allowing this type of project to move forward. And uh, regarding the HUD numbers, one, I, you know, we don't have control of that. So, um, you know, as far as that application and qualification, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're limited to that under the low or extremely low, but um, I, I don't have the resources or the knowledge right now to, to respond to that. But the, the one thing was is that, um, you know, it was acceptable for Planning Commission, the R37 units, and we appreciated their, their insight. 
Uh, secondly, when it, when it comes to our previous project that we, we did get entitled, which was 130 Center Street, we were here and um, we did present to Planning Commission that if the project did not get appealed, we would offer four more units. It would go from 31 to 35, over 233 units in total. And uh, it was appealed. But we did acquiesce to city council members' requests and we provided four more units. But we did that under the guise that we didn't want to set precedent. And if we do offer more, we're setting precedent. Um, you know, the project next to us, they did a density bonus. They didn't uh, have to offer more than what was required, I don't think. And um, so we'd be appreciated to be held to that same standard. In a, in a larger discussion, um, and maybe not appropriate right now, but if the city were to come to Swenson with RENA numbers and say, hey, our total RENA numbers, RENA numbers are X, we would like Swenson to build a hundred of these units on this site. I'd say, sure, we can do that, but I need to build 600 market rate. So I think there's a way to re reverse engineer it because at the end of the day, someone else is paying for it and we don't qualify for, for state benefits or federal ben uh, benefits or grants um, to allow more affordability. So the market rate units are gonna pay for that. They're gonna subsidize it. Some Someone is paying for it. It's either through taxes or it's gonna be um, the market rate units. So at, at this time, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to offer any more. Other council members, questions, comments? Questions to staff? Uh, any? But of course you can. Uh, I, I, didn't, I don't have a follow-up question. I appreciate your, uh, I, I didn't want to just leave it like that. Oh, um, I appreciate your, your comments and I, I really appreciate your interest in having those conversations. I think that's what we, I mean, that's the purpose of planning, right? And, and we have a housing element item on our agenda for later today um, that is gonna open up the conversation about how many units we need to be uh, um, working towards. And, and so really appreciate that as part of your response. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. This would be the opportunity, we're going to open this for public comment, participation. This would be the opportunity for anyone who's with us today who wishes to comment on this particular item to do so. Also, those of you who may be watching and want to join online, this would be the time to get teed up to do that. Good afternoon, Ms. Greenside. Good afternoon, Mayor yeah. Keely, Keely and Council Members. Uh, the, in this era, the public feels a little bit like David against Goliath when it comes to these incredibly massive buildings. And um, I think that the one that's under construction um, uh, at Laurel and Front Street, the city's website says that is six storeys. And um, the uh, developer just said that it was, or the representative, sorry, Swenson representative, said that that was 85 feet for six storeys. This, he says, is eight storeys at 92 feet. So maybe one of you could just ask a question about that. Uh, I think for most people uh, in the community, or many, many people, that it, they're shocked, shocked at the one at Front and Laurel, the mass, the scale of it, and this will be even bigger. I tried to, I listened carefully, not tried to, and I still can't quite understand if today you are approving the extra height from 50 to 70. If that's so, I would ask you to seriously consider not approving that. Um, people who are building these big buildings, they get their density bonus, which they don't have to factor in, to provide below market rate housing. So it is still a pretty sweet deal. But this uh, feels to us in the community, I'm sure there's some others who disagree, but I think for most people, this is out of scale, out of character. And when we bring in a lot of market rate new people, um, that has an impact well beyond just providing housing, this abstraction, well, it's not abstraction when they're provided with, but a very small percentage of below market rate. The low income, very low income people I know um, earn $18 an hour. They won't be able to compete for these very low income apartments. And it's only, as I've calculated quickly, 13.5%. So I also, when you're presented with uh, schematics like this, 
I've noticed that frequently it's from an aerial view or a higher view. Nothing shows what it will be like at ground level. And I really think that that does a disservice for the ability to imagine the impact of this scale in our town. And lastly, I don't see the time again. Oh, it's up there. Where is it? Oh, 22 seconds somewhere. Uh, I should remember that. Thank you. Uh, lights. Um, in most of these projects, they say the lights will conform to ADA requirements, and they don't. Uh, this looks like it will have a lot of lighting from the uh, commercial, residential. I think that something condition of approval should address that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have someone online? We will hear someone online at this point. Good afternoon. Hello, uh, my name is Gabriel Sanders. I am the Director of Housing and Community Development for the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And you probably saw in your packet a letter of support from our organization for the 530 Front Street Project. Um, the fact is that the arena number is high this project contributes some of the affordable housing that it's looking for. Um, and some of the units that are not already set aside in the project for affordable housing are indeed affordable at the moderate income levels toward the upper end of it, sure, um, in that 80 to 120% of AMI range. Um, but that's what we call affordable by design because when you achieve this kind of density um, on extremely expensive land, that's something that everybody commenting should keep in mind, I think. Uh, when you're building on land this expensive, it is quite a task uh, financially to make the numbers work uh, both in favor of the community and the developer. And the fact is developers like this account for at least 80% of development in California. So um, when a developer is able to make something like this pencil, uh, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So adding 267 units to the housing stock, sorry, 276 to the housing stock in Santa Cruz um, is a significant step toward achieving some of the arena, um, as well as uh, working with the supply and demand that are natural in the market. Are those the answers to all the housing needs in the city? Of course not. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is it is also a city. This is a growing uh, city, growing economy, and there is high demand for housing, and this project meets it. Um, I hope that, again, we don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and MBEP is happy to support this project um, with the understanding that it helps the city meet its renewal goals, and it is in compliance with the downtown expansion plan, um, almost to the T. So uh, we applaud Swenson for making something work on this parcel, and uh, we hope the city will acknowledge that and uh, approve the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Brokaw. I'm a general contractor, uh, 35 years with a license, 40 years in the trade. But first, I'd like to make a comment as a 22-year resident of Santa Cruz. Grotesquely oversized compared to future grotesquely oversized does not make it pretty or acceptable. As a contractor, I noticed that there's been a lack of discussion about the underground for this building. This building has to be anchored into the ground. It's not going to be built on a slab. There's going to be one, two, or three stories below in order to keep this building erect. And they haven't talked about it. And it's so close to the river that by the time you're about eight, maybe 10 feet down, you're going to be at the level of the river in hydrostatic pressure, forcing water into a hole even if it has a cement wall around it, is not something that you can gloss over. You're gonna to have to pump water out of the basement of this building and away from the foundation of this building until the cows come home forever. Thank you. Ms. Bush, someone else online? No, good afternoon, sir. Hello, uh, Nicholas Whitehead. Um, wow, I'm sorry I fell asleep during the COVID era and missed all those exciting Zoom meetings. Now I wake up like Rip Van Winkle and I, I see the, uh, the uh, magnificent edifice, edifice is being uh, 
When I first saw the picture, I thought, are we in Palm Beach or even Mar-a-Lago or somewhere, you know? Uh, it doesn't look like the kind of thing that you'd expect to see in a small seaside town. However, of its design, the kind of design it is, it is an interesting uh, achievement. I do uh, congratulate the designers. They've gone all out to make it a standout building, but it's just so huge. Um, I want to ask a, a few technical questions. Uh, developer says it'll all be electric powered. Okay, with, a, with an enterprise so large, what happens if there's a storm failure or other damage to the electrical system? Does that mean we have to turn on a lot of diesel motors? Whew, boy, that's a lot of pollution. Well, maybe they're going to use the power wall, the Tesla power walls, those big, huge electric cells. Um, I, I'm surprised he didn't answer that question. Um, the other, my final point is air circulation. You know, if we keep building these blockbuster designs, is the wind, is the fresh ocean breeze going to really travel? Is it going to be healthy in these buildings and between these buildings? It's something our planners, overall, public and private, should give more attention to, and the state should have develop policy on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Still no one else online, Ms. Bush? Um, no. Very good. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, uh, Bradley Snyder. Uh, I, I just uh, I just wanted to say that uh, you know after having lived in um, several buildings uh, built by Barry Swenson and seeing him uh, develop five 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 from scratch from you know from from the ground uh, you know to the day, the day they topped out until they finished it. And then looking at this new development at uh, Laurel and Pacific, roughly that that block that's been developed, and um, just thinking about units that are in, in uh, the dimensions that I've lived in two Barry Swenson buildings. I lived at uh, the St. George for uh, three, approximately three years, and at uh, 425 Pacific for three years. Was it? Yeah, it's been so long. 401 Pacific, 420, 401 Pacific. Excuse me. Uh, basically, they're tiny. I mean, they're they're very confining, and they're really really pricey. And so I feel I feel a little bit like you know what it does so solve a you know a, a concern or an issue, uh, which is you know people don't have uh, options uh, to rent. Uh, the students, you know, U UCSC's uh, kind of gotten to the point where you know I'm I'm, I'm feeling like uh, ironically suggesting the city change its name to UC Santa Cruz. Um, it's Basically, uh, you know, yeah, everybody, everybody from many, many different um, uh, uh, sides of that uh, particular problem are, you know, are, they're struggling for, uh, you know, uh, access to places to rent. But I just don't feel these are going to be very affordable. That's how I view it. And then also one uh, concern I have, one definite concern I have is that the scope of the building, the size, uh, the height, if you subtract, say, the 10 foot or however tall the levee is, 10 to 12 feet, you're looking at 80 feet of, uh, for a very narrow parcel, you're, you're, you're shielding the afternoon sun from the estuary, which you know, has its consequences on the habitat. So that's, that's my uh, input. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, still no one else online? Still no one else. No one else. Anyone else wish to make comment on this item? Hearings closed matter is back before the council. This will be the opportunity for a council member to make a motion, then we will debate that motion. I'll make a motion. What is your motion, sir? Uh, motion uh, for development proposal at 514, 516, 518, 524, and 530 Front Street involving lot line adjustment, non-residential demolition authorization permit, special use permit, design permit, additional height requests, density bonus requests, revocable license for outdoor extension area, and heritage tree removal permit to demolish existing commercial buildings, reconfigure four lots into one, remove eight heritage trees, and construct a mixed-use building with 276 residential dwelling units, including a 50% density bonus and 6,865 square feet of commercial space with design variations to downtown plan development standards on a site in the CBD slash F dash P slash FP dash O zone district and within the Front Street Riverfront area of the downtown plan. Second. 
There's a motion, there's a second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Mr. Newsom, you may open on your motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for this project. I think this project will be a great addition to our downtown and our riverfront, uh, and by extension, my district and our city. Uh, the project provides 276 units of much needed housing with 38 of the with 38 of the units being affordable housing and 28 of those units uh, being very low income. Uh, and this project will also draw uh, more focus towards uh, the river while bringing more investment into our, our river walk. Uh, and it will also allow for members of our community to live where they work and use alternative means of transportation when commuting to work. Uh, so I support this project. Thank you, sir. Yes. Ms. Bush. All right. I do just want to confirm that um, what you were reading, Councilmember Newsom, is actually the title of the report, and I just want to confirm that the recommendation is specifically about a resolution. Um, I can put it on the screen if you want, or if you, it's the staff recommendation. You just read the whole um, title as opposed to the staff recommendation. Should I read the staff recommendation? Let me, let me see if we can make this a little quicker. Uh, by way of clarification, you are moving the staff recommendation. Yes. Okay. There we go. That'll be the motion. Agreeable to the second? Yes. That is the motion. Now under debate and discussion. Can I have a question? Please. Sorry. Ms. Watkins. Yes, I apologize. I, I didn't ask apologies. this question. I should have asked the question earlier during question time, but I was just curious, um, and maybe staff and I, I may have missed this if, uh, as I stepped out for a moment. In regards to the, the pump station and the timeline, do you have, did you specify kind of what that looks like in relationship to this development and process? Or could you ex expand on that? I can speak a little bit, okay. um, and then I'm gonna lean on public works. Um, so basically, um, we have a, a very general concept, but we don't have a design. Um, and uh, we don't know that the design, the timing of the design is gonna land up, line up with when the applicant's gonna pull their building permit, that's why we uh, kind of did this work around in that area. And um, I don't know if Curtis wants to come up and speak a little more to that. Okay. Let's, so let, let's do these at the microphone if you had a response. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Curtis Buzenart, Public Works Engineering. I'm an engineering associate. Uh, as far as the timing of it, we're not sure. Schaffen Wheeler is a consultant working on it. Uh, it's very, very conceptual at this time. Time frame, I really don't know. Katie Stewart is on the meeting, and I think she can touch on that better than I can. Let, let me, if, if I might ask on that question. I, I, perhaps for some of us, the, the question is, uh, we approved this project as recommended. You have sufficient, the city then has sufficient space in that property to do what you need to do going forward. You may do it concurrent with or following or whatever, but those are not in conflict with each other. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Other question? Questions? I think I, we're good. I just had a few comments, yeah. but I appreciate you framing that um, that way, Mayor. That's ex essentially what I was getting at in terms okay. of making sure that we had adequately um, planned for that or not had missed an opportunity to adequately plan for that. So anyways, thank you for framing it that way. I just had a brief comment. I know that there was a slide that went up in regards to the different impact fees and I appreciate that slide. I think, and I appreciate the context of community benefit associated with the slide. I, um, having been really trying very hard my whole time on council to get the child care impact fee, I am really happy to see that on there. And just so you or in the broader community is aware, we have a serious challenge with child care in our community, especially as we're thinking about our downtown and having density in terms of uh, people and workforce. So it is a critical component of the fabric of our community and in addition to the other impact fees that are associated with that. So it is about a holistic community and putting that in that context, I think was uh, is important to reference and, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask whoever could respond to how it will be anchored in the ground. I think that was brought up. Okay. Also the question about the 
um, six stories and 85 feet, eight stories, 92 feet. So I don't know if that would be Lee Butler or Jesse Bristow or both that could answer those questions that were brought up. Good afternoon, Mr. Butler. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Bruner, for that question. I can answer broadly speaking with respect to both of those. Um, that we have uh, our experts in our building division, our building official, and um, our plan check engineers who review the building design at the building permit stage to ensure that the foundation is meeting all the various standards, both the seismic standards as well as the structural standards, and uh, taking into account the subsurface water flows that were identified by the prior speaker and um, making sure that the building foundation is sufficient to withstand the uh, necessary forces in order to um, make sure that everyone is safe. So um, the foundation type can vary. Um, I, I would defer to the applicant if you want specifics on what type of foundation they are, are seeking to uh, pursue for the project, um, but we will be looking at it carefully as part of the uh, building permit process and making sure that it's meeting all the applicable regulations from the building code. Um, with respect to the number of stories, if you look at the um, Pacific Front Laurel project, um, that uh, project has a, a first level from the exterior that is roughly 18 feet or so in height. Um, and you, you get that variation, um, 18 or 20 feet or so. And um, that appears as one level from the outside. There is a mezzanine on the interior there. There are two levels of parking um, behind that 20 feet. Um, and um, in portions of that area, there is um, there are offices and uh, uh, bike parking. And so that one level that is perceived by some uh, from the exterior, sometimes it, it can be perceived as two levels, um, depending on where you're at in the building. Similarly, there's a portion of that building above 75 feet, I believe it is, where um, there is a, an eighth floor, if you're counting that first floor as two, um, then there's an eighth floor, which is only for a portion of the building, but that's a mezzanine level above some of the top residential levels. So um, as often is the case um, with our work, the answer for the number of floors is it depends on where you are looking at it in the building and um, how you're looking at it um, from the, the exterior or counting some of those interior levels. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I also had a quick comment um, to Jesse Bristow who gave the presentation. I just um, wanted to also thank you for answering some of my questions. And um, I appreciate the visual of showing um, the context of the buildings that are coming around this site. I think that's something that when I talk with members of the public um, about all the development, I ha it's hard not to it's hard not to look at the entire neighborhood. And if we only look at this one project, um, I would be crying out for uh, more. Um, uh, for example, uh, very low and low uh, housing units, but in context of the five or so surrounding blocks, we have four buildings that will be 100% um, low income housing coming up right around it. Um, in the context of the bigger city, um, we have a lot um, underway. So it was helpful to see those heights and the context of the surrounding blocks. So thank you, because I think that helps everybody understand. Um, and um, uh, I also, um, let's see, on my notes, I think that, um, oh, Council Member Watkins asked my pump station uh, timeline question and um, my more further nuanced question on that was uh, why that specific spot versus across the street, for example. Hi, council members. This is Katie Stewart, senior professional engineer in the public works department. Um, hopefully, I can give some more context to this. So, 
Um, at this point in the pump station design project, we have completed a feasibility study. So that evaluated all the possible locations along the storm drain line um, that runs along the toll of the levee, um, where we could potentially site a, storm, a new storm pump station to alleviate some of our capacity issues in that storm drain. Um, we looked all the way from Josephine Street all the way down to pump station one, which is located just south of Laurel Street. Um, and uh, the location that was identified, this is the only feasible location to sort of solve our issues of capacity in existing storm drain pipes that are too small, um, specifically the pipe that runs from um, Soquel Avenue um, south into the pump station at Laurel Street. So you're limited and there's not a lot you can do upstream um, to reduce the amount of flow that's entering the pipe there. Um, so the, the current location was the one that was identified as our, our best and most feasible spot to site this. Thank you, Katie. I think that um, answers um, the question for me, and um, I, I just, overall, my final comment is that, um, you know, in speaking with a lot of uh, members of the public and some of the emails we've received and comments here in person, I think that um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and we must remember that when we speak about um, something being grotesque or ugly. Um, and we really um, have to look at the benefits of um, the housing and the housing inventory that this will bring um, to our city. Um, and it's, it's our housing demand of housing inventory at all income levels is so great. And I'm so proud of our city. If you all haven't uh, read our recent press release that we are, I think it was 6% of the state. We are one of the 6% of the state that met our fifth cycle regional housing needs allocation goals in all income levels of housing. And so as we enter into our sixth cycle with, I think like tri triple the numbers, um, and um, I think it's really important to um, really look holistically at each unit as a win-win, especially when we have hundreds of voucher holders that cannot find a unit to rent. And they've received subsidized housing vouchers that will help um, them pay rent, and that includes even market rate rents in some cases, depending on the individuals. So um, uh, I'm, I just want to put that into context. And um, uh, thank you so much. That, that concludes my question. Thank you, Council Member. Ms. Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I'll just make some brief comments. I had the opportunity to meet with um, Jesse Bristow and team and, and staff, so I've asked my questions ahead of it. But I know that a lot of work has gone into this over the years, and I really appreciate um, the community engagement that's happened. I appreciate community coming to the various forums and providing feedback, and I appreciate city staff and Swenson um, working those into what uh, we see as maybe the final product or close to final product. Um, I, I know that while we are going through these shifts as a community, it's really challenging. We don't know, I mean, we can see all the renderings that we want, but we still don't know what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna feel. Um, and, and, and change is, is hard and it can get messy. Um, but I think what, what I wanna invite folks to do is to be open to it because our community needs are changing. And so we need to meet those needs as my colleagues have said. I'm so glad that you brought up that we were one of the 6% that met the um, arena cycles and we have a lot more work to do. So it's just, it's an invitation to everybody, whether you're in support of this project or not, it's an invitation to think about how our community does need to shift in order to meet the, the changing demands and needs. So thank you for all the thoughtfulness that went into this um, by everyone, the staff and um, Swenson and community members. And I'm happy to support this when it comes to a vote. Thank you. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, I ha actually have a question, a follow-up question, and then I have a couple of brief comments. Um, because I, I do think 
Uh, and thank you, uh, Council Member Bruner, for asking some of those follow-up questions. But w you know, one that was also asked was related to this, uh, the, the, vis the schematics, the, the renderings showing a particular perspective. Um, and it's a question I've asked in the past about why are, you know, for architects and others, when projects come before us, um, why we don't see that street level view and, and because we aren't going to know what it, you know, feels like, um, why don't we try to get a little bit closer to understanding what it, it's going to look and feel like? And so that question about um, why we can't have street view renderings, and, and I'm going to just add in here because it's, it's co people come and ask me, and I've asked about it, um, story polls as well. Um, that would give people a real understanding, I think, or, or some better understanding. I mean, it's not going to do shading and all of that, but to get a sense of um, the height and kind of scale of these projects. So, so why, why can't we, or <laughs> I guess, why aren't they there, and is that possible to, um, to do? Why not, if not? Okay, I'm going to permit that question. We don't Sorry. typically do this under debate and discussion on a motion, but could you answer the gentlelady's question? Yes. Um, so um, we have a uh, checklist for what's required in applications, and but we do require renderings, and we do want them to be from um, the street view to see, to see how it's going to look to a person on the street. Um, we do have that. Um, for this project, um, I didn't show all the renderings in my presentation. I can share some with you now, if you'd like. I, that's okay. I, I've seen them in the in the packet. Um, I'm just talking about. I mean, that's the schematic. I'm, I'm talking about renderings with people and stuff, and so you know the feel of it. Those kind that kind of material. So, but it, it's all right. I, I don't want to be out of order here. It just occurred to me since a member of the public asked, and it's been on my mind. I'd really like to better understand that. If not here, then at some point. Okay, and then I do have a couple of comments. Please, go ahead. Okay, so um, I guess I'll just say uh, a couple of things. I, I want to um, clarify what we are doing here today, uh, just or provide some information that to help kind of clarify or crystallize what uh, the, this project is. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying this to suggest that I'm opposed to this project. Um, wholesale, I, um, but I, I do want people to understand and I want my colleagues to think about the fact that what we're doing here is um, we're approving a project that is 106, no, yeah, 106 units more, um, so 60% more than what was previously approved for this site, um, and we are getting three additional affordable housing units for that. So I just want to say that because I recognize that we are in a constrained realm of possibility. I've said it over and over. Um, but we have a situation where, um, in this case, a developer is receiving a, a lot of additional incentives and, and benefits through state law and has asked for these waivers and concessions, um, which I know are um, technically by right. Um, but there are other questions that could be asked. Um, we haven't asked them here. I'm just going to suggest one of them. I'm not asking the question, but this is rhetorically to, to say, hey, we have, um, you know, I believe we, we should be, we could do better and we should be doing better and that we as a body should be um, asking for more. I'm uh, very glad to hear, Mr. Bristow, that you are willing to engage in that conversation moving forward um, because I want to find a way to get <laughs> to do better. Three more units uh, that are affordable to people earning, you know, around 40 bucks an hour. Um, uh, out for an additional 106 units is a pretty significant benefit with not much affordability. Um, so I, I just, I, I wanted to be very clear about that. Um, I'm, I'm also a bit dismayed by the lack of evidence. Uh, there's an assertion that's made, as our planning staff uh, generally do, about um, the, this is what is needed in order for this project to pencil out. And um, it's just hard for me to imagine that that's um, universally the case that there aren't you know questions that could be asked and um, ways of looking at this a little bit differently when we're talking about such a massive increase in this the scale and the number of units in the project so i just have to say that um, i can't support it um, under those circumstances um, that there's a height there's a significant height increase and um, we're again not getting any additional affordability out of that so um uh, i'm I'll, i think i'll leave it there 
and I'm, I'm, I look forward to future conversations. Further questions or comments? Thank you. A uh, couple of thoughts before we go to a roll call. Uh, I don't think it's any big mystery uh, that throughout the state after decades of local governments uh, maybe not taking anywhere near as seriously as they should housing across a range of incomes that the state of California, whether, well, the state of California decided that the new housing policy is being defined in and sent forth from the state capital. Uh, city councils, boards of supervisors have lost enormous amounts of local land use control. If you like what's been going on the last few decades, then you don't like this new world we're in. If you didn't like it, what's been going on in California in the last few decades, then you have a different view of the state legislation. I would say to those who are concerned about such issues as massing and height and other issues, your issue is with the state legislative delegation. And if you haven't already brought, brought them into your conversation, I suggest you do so. We are not the state legislature. We're a city council that needs to comply with the law. Uh, this will, however, the change in the state's approach to who is in charge will result in very significant making up of time in the city of Santa Cruz relative to building housing across a range of income categories. I don't think the state has that exactly right yet in terms of how they're trying to operationalize their desire to see substantially more housing. And again, if you don't like the current state, I would suggest you speak with the state legislature and the governor about that because that's now out of our hands. Uh, we do have some discretion and exercising that discretion is important because building something in Santa Cruz versus someplace else, we all, every city, every community claims that it's unique, and you know what, they're all right. Every one of them's right, they're unique. Doesn't mean they're better or worse or something, they're unique. So building in Santa Cruz has always been a challenge. It's uh, now, I think, becoming less so, quite a bit less so. I think the state has made it very clear they are incenting the, the development of housing generally and uh, uh, they're doing more than just giving a head nod towards affordable housing. Um, but from my point of view, uh, if they wanted to be earnest about it, they would put a multi-billion dollar affordable housing, general obligation affordable housing bond on the ballot, which if it's approved doesn't raise taxes uh, because it has first claim on the state's general fund when they're assembling the budget. Those are Sacramento issues. I had my opportunity to be a state legislator and cast those votes and think about those concepts. Now I'm a mayor and I have to deal with the hand that has been given to me by the dealers in Sacramento. And in that regard, and without reference to that, without reference to that, I think this is a good project. Certainly with reference to that, then I think it's a quite good project. I wish there was, with Mr. Bristow and others with, uh, with Swenson, uh, we've had conversations about this particular project. I think you've gone a great distance on this. I would like to see two, three, four more units. I understand from your point of view, with all the issues that you have to deal with, that's not available to you at this point from a business perspective. I respect that. I think Swenson has done more than a little bit of good development in the city of Santa Cruz. I consider you a local developer. Uh, I was telling the, uh, the Swenson folks that uh, I remember several years ago that the, that the Homeless Garden Project had its annual holiday wreath operation ready to go and they had a downtown space that was ready for them and it was vacant and they were going into it. All of a sudden, those folks had a tenant. There was gonna be no homeless garden project wreath deal and Swenson says, well, here, we got a, a vacant office space, go ahead and do it. I, I think that is who you are. I think that is. And you've proved that time and time again. 
asking for more or engaging in the conversation about more, especially in this case, two, three, four more moderate income level, I don't feel bad asking for that. I understand why you say no to that in this instance. Uh, and I look forward to the other developments you're going to bring forward because I know what you will do is you will engage us in conversations, especially, and I don't think there's an exception on the city council, for those who are, who are looking to see what is the maximum opportunity for us to meet our extremely low, very low, low and moderate income housing goals. So we will be in conversations with you about that. Uh, and, and I thank you for all the good work you've done. I thank you for taking a hard look at the request for additional affordable units. And I look forward to our engagement earlier in the process on your future projects. Clerk will call the roll. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanna clarify also that um, the staff recommendation was to approve the resolution with the conditions of approval, but staff actually proposed to edit the conditions of approval, and I just wanna make sure that those the are to be included. The is those uh, amended uh, uh, portions of the recommendation from staff. Yes. That includes that, okay. Yes. Anything else? Okay. Council Member Newsom. Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Commentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion is approved. Project is approved. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for your input and your participation. We are on item, tell you what, let's, let's take 10 minutes. City Council is back in session. We're going to make a, an amendment to our uh, to the order in which we're going to take things up. We are instead of going directly to item 31, we are going to go directly to. Thank you. We are going to instead proceed at this time to item number 34, receipt of the annual. Assembly Bill 841 Military Equipment Report. Uh, we are going to take this up uh, in the interest of a uh, couple members of the public who have some other items that will conflict, other calendar items for themselves tonight. And the Chief has been kind enough to uh, uh, accommodate this, uh, this change in the order. So members, again, we are on item number 33. Chief, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Bernie Escalani, Chief of Police, and uh, I'd like to introduce Sergeant Josh Trog, who will be introducing the the report, the required AB 41 annual report. Um, and you also received the detailed report with uh, a, a higher level of details, but we're going to give more of a just a higher uh, overarching review of that report and, and available for questions. Thank and I'll you, turn Chief. it over to Sergeant Trump. Sergeant, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, thank you. So just for a little background, mm -hmm. uh, effective January of 2022, uh, the state legislature required that we report on all items 
deemed as military equipment. So in May 10th of 2022, the city of Santa Cruz uh, adopted uh, an ordinance and uh, the Santa Cruz Police Department's policy 705 regarding all of these items. We are required to present an annual report. Uh, the report uh, requires approval and uh, the, the ordinance requires ongoing approval from the council each year that the report is presented. And the intent of the report uh, is to establish safeguards and transparency and oversight for all of the department's uh, equipment that falls under this uh, AB 480 next slide. So these slides, uh, which I will go through fairly quickly, are just an overview of the items that we were talking about uh, with some visual representations uh, to assist. So this slide uh, notes the items in category one, five, two, and three, which are the robots, unmanned aerial vehicles, the command and control vehicles, and the armored vehicles. Next slide, please. The slide depicts uh, the transport vehicles, specialized firearms and ammunition of less than 50 caliber, and firearms and ammunition of greater than 50 caliber. Of course, uh, pepper ball, tear gas, flashbangs, or noise flash diversionary devices, uh, the 40 millimeter launchers and associated ammunition, and the long range acoustic device. Mm -hmm. And then item 15 is all other specified equipment. And for uh, our policy, the items that fall under that were the department's AR-15 rifles, as directed by council at the time that the original uh, ordinance and policy were approved. The graph uh, indicates where these items were deployed or used throughout the, the uh, year. Um, the yellow denotes training. Light green color denotes in the field. Uh, the dark green color denotes AOD or assist other department. And then the blue color, the darker blue color, color indicates uh, refueling. And then the lighter blue color indicates uh, a demo. So with that, um, the R-15 rifles were used in training 15 times throughout the year. We did not have a use of force with those rifles. Uh, during the year. Uh, the 40 millimeter launchers were used uh, 24 times. By use, that means they were deployed. Doesn't necessarily mean they were used in the, uh, against a person, but they were deployed as a less lethal option in an active law enforcement incident. And they were three times in training. Uh, we used flashbangs, tear, tear gas uh, in twice in training. Um, firearms uh, and ammunition of less than 50 caliber uh, we used in training. Uh, the command and control vehicles are patrol cars. They get used every single day, providing a metric of where they go and what they do. They, uh, For the purposes of AB 41, they are, quote, command and control vehicles and fall under military equipment, but the department only uses patrol vehicles. Uh, they're deployed every single day. And being able to provide an exact number, I would not be able to do that. Um, the armored personnel carrier, that report is redundant in the AB41 report to the one that council already receives for the Bearcat use report. It is the exact same data um, and how it was used uh, during the year. Uh, we requested the use of the Sheriff's Office unmanned aerial vehicle twice last year. Um, both were used in once was to search for a subject, and the other was an assistance in mapping a crime scene. And then we used the, re the recon robot uh, in the field twice, uh, in training, and in community demonstration. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit better breakdown of the Bearcat use. Uh, it's a little bit easier to digest the data on how we used it. Um, if there are any questions about this, I can go into it at that appropriate time. Uh, I'm not going to 
belabor the point with reading this graph. Next slide, please. So cost associated with uh, all of the equipment. Um, as you can see, the bulk of our costs are associated to training. Um, there are maintenance costs in there, refueling uh, equipment and training courses. Most of the training costs associated here are absorbed in normal department training. Um, this is just a reflection of what uh, the dollar amount associated to that to the best that we can compile uh, for that training. Um, next slide, please. So intended acquisitions, uh, we've already seen council related to the recon robot that was approved last month or earlier this month. Uh, the department intends to uh, may explore a unmanned aerial vehicle program in this uh, coming this year, or we are we are expressing that uh, that uh, intention. And then we also uh, are expressing the intention to purchase some ammunition for the breaching shotguns that we have, uh, so that we can continue training and have those available for use if need be. Uh, we will be having a community uh, event uh, for the AB 41 report. It will be on May 16th, 5.30 p.m. via Zoom, uh, and we will be able to go into the report uh, for the community and answer questions and uh, take comments then. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. Let me do this. Let me see if uh, council members have questions. We are going to also receive two presentations here from members of the public that have requested opportunity to do so. Uh, yes, please, Ms. Bruner. I just had a, I was curious about the armored personnel carrier vehicle. Um, it looks like three of the four uh, uses were to assist other agencies, Scotts Valley, Sheriff and Watsonville. And then the refueling, how does that cost work out for um, the fuel cost? I was just curious. So when I was compiling this report, I reached out to uh, the yard, the corporation yard, and I asked them for any and all data related to the vehicles that were sent here or that were are covered under this report. And they provided me with a spreadsheet and those costs of how much they uh, have record of the fuel that it costs to run that vehicle for the reporting period. So that's where the data for the fuel cost came from. Thank you. Thank you. For the questions, comments, Ms. Watkins. For the, uh, for the aerial, that's, is that a drone? Is yes. it, okay, it's just one of Yes, <laughs> I, apolo I apologize no, for no, not No, 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 I, I figured as much, but I just wanted to confirm, thanks. Let me, uh, Go to the members of the public who have requested time. Good afternoon. Good evening, rather. Uh, I, would, I would actually like to request that Peter Gelblum online be allowed to go first because he has an engagement. Not a problem. Not a problem. Go ahead. We'll, we'll go to the online if he's. Is he there? How much time am I giving people? Three minutes? I'm sorry. Am I giving three minutes? Yes, three minutes on this, yes. Tell me when we're good to go. Good to go. Good afternoon, Mr. Or good evening, rather, Mr. Goldblum. <laughs> good evening. It is still light out. <clears throat> so, uh, this this in in a very significant way is the easiest item on the agenda for tonight, because all you got to do is do what the law tells you to do. The law says it very simply, without any kind of uh, opportunity to avoid it, and you need to do it. So. What, what it says in the staff report uh, um, uh, refers to it, this statute, AB 41, prohibits you from approving, from renewing the ordinance unless you make three or four findings. The three important ones are, and this is in the staff report, the military equipment is necessary because there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective of officer and civilian safety. 
The proposed military equipment use policy will safeguard the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. And C, if purchasing the equipment, the equipment is reasonably cost effective compared to available alternatives that can achieve the same objective of officer and civilian safety. I've read everything that's been submitted. You have no information before you, zero information before you, in which you can make any of those determinations. So all I ask, and I said it's simple, is to ask the sergeant or whatever representative of SCPD is appropriate to answer those questions for you, to tell you what are the alternatives. They haven't given you any. How does this protect civil liberties and civil rights? There's nothing in the report that tells you that. And by law, you are not allowed to approve the ordinance or renew the ordinance unless you make, unless you know those things and make those determinations. So it's real straightforward. Got to get the information. If you don't have it, you can't approve it. Um, the burden is on the city council members to do this because you're the backstop. There's no private right of action for this. If you approve it without that, that uh, those determinations, you are quite frankly breaking the law. The resolution that's been presented to you by staff has those findings in them, but quite frankly, at this point, I'll be blunt, that's a lie. You have not made those determinations, and you cannot make them right now because you don't have any evidence on which to base those determinations. There's tons of other problems with the submission that you approved last year, but let me just focus on those three because if you do that, I'd be very curious to hear what the answers to your questions are, but please, somebody ask the questions that will allow you to make the determination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brokaw, good evening. Eight minutes? That's right, yeah. Okay. This, do I have my eight minutes? I don't see a clock. You will have your eight minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, sir. The state has codified AB 481 military equipment used by law enforcement in such a way that you council members are the enforcers. This, as I see it, is a responsibility that you may not have realized as you sought your elected positions. For the most part, approving of vehicles, trucks, and other listed equipment is benign, although I didn't know we had an armored personnel carrier. Being a veteran, an armored personnel carrier means something very specific to me, and we don't own one. However, when it comes to lethal weapons specifically, sniper rifles and assault weapons, by your vote to approve their use in our urban environment, should someone, anyone, be injured or killed by these weapons, I would suggest council members are responsible, as responsible, as a law enforcement officer who pulled the trigger because you allowed it. That's what responsibility is. Taking responsibility for your decisions and your actions. This is a serious vote that you are about to have may be the most serious vote you will ever make in your life. The law allows you under code 7075 to set your own rules with regard to military, equi military equipment codified under code 7070 to 7075. You have the power, for instance, to vote to postpone the vote on this report until the chief has made the required public presentation, which he has scheduled for after the vote. And that makes the public participation null if it's already approved, why would anybody come to a meeting to talk about it? And in my opinion, his report does not follow the law. You have the power to tell the chief to get the policy section 705 corrected to be in compliance with the law. It is not. I'm not here to go through that. I have to say that the mayor and I have had conflicting schedules trying to get together so that we could have an informative discussion. The group that I represent would be very 
open to having a Brown Act meeting with council to go through the law item by item, even with law enforcement present to rebut what we're saying. I don't care, but you're a school principal, you teach in the university, none of you have experience with this sort of stuff. I'm a military veteran. I've qualified on an M14. I've qualified on an M16. I've qualified on a 45 semi-automatic pistol. In the 70s, early 70s, during the Vietnam era, and I'm proud to tell you that when I shot at the target downrange, I aimed over the target because that was the way I could resist. It's not in my remarks, I'm sorry. I got carried away. Um, the questions I'm going to ask are questions that council should be asking. The job assigned to you is to ask questions of law enforcement and not rubber stamp what they have given you. You have as much time as you need. You do not need to rush. With regard to the Bearcat, there is no mechanism in the SCPD policy manual, which is part of this submission, to ensure that the borrowing agency, Sheriff, Scotts Valley, Watsonville, that they follow our procedures. We own that equipment. We have created procedures by which we as a community want to see this piece of military equipment used appropriately. It is our moral responsibility to ensure that our values are enforced when that equipment is used by others. There is no enforcement mechanism in writing on the policy 705 or in the report that was just presented to you. Number five under Bearcat, demonstrations. Listed for the Citizens Police Academy, which I attended with Ms. Bruner. List no complaint. However, I did emphatically object to the Bearcat being on display in front of the police department for an extended period of time before and after it was used as an adult jungle gem for the attendees. When we set the rules for the use of the Bearcat, it was to be used for very specific things. Parades and demonstrations were excluded. The demonstration could have easily been in the walled off parking lot and not on display for the public who were go coming and going at commute hour. There was no need for it to be there and my complaint was blown off and obviously it's not registered. On 11-16-22, you list the training costs of $78.50. Are you kidding me? That's about what we pay with benefits for one hour of one law enforcement officer. How many officer person hours were involved, multiplied by their wages, the benefits, the cost of amortization because of the use of the vehicles, these are the kinds of costs that are required to be public knowledge. The general statement, the following general statement that appears in the report in writing for every category is insufficient and not in keeping with the law. That statement says, annual costs for personnel, training, transportation, and storage were absorbed into the department's operating budget. That didn't tell you anything. The law requires specifics. How many dollars were spent on labor? How many dollars were spent on materials? How much value was lost because you used the equipment? These are the kinds of costs that are supposed to be in this report. This kind of a statement is what, and I'm gonna give you a new word, copaganda. <laughs> this is copaganda, and 481 was crafted to make, trans, make that transparent. Absorbed isn't in compliance with the law, item by item costs, not generalities. Statement two, our group has trained, has been trained by the American Friends in every aspect of this law. We've studied it, we've presented it to the public on a forum on 481. We offered to help SCPD comply with this law as they prepared for the report. 
because I was told it was labor intensive, a lot of data. We offered to help so that we wouldn't be going through something like this. I'm seeing 23 seconds, that must not be accurate. Um, pardon? You, did you? I'll be glad to run the meeting. When you're elected mayor, you can run the meeting. We offered to do this so we wouldn't have to try and do this in eight minutes and in front of the public. The chief's exact words in response to my offer were, I have to go feed my kid, and he left the building. I can't make this up. This is accurate. Category eight, no, fire. What you can do is wrap it up. Category eight, firearms greater than 50 caliber. Shotguns, launching shotguns. How many times were they used under color of authority in the past 20 years? What's the annual cost? Firearms less than 50 Mr. caliber. Kuka, your time is up. You're a half a minute over. You and I negotiated eight minutes. You got your eight minutes. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to comment? Good afternoon. Good evening, sir. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the negatives because, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is very serious. We're talking about uh, basically higher ordinance that didn't, you know, normally be considered normal for police uh, enforcement, the, the law enforcement um, arm of the Department of Justice. Uh, the, uh, well, okay, the last three officers that have died in the line of duty in, this, in the county, uh, to my knowledge, were well. You could you could construe, uh, you know, how they died is you know by the use of military technology. Now I know that it's just a, it's, you're talking about uh, gun riots, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I want I want to say that drones. First of all, drone technology is very um, invasive it's it's a, it's a, it and privacy is a, is a huge issue for most citizens and the idea of you know having un, unmanned that, that word unmanned the uav unmanned oh good there's no one flying around in that thing look you know it, it, so uh so, yeah uh drones we're talking about drones just like a toy a hobby drone or a but it's uh you know it's it's scoping out the situation if you if you uh look at what happened uh, before the last election the presidential election with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, if you know what happened in that uh, scenario, um, he began to be chased by protesters when a drone took off. The moment the drone took off, he began to be chased by protesters. And then he was cornered, and what uh, what took place, uh, you know, is very, very serious business. And so what you were, what, what really um, uh, contributed to that uh, situation, and I know I know this sounds like uh, maybe something you've never thought about before, but um, it was you know the drone in that situation uh, kind of whipped people into a frenzy. Now we've had all kinds of demonstrations in the city of Santa Cruz far, you know, uh, over the years we've had them um, uh, block off Highway 17, uh, uh, close campus. I think that happens uh, every. Uh, February or uh, I forget if it's February or March when they close campus, but close, you know what I mean? We, we have all kinds of uh, demonstrations. I mean, uh, just ever so frequently. And, um, you know, it's gotten quite strident, uh, you know, in, in my recollection from having lived here for, uh, you know, over uh, 20 years of my life in Santa Cruz, uh, it's gotten quite strident quite often. And having military technology really doesn't protect officers to any huge degree in those scenarios, and then the crime, the other, like, the, it's just the criminology, the standard cr criminology analysis is, I, I don't really see them as very necessary. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I go left the room for 10 minutes. Did we skip over some items? I want to talk on 34. So, I'm Did sorry. we skip over 31 <laughs> and 32? I know. We're going to skip 33. Yeah, and we will be returning. Okay, to those. great. Yes. So what was it? This, this item four weeks ago was like 44 pages. Two weeks ago it was three pages. Today it's 53 pages. 
believe me, I would have loved to have commented on 30, but, you know, I got other places to go and I want to be efficient. You know, Mr. Keeley, you made a comment about the state making these laws and regulations, so I'm just going to read this as part of it because it works for, for um, whatever this one is, 34. You said the state, so I'm going to say it slightly differently. The state, deep state, has made enough issues as clear as this is progress or this is idiocracy. So how this affects all of us in law enforcement, first of all, since 1917, the city and county council members are controlled by their city and county managers. You guys are just following scripts. Now, I've said before, without law enforcement, we don't, we don't, have, we don't have enforceable laws. And those personnel are doing a very important public service. Um, so yeah, about the every officer to my knowledge is still issued their own AR-15 and they're required to know how to use that. I think that's really important. You know, it's not that difficult to hit a one foot sphere at 500 yards. Um, it's not that easy either. So I'm in some disagreement about some of the priorities here because you know, once again, on those 53 pages on page 10 of that, on the military weapons allowable, the microwave weapons came up on page 10. And that's just an elephant in the room that is affecting all of us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. I mean, I've spoken before about how only teachers and youth are being thrown under the bus more than law enforcement because of the unshielded frequency devices. but. I mean, I made a few people laugh in this room for saying I had my hands on a phased array antenna. Maybe that was my own get out of jail free card. I'm not sure, but um, that was a great mistake. So things are going to happen the way they're going to happen. Um, my un understanding, and I'm wrong all the time, is that law enforcement really became connected as a paramilitary force in 1996 in this country. Now, if you were to interview law enforcement in the United Kingdom, 78% refuse to say that they're part of the Masons, which is a completely different subject. Um, so it'll just be interesting as far as how we are all gonna choose to be personally accountable for ourselves and other people's safety and welfare now and in the future. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, we have someone on the Person online, good evening. Two people currently. <laughs> Good evening, online. Three, two, one, we'll take the next person online. Good evening. Hi, um, this is Scott Graham. Uh, I was just wondering why they're seeking the approval for this before the public meeting. I, I would think that there would want to, that you as our representatives would want the public meeting to happen before you approve this. Uh, it seems, uh, you know, putting the cart before the horse um, with what they're doing here. The other question I have is who will these, this military equipment be used on? Will it be used on the public members of the public here in Santa Cruz? Is that what it's for? Or is it for some invading force from outside the country? Um, how often have these mil have this military equipment been used in the past, you know, 20 years or so? You know, like, uh, like Lee was saying, he went through a bunch of things. Um, it's Category 10, firearms less than 50 caliber, sniper rifles. How many times... Under the color of authority, have they been used in the past 20 years? Category 11, missing, what is it? Um, category 12, flashbang tear gas pepper balls. Flashbang has exploded, a decibel that caused permanent hearing loss. Do you want that on your conscience or a lawsuit about it? Uh, tear gas is governed by AB 48 and as much as different than you have seen historically. When is it time to replenish tear gas that is expired? I would hope you'd ask why we need it in the first place. How many times used under the color of authority in the past 20 years? Annual cost of having this tear gas. 
Category 13, LRAD, another device that can cause permanent hearing loss. How many times used under color of authority in the past 20 years? Annual cost of this item. Category 14, 40 millimeter launchers. Uh, used because suicidal person refused to comply with a command. Um, this is a good example of what the Santa Cruz Police Department should not be doing. Uh, assault weapons. Do not track firearm usage. Colt carbines. See handouts. LMT carbines. 556 223 rounds. Damage. Hollow point bullets explode when they hit something. These are considerations. Consider that you must resolve to approve this yearly report. There are many more issues with the 705 policy manual to bring into compliance. Um, it's really uh, unbelievable that this is before you right now. Um, I would say that the best thing you could do is put this off for at least another month or maybe two months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll try the other person. Try the other one. Okay. Good idea. Good evening. If you are online, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. I'm, I'm here as a member of Surge, showing up for racial justice, um, Santa Cruz County. And I, I want to just... Um, yeah, reiterate the the call to to not make a decision today because um, because there hasn't been the public conversation and to make a decision today before that it would go against the intent and the purpose of the law. Um, I also want to doubly emphasize how serious this issue is um, and. Just in case, in case you haven't had a chance to read the the law, like the very first paragraph lays out a lot, like the acquisition of military equipment and its de deployment, it it has an adverse impact on the public safety and welfare, including increased risk of civilian deaths, risk to civil rights, civil liberties, physical and psychological well-being, and significant financial costs. It's more frequently deployed against black and brown folks. Um, well, I changed communities to folks, um, but I'm reading from the law, meaning the risks and impacts of police militarization are experienced more acutely in marginalized communities. Um, so I just want you to really take to heart how serious this, um, your task is right now, and that you're our oversight body you're the ones responsible for this. Um, the report does not appear to be complete at all. Um, there, the issue of how, what the agreement is with other, um, with other agencies when we, loan, when we loan out equipment, that needs to be super clear. Um, the, so tear gas. So the Bearcat is a huge one, um, and there needs to be a lot more detail on that. And so tear gas is is governed under AB 48 and AB 481. And tear gas, did you know, it was prohibited for use in war by the Geneva Convention because of the impacts it has on human beings. It's... Um, Flashbangs, it was also mentioned, permanent hearing loss. These are things that can contribute to death, um, but they're, they're euphemistically called less lethal. Um, please take the time you need to study this issue well. Thank you so much. Anyone else with us online, Ms. Bush? All right. Matters back before the council. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I uh, have, having been involved in this, uh, this decision the past year uh, when this uh, law was initially um, 
passed the state law and, and brought to us uh, <clears throat> a first round of inventory and the initial ordinance, um, a lot of questions were raised, and I think uh, the um, Lee Chief, thank you. At the at the time, you were um, open to including some additional information in that inventory, and I appreciate your willingness to, um, you know, take take this. Uh, issue seriously, uh, as members of the public have suggested, this is, uh, you know, the council has been given through AB 481 some serious responsibility. It may not feel that way, um, but it, we really do. <laughs> we may not have asked for it, but here it is. Um, and um, as we decide how to implement a law that's like arguably very convoluted, um, difficult to interpret in some places um, and and kind and vague. Um, it's you know we are challenged and um, you know the goal of this bill was on increased understanding and transparency and I'm um, uh, not really feeling like it, it's achieving that goal. That's another matter for the way the state law has been written. Um, but I I also want to talk about he, here um, that I I agree with um, our first caller that we we really don't have the information um, that I think we should have to make findings of necessity, um, public welfare assurances, and um, and cost effectiveness. In this inventory, I'm not suggesting you didn't do your job, but I don't feel that um, it's here. And so, um, and I'm also really hard pressed to understand why we can't make this decision after a community meeting is held. It just seems so backwards to me. So I'm gonna, um, having heard everything and, and heard from the public, I'm gonna move that we uh, delay making a decision on this ordinance and the inventory until after the May 16th meeting that we bring this back, not for another round it's of a motion. Is um, there a second? Sorry. <laughs> Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. No. Matters still back before the council. Is there? A, I'll recognize someone for a motion on this. No motions. No. I'll, I'll go ahead and move the recommendation. Staff recommendation is moved. Is there a second? I'll second. I do have any questions. Uh, second by Ms. Countar Johnson. You are recognized for a question. I, I am also curious about the timing, if someone could speak to that. Um, why today and why not after the community meeting? So we actually have the city attorney's office. Stephanie Duck, uh, I believe, is online here, and she can give her, her legal perspective. But I will um, basically read Government Code 7072B, which states... Within 30 days of submitting and publicly releasing an annual military equipment report pursuant to this section, the law enforcement agency shall hold at least one public, well-publicized and conveniently located uh, community engagement meeting at which the general public may discuss, et cetera, et cetera. This was posted on our transparency portal on April 20th, 2023. Um, although, as Councilmember Brown mentioned, uh, the, the, the way this legislation was written, um, it is very vague, it is very hard to understand. Therefore, we've relied on the city attorney's office to give us some interpretation on this. And their interpretation has been after the city council meeting. So that's what we've relied on. But I'll let uh, Stephanie Duck weigh in on, on her interpretation. Ms. Duck, good evening. Good evening. Um, I think the chief hit pretty much every point I was going to make. And, and while the statute is not um, entirely clear in some aspects, I think it is actually very clear with this annual report um, and community meeting, community meeting timing requirements that the community meeting is to be held 30 days within 30 days of being submitted uh, to council and publicly released. Um, that does not mean that the council cannot decide to, to push this and have the community meeting first and then hear um, and, and vote to renew the ordinance. Um, but the AB 481 seems to contemplate having the annual report come to city council, the council receiving the report, voting to renew the, the ordinance, and then holding the community meeting within 30 days after that. Thank you. One more question. Sure. Um, what, what are the next steps after the community meeting? How... How can council um, be kept abreast of what what transpired and concerns that were brought up, or can we be? 
can you? Uh, that that's a great question. Uh, I would assume that if there were any um, any changes made to the the policy or the ordinance, then we would have to bring it. We would have to bring it back before the governing body for approval of that change. If there were no changes, um, that annual report would sit for for the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, you and I engaged in a conversation yesterday uh, about this precise point about uh, whether the law is clear on this, about where the report is, where our action is, where the public meeting is. Uh, I do think that it is, I think a plain reading of this could be interpreted as follows. This is my thought about it. It says, within 30 days of submitting and publicly releasing the annual report, submitting, assuming that we are the body to whom you are submitting it, and publicly releasing the annual report, there it is. It could be, sub my reading is, it could be submitted to and released to the public at a point in time. The department shall hold at least one well-publicized and conveniently located, et cetera, at which the department should discuss the report and respond to public questions. My plain reading of that is that it is not contrary to the statute that once you have submitted the report and made it publicly available, it's not inconsistent to then hold the public meeting because the statute then says to discuss the report and respond to public questions regarding funding acquisition use of military equipment then it seems that it would not be inconsistent that based on that information you that we then agendize the entire item for an action by the city council that's how i read this that it does not prohibit the public meeting what is I think not allowed is to have a general public meeting on this subject without the report being submitted and made public. That that's the basis of the public meeting is that. I don't read this to say we could then, after you've submitted, been made public, hold the meeting, then you bring the entire package to us for council action. That's how I read it that it is at least sufficiently vague to permit that order of things. Chief and I talked about this yesterday. As I understand our conversation, sir, starting next year with next year's report, you, I believe you said you do not have an objection to providing the report, then hold the meeting, then come to the council if I understood our conversation correctly. If that's not accurate, I don't, I don't want to do, say something that's inaccurate about our conversation. No, that, that is accurate. Okay. So I think that perhaps a way to go here is to take, is to adopt the motion that's on the table. If the maker of the motion would agree to it, I would like to add additional direction that for the next annual report, that the report be submitted and publicly released, followed by the public meeting. Following that, you would return to the council for a final action by the council. Is that agreeable to the maker of the motion? I made the motion, and that is agreeable, but I do want to get one clarification before. Very good. Please, go ahead. And maybe it's for the city attorney. If you have the submitting of the public report, does it need to first be received, or what is that? point of submission to? I, I think the mayor um, accurately described a fair interpretation of the, of the statute, which uh, I will echo the sentiment about the vagueness. Um, what I would suggest is that the report come to the city council in an agenda packet as an information item only, okay. at least 30 days before uh, the council takes action and the um, and the public meeting can then be held within that 30-day period. Such is my amendment. Good, Ms. Bush. 
clear on that? Agreeable, agreeable to the second? Yep. All right, thank you. Is there a debate or discussion on the motion as amended? Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. <coughs> Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are at a quarter to six in the evening and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, several more items to get through. Uh, let's do this. Let's take up item 31 and let's take up Let's take up item 31, take a break, come back and finish up our agenda. Agreeable to members? Any objection to that? I do know yes. that there are some community members who are waiting to speak on 32, but. On 32? That could be a long you know, 31 one. 31 so. is, is going to be, I imagine, rather quick. Uh, and Mayor, I will, I will also share, we have county staff that have been standing by for item 32 as well. Well, as I said earlier, we're going to take up item 32 before dinner as well. <laughs> so, all right, there we go. Let's go to item 31. This is uh, Children's Fund Oversight Committee, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> appointments. Uh, Ms. Bush? We have applications? Yes. Thank you. So we have, um, currently we have two at-large appointments for the Children's Fund so if we have any nominations to fill this, you can okay. name up to two if you want. Sure. And before we do, let me see if there are any comment from the public on this item. Anyone wishes, uh, who's with us in chambers wish to make a comment? Seeing hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do not. I recognize uh, Ms. Watkins. Sure. I just want to, first of all, say thank you to all the applicants. It definitely makes our job hard. I, but I want to nominate Ryan Coonerty uh, to serve and appreciate his perspective, um, given his history with Thrive. There's a motion. Was that one? Or did oh, you I need two? two, two. Yeah. I'm sorry. And Allison Guevara. Yeah. There are two nominees. Is there a second for those two nominees? Oh, Ms. Kalantari yes. Johnson. Motion and a second. Further nominees, nominations, Ms. Bruner? I'd like to nominate Araceli Contreras. I'll second that. Okay, there are three for two positions. Give me just one moment here. How I'd like to proceed is uh, we will take a vote on each of those, and we will then, when we've gotten there, we'll get there. All right, the first one is Mr. Coonerty, is that correct? Mm -hmm. This motion, uh, let's, uh, let's move to a vote on that, on that nomination, Mr. Coonerty. Okay, so for Ryan Coonerty, Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Let's move to, is it Ms. Contreras? Is that, um, is that, is that who is mm -hmm. another one that was nominated? Let's move to Ms. Contreras. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? No. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? No. Vice Mayor Golder? And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The vacancies are both filled. We'll move on to the next item, item 32. This is an item regarding the collective results and evidence-based progress report. Ms. Schmidt, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager. I am just here to briefly thank and introduce our colleagues from Santa Cruz County. On the line, we have Randy Morris, the Director of the Human Services Department, and with him is Kimberly Peterson. 
uh, deputy director from HSD as well. And I would like to thank them for their ongoing partnership with CORE and all of their dedication and numerous hours that they invest in this program. So with that, I will hand it over to Randy. Thank you. Um, thank you and nice to meet you, Mayor and council members. It's good to be here again. Um, I have a screen share is my understanding, Bonnie and Laura that I will pull up after some very brief comments. And Mayor, your request for a brief presentation has landed. We will be very quick, we hope, and then turn it back to you for any questions and public comment. Um, first, want to piggyback on Laura's comment. Uh, deep appreciation for particularly Laura has been the one constant throughout the arc of this conversation. I've been here for three years. I know this conversation moving from community programs to core predates me. But there's been a lot of analyst turnover and city manager turnover, but Laura has been our constant. So thank you to Laura. I really want to highlight that. She has been the go-to. And everything we present to the county board, we also present to your city council, and it's lock and step with the city manager's office. So we hope that is representative for the effort to do what CORE is. The letter C in CORE is collective impact. It is only a partnership, at least in funding, between the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz, which brings your one plus million dollars of general fund and our $4.8 million of general fund for just shy of $6 million to really try to fill a hole of many, many millions of dollars. So it's very hard decisions. And what brings us here today is after the uh, recommended awards came to the board and your city council back in June, very controversial, a lot of emotions. Um, there was three times the amount of applications there, then there was money available, a lot of consternation is this is a continuous quality improvement after action review update to the board this morning and to your council about a roadmap for how we would like to apply the lessons learned from lots of stakeholder feedback in advance of the next RFP. So we don't think there's some significant policy questions in front of you today. It's more an update and a request for approval to move forward. Um, I want to put in context and then I'll start the, the slide. Um, as a newer member of this community, I've been in county human services for almost 30 years. I've been working in the health and human service safety net for a very long time in my career, but I'm both humbled by the uh, gift the city council and the county board give to this community that does not exist where I used to work. That is a much larger system, um, but with the gift comes a curse. <laughs> Once you put this money out there, how do you choose to spend it? Very complicated, very controversial. So we are doing our best as staff to help make each chapter of this um, effort improve every step of the way. Um, for some context, this is a very county-centric statement, but um, because county runs health services and human services, and we have a large number of contracts, I wanted to make sure you were aware from the county's almost $5 million investment, we actually have $75 million of contracts with community-based organizations delivering safety net services. And it strikes me as a newer member to this community that this community programs model and the core model that is now in place gets way more than the 7% of the share of safety net contracts <laughs> attention. So it is the one pot of money that you as a council and the board have full control over. Most all of that other 75 million is driven by uh, state and federal regulations. So we appreciate the complexity, but I did want to put in perspective, it is only 7% of the county safety net contracts with CBOs. And if you really look at the entire safety net and you look at health and human services and our contracts, we are $415 million of federal, state and county general fund in your city funds. Uh, investment in the safety net. And so it's really 1% of the entire safety net. So I just want to share that in context that as much attention as this gets, it's well deserved because it's at your discretion, but it is complicated to tease out how much of an impact this is having given all the other funding that's in place from public systems and community contracts. So I hope that context is helpful. It was interesting to me as a newer member of this community. I've been here almost entirely in COVID and I look forward to being in your chambers at some point. Um, but appreciate the uh, accommodation to be remote because we didn't know when uh, we would be up today. So I'm going to do screen share. I'm going to wait for um, confirmation that it is up and then I will start. So if somebody could let me know if the screen is showing the, the PowerPoint. Yes. Did I hear it is up now? Yes, yes it is. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm just looking to, okay. Is it moved to the agenda? The agenda? Yes. Okay. 
So thank you. The agenda for today, I'm gonna cover um, just briefly the recommended actions in front of your council, um, a quick summary of the lessons learned. Um, the materials that are in front of you are a lot more than lessons learned, but that's gonna be our brief focus today. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly, our deputy director to speak about the importance of all the community-based organization voices who participated in this lessons learned process. And we end with some proposed next steps, which is really a roadmap between now and the next procurement. So the recommended actions to summarize are for your council to accept and file the materials that we developed in partnership with your city manager's office that are um, were made public this morning for the county board and for, and for your council. Um, to rec direct your staff to coordinate with us in County Human Services to return to your council no later than December 12th to give a progress report on both the first full year of current funding, because we are only mid-year through the current core contract cycle, but also with an update on the community engagement process that will play out between now and then if your council, as the board this morning, approved the proposed set of um, ne uh, next steps, which is uh, item number three, which is where Kimberly will end the presentation a timeline and next steps roadmap. So this is a very brief summary of a very long document we put together and we try to create executive summaries for the very long documents because we know the volume of materials the public and you as electeds have to read. But it was helpful as we as staff looked at this with your um, city manager's office that the feedback from both elected officials at the city and the county, uh, staff at the city and the county and community-based organizations really cleanly fell into three buckets and it helped us prepare this recommendation by sort of distilling and separating out this, this feedback. Um, bucket one is misunderstandings. There was a lot of feelings about hearing that some organizations that had been funded a long time um, were not awarded. And there was a lot of misunderstandings as we see it from staff and it was verified in most of the stakeholder feedback. So we wanna summarize those. We also um, got a lot of feedback that there were a number of things that worked and they didn't get a lot of public airing because the misunderstandings and feelings about changes in contracts um, sort of dominated the discussion. So we wanted to lift those up to make sure you heard what we heard in the feedback and we keep those things moving forward. And then the last is a number of proposed adjustments that we've received some really good constructive feedback that we think is actionable and part of a continuous quality improvement process we can apply going forward if the board and your council approves ultimately. We're not asking for your council to adopt anything specifically, but just sharing what they are and then we will work with community providers and come back to the board and your council in December with um, some specifics. So this is a quick summary of those three buckets um, of uh, lessons learned feedback. The first is the uh, area of misunderstandings. I want to disclose that I have been in the field, as I said, for almost 30 years, and I've been on every side of an RFP. I've been a panel member, I've been an applicant to federal and state grants and philanthropic grants, I've been the administrator of them 25 years in another jurisdiction. And I have to say this RFP process, um, because of how limited the funds were and how competitive the process was, had to be built upon the procurement process, which was a best application wins process. And that process was clean, fair, objective, and there are lessons learned to seek more direction because lack of any specific direction from uh, your council or our board left it open to go with a best application wins process. So we can apply some concerns that we heard from community and elected to the next process to build some more um, specificity, some direction, some priorities, but absent that the process was best application wins, the process was clean and um, applications were recommended for award based on scoring. The next was services for older adults. There was a lot of concern because of a couple of organizations that provided services for older adults that had been funded for many, many decades were not recommended for award. But the math is that there was actually a 2% increase in the number of awards to CBOs providing services to older adults, some of the contractors changed. It actually went from a 21% share of the money to 23%. And also there were only two contracts that were awarded by board, county board and your city council agreement to remove from the competitive procurement process, both for, for older adult programs. No other population got that benefit. One was the mandatory local government match to pull the uh, Older Americans Act funding to fund our local nonprofit area agency on aging. That was agreed to pull out from competition. And the other was 
the agreement that the Meals on Wheels program is such a priority in this community to expand the number of Meals on Wheels being delivered to vulnerable older adults, that that was carved out from procurement. And the direction was to align the award with whoever the AAA selected, which ended up going to Community Bridges. So both Seniors Council and Community Bridges did not have to compete for those funds. Everybody else had to compete for funds. The third was that there was cuts to the safety net. That was a narrative and a statement made. Just want to confirm there was an actual $500,000 increase in the base of general fund between uh, city and county, which represented an 11% increase in investment in the safety net. And what I think got conflated is there was a agreement by the city council and the board to create a first time ever $750,000 deep investment called targeted impact. That $750,000 grant did pull from the general base, but it was a community informed and elected official agreement um, that I think got conflated a bit because when people saw that award go out, there was comments that that pulled from the safety net. That is a safety net investment. The last is the role of the consultants. We did not have a direction from the board to discuss this. We did have a direction from your council through an action of council member Brown. We responded to that in the materials, but there was questions about whether or not the contract that is um, run by the county, there's no city funds in it. It was a direction from the county board um, right after the first procurement in 2015, 16, I believe, to hire an independent body to run a community engagement process to delink it from us as funder and that contract has been renewed every year in front of the county board and there was a question if they had a role in making any decisions they were firewalled out from any decision making and they ended up helping us as staff both on your side and our side because we all had deep vacancies we we're in the middle of covid and so they helped with us administratively um, and second, it was one of the most highest ranked feedback from community-based organization with an appreciation for the technical assistance they have provided to CBOs applying so that they could be as competitive as possible. So I think there was some confusion about what role the consultants played and we tried to answer the specific direction from your council and the material as your city manager's office submitted. The second area is what worked. This did not get a lot of attention because the areas I just discussed got a lot of the attention. Um, there was consistent feedback, I will say, given how emotional this was and uh, upset a lot of people where it was nice to hear this, that there was appreciation for how much community engagement there was. There was actually five community stakeholder meetings, seven public hearings, <laughs> so 12. I came from a community where there was zero, RFPs were just released. So there's multiple stakeholder opportunities, uh, both public Brown Act hearings and, and uh, CBO stakeholder meetings, and all the CBO said, keep that up, keep that going for the next time that's helpful. Equity is a much longer conversation, but um, we are in a place where equity is an easy, cheap word, but how do you actually turn it into action given this is a safety net investment? Mm -hmm. So we intentionally heard from the community-based organizations that they wanted to be afforded the opportunity to tell us in their application what inequities they see in the community, how they would address those inequities, and then if awarded a contract, build that in their scope of work. So this is the first ever round of what was uh, community programs. The first RFP did not have this built in. This is the first round of contracts where there are equity mentions built into the scope. And when we have the first annual report, we're able to report on those outcomes. So there was a lot of appreciation from the CBOs and the stakeholder. Please keep that going forward. Technical issue, this was the first time we had an online app, uh, electronic application portal. So please keep that. The panel members, and this gets back to the misunderstanding issue, a number of panel members have participated in a lot of panels and gave us consistent feedback. This was the most well-organized. They felt very well-trained and they felt they were able to apply objectivity to their ranking and not impose their personal or subjective bias, which is the goal of a public procurement. So the panel members said, please keep that format in place. And then as I said about the confusion about the role of the um, Tech, uh, TA support, um, the applicants almost unanimously said that was very helpful and they wanted more of it. Here's where the adjustments are and then I'll turn it over to Kimberly to close us out. There was a recognition that all of the emotions around who was not awarded eclipsed all the many organizations who were proud of and excited about and wanted to share publicly their enthusiasm about how they could help community but they did not have a chance to celebrate and they felt very disappointed in that. And so there was a request to make sure we carve out opportunity for recognition of all sides of this going forward. 
deep recognition from us as staff included. This happened in the middle of um, COVID. Omicron variant further complicated and delayed some things. We want to propose the RFP process start much earlier. This will be specified in Kimberly's closeout comments. This is the tough one, council members. You're late in the evening. I really call you to listen to this. This is going to be hard. We have not enough general fund money to distribute through this process, whatever adjustments we make. General agreement amongst all stakeholders, please build in an identification of values and priorities first, and we as staff can build that into the RFP. That will make it easier for all of us when we recommend awards next time, if we have direction from you as a council and the board through a community engagement process, we are gonna have to make some hard choices. And if we don't make them, we will be back to having an open best application wins process, which is okay, but um, then it's about application. So we think there are ways to work on that with elected officials and community. Um, a lot of CBO said, okay, uh, this was a hard process. Can you simplify it? We will work on that. Um, there was some reasonable feedback, I think, from the CBOs that given how much this was built on scoring, they felt there wasn't enough specificity in what we were scoring. That was in large part a byproduct of the rush and the timing and the Omicron variant. We feel we can apply that in a way where we're more clear about what's being ranked and how. Um, and then the last is there was particularly some feedback from South County that there wasn't a feeling the, the panelists were um, shared publicly that we would like to find a way to increase panel diversity. And I think with more time, we can work on that with community to achieve that goal. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Kimberly and she has uh, two slides to close us out. Thank you good very evening. much, sir, for your presentation. Ms. Peterson, good afternoon. Good evening, Randy. Thank you. Good evening. So as Randy described, uh, throughout the core um, process, stakeholder engagement and community feedback has been an integral part of the process, um, supporting collective impact and the centering of equity in um, the core movement and the RFP. Um, and HSD heard many voices um, before, during, and after this um, last RFP was completed. Um, only some of which was heard broadly in the public and summarized here. And um, HSD feels that as our lessons learned, it's important that we do our part to lift up um, all the voices, um, critical and constructive um, that we hear. And so one thing that we were able to do earlier today that I'll, um, I'll do my best to summarize here is we actually um, had a sampling of um, voices from three executive directors um, that participated in the core process. Um, and the executive directors um, spoke in the chambers. Um, they were each dedicated women in their fields. I'll tell you who they are in a moment. Um, and they came with different um, experiences and lenses to the core process. Um, they, and they had different outcomes from the core process. One represented an agency that lost funding compared to prior years. Another represented an agency that gained funding compared to prior years. And another uh, represented an agency that was newly funded. And so the, the, it was three um, women executive directors who spoke. Um, and it was uh, Monica Martinez, um, executive director from Encompass. Uh, Maria Elena de la Garza, Executive Director for Community Action Board, and Keisha Browder, Executive Director for United Way Santa Cruz County. And I will give a couple highlights of what they shared, um, but I wanna strongly encourage you um, to, to take some time um, tonight or tomorrow to look at the video uh, to hear from them directly. Um, so first, uh, Monica Martinez, um, she shared that she was a core steering committee member, a former human services commission member, and had, had been involved in the core process for over a decade. Um, her organization, Encompass, was actually one that had been historically funded through the community programs process, and in fact, received more funding than all the other agencies at that time. Um, though she shared that as a health equity organization, um, they recognized that the, that process that was, was not uh, responsive to emerging needs and did not promote equity and left behind those with the greatest barriers and most in need. 
So they leaned in and participated in the process to make changes to CORE, acknowledging continuous change in how um, public funding and revenue streams evolve and how community needs evolve as well. Um, they did receive um, three gr grants for three new programs and she shared that they found the process um, to be an accountable, inclusive, um, and approach challenging questions with curiosity and an equity center. Um, she also acknowledged a uh, need for improvement um, and gave a couple examples, including um, small programs having a harder time applying um, and so not being as represented in the funding and um, the need to account for some type of disaster response and recovery in the future. Is that something we're unfortunately um, dealing with frequently now? The second person who spoke was Maria Elena um, from the Community Action Board, or CAB for short. Um, she shared that CAB grew through the core process. Um, and she also had been involved in conversations regarding the continued development of core um, the and the centering of equity um, starting five years ago. She shared it was not an easy conversation. It was uncomfortable. Prickly was the word she used to describe it, um, but people kept showing up and moving through the process together. Um, she said that um, through, through CORE, CAV was able to increase work with the immigrant community, um, employment support for those barriers, support rental assistance, transition age youth, um, and youth programs in Davenport and um, the North Coast as well. She also um, highlighted the importance of that technical assistance that even um, with an organization that's 57 years old, um, they found technical assistance um, important. And, um, and then she closed with a very strong message that, um, that we are not done, that we are just getting started in centering equity in core and moving forward. And she said that, um, what she would like to see is how do we ensure accountability for equity and that all touch points along the core process um, ensures equity and that the services ensure equity. And then lastly, um, Keisha Browder with United Way spoke. Um, United Way has been around since 1941. It was their first time applying and winning. And she shared that this should have been something to be greatly celebrated. Um, however, she um, gave a very powerful message about the realities of how the misunderstandings that Randy spoke of uh, translated into very negative, hateful threats on her voicemail, including racially based messages due to the misunderstandings. Um, she said that the celebration of the accomplishment for her staff and for Cradle to Career was taken from them um, and those calls to her were very personal. Um, so overall, at that time, the core um, awards were very overshadowed. Um, no leader should experience what she experienced as a result of core. Um, she wanted to say, of course, we're better than that as a community and as humans. And that um, through the award that they um, won, which was Cradle to Career, it, it was that large impact award Randy mentioned. Um, it gave a chance um, to provide services to, that were previously just in Live Oak um, to grow those services to San Lorenzo Valley and ultimately to serve those from San Lorenzo Valley to the Pajaro Valley. Um, she also noted the value of technical assistance and shared the core as we're going um, allows the, us to think differently and move differently through our, through our community. And again, you know, I can just summarize here, um, but I do encourage you to take a look at that video. Um, the perspectives were insightful and the voice is very powerful. Um, thank you, next slide, please. So, um, so now what you're looking at is a, um, timeline for what we're proposing for next steps. Um, and so what you're looking at is um, what we would like to do um, in taking account those lessons learned mo and moving up when we start the RFP. Um, what you can see is that um, with your 
approval public hearings will be um, community engagement, excuse me, community engagement will start this summer and that will include public hearings. Um, and that would also include conversations about values and priorities. Some of the feedback that we heard last June and during the lessons learned revealed the desire of some um, to prioritize certain services, um, carve outs for various reasons or funding options and naming um, what the values and priorities are of the community and the elected officials in advance will be really um, critical to the design of the next RFP. Um, the RFP itself would be released in the spring um, with applications due in the summer of 2024 um, with a report back to the board on any trends that we see. And then uh, final recommended awards would be made in the winter, uh, fall or winter of 2024, providing a long runway for organizations who are newly funded to prepare and get contracts um, completed. And for those whose funding will not continue um, to um, make adjustments themselves um, for when the new contracts begin. So this uh, concludes our presentation and we are happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm wondering, do we have any questions from council at this time? Andy? Thank you, Vice Mayor Golder. Uh, and thank you uh, to the HSD staff, uh, Mr. Morris and Ms. Peterson for uh, the overview, I heard the extended version earlier today. <laughs> um, so I, uh, um, and I did hear from the, the folks who um, came and spoke, and I, I also recommend, this is kind of commenty, but I'll just say, um, I recommend hearing their voices. Uh, you can, it, it was very moving. Um, and so I, I, I do, I, and I have some comments I'll save, but um, I, I'm, I'm still trying to get an answer to this question that I've been asking um, regarding the, um, the cost of dispersing these funds. Um, we ha so foundations disperse funds to, to nonprofit social service programs, public agencies do this. Um, and, and you do this uh, for a significantly larger number of uh, contracts for, for a lot of these services and some of it overlaps and some of it is new and um, emerging and innovative programs. I love all of that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm still don't have information about the cost of dispersing these funds. What you've said is a relatively small pot, about 7% of the county's uh, social safety net uh, programming budget. Um, no idea how much it's cost to disperse these funds. Um, so I'd really like to get a better understanding of that. May Mayor Keeley and Council Member Brown, would you like us as a matter of process to respond to each council member's questions during this moment? Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay, I, I think <laughs> to be very direct, we charged the city nothing. Uh, the only adjustment we made to the consultant contract was because we were down three analysts and our planning and evaluation director resigned unexpectedly and our deputy director before Kimberly Peterson had retired, a planned retirement. And all of that added up. We made one augmentation to the consultant contract, which costs significantly less than the salary savings of the vacancies, which was used to cover that consultant cost. And at the risk of making this personal, <laughs> You didn't know this, Council Member Brown, but when you made that comment, you were talking to Randy and Kimberly, who carried the water. We met every morning at 5.30 in the morning for six weeks, and every weekend for about six weeks, at least eight hours a day, without complaint, and you didn't have that context, and that is free. Because we are executive hires, we get paid a salary, and we just did that. So back to the misunderstandings, I can appreciate that absent information, everyone's trying to figure out what happened and people who lost money are filling in the blanks and saying, oh my God, all the money went to, there was salary savings and we carried the Waters County without complaint, but I'm being candid now that spring raised up. We can add, talk to you more later if you'd like, but there was no, ex no cost to the city, no extra cost to taxpayers because we just handled this on our backs. Thank you. I, again, I, I just would really love to see some 
data about that. And I understand that you've you've done. I, I'm saving that for my comments. I recognize the work that's gone into this. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to get a handle up with some actual numbers, costs. And I recognize that's not going to happen today, but I'm going to I'm going to keep asking. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Other council members. No other council members. Questions or comments on this item? All right. The recommended. The uh, let me ask if the anyone with us in the public who wishes to make comment in chambers. Anyone online? Ms. Bush, yes. first one online. Good evening. Good evening, Clay Camp, Executive Director, Seniors Council. Uh, thanks for this meeting, and of course, thanks for all the funding that the city provides. Uh, Mayor Keeley, you'll remember that um, there's been a lot of reform in community program funding. There have been multiple cycles. I've been involved with this for four plus decades, and it seems like every five, ten years, there's an effort to improve the system. And I think all of us delivering services want to get better at it. So hopefully we're evolving in a positive way. There are some recommendations that I think we could look at in order to improve where we're at right now. Um, a couple of them uh, county staff have already referred to, but I, I think it's really important that we have a conversation about what are we trying to do with these funds? Are we trying to maintain a social safety net or are we trying to fund new and innovative projects? They both have their value. I have a personal bias in that I think the hardest funds to get are actually to sustain what you're currently doing as opposed to a new project. There's lots of foundations out there to do that. So I would encourage going down the social safety net path. Um, and in that, we should have some priorities about what is that social safety net. Is food and shelter and protection from violence our top priority? I think it should be. I think fun projects like going out on a boat trip or encouraging people to eat vegetables, those are good projects too, but I don't think they're quite as important as something that's life-sustaining. So hopefully we can have some prioritization and some discussion about that. And then another piece of it we should look at is mandated services. What is required by law? And that's a place that as a funder that the seniors council was put in a, a really difficult situation where one of the programs we're mandated to fund was defunded in this process. And we literally had to take caregiver dollars away, respite dollars that people providing 24 seven care desperately need in order to fund a mandated service and stop an agency from literally going under. I also want to encourage that in this reform process, that we keep in mind that ageism is a huge issue in equity and that I have a personal problem when I see 750,000 go to cradle to career and our equity investment specifically excludes older adults. And the irony and contradiction of that effort is just so overwhelming. It's really difficult for me even to speak of. So we need to address that. Um, we also need to just remember that the public process is an important part of this. And you'll remember and others will remember that it was beautiful when we had community programs and services made comments about how much the, the programs so benefited do, them. Do this. Uh, it, take another few seconds to wrap up here. Uh, don't feel cut off right now. Just uh, take a few seconds so and wrap up. Thank you. Um, Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, so that really was my kind of wrap up, is that engaging the community is a really important part of it. And one thing that I think we did do in this last process was look at some new partnerships or new ways to align different programs in the community and see that the community program process and some of these sustainable services and their funding sources align so that we're not butting heads and working against each other's best interests. Thank you for your testimony this evening. Ms. Bush, do we have other folks online? Yes. All right. How, how many more? Um, two. Two more. So let's hear from the first one. Thank you. Good evening. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Allison Guevara. I'm a Santa Cruz resident, mom of three, and social impact consultant. And I'm here tonight in my capacity as co-director for Cradle to Career Santa Cruz County. Um, Port Investments has given Cradle to Career, also known as C2C, the opportunity to engage and uplift diverse families in Santa Cruz and throughout the county in a way that centers their lived experiences and wisdom to guide community transformation. As many of you know and understand very well, Investments in young children and families lead to long-term, lifelong positive health and well-being outcomes for our community. At the heart of this work is an understanding that social connections, belonging, and inclusion are the bedrock of thriving families as a core condition of community well-being and equity. We are working with our school and community partners to create spaces where parents can voice their hopes and dreams for their children and be part of co-developing upstream programming and support systems that truly meet their needs. This includes increasing access to evidence-based services like Triple P Positive Parenting Program, trauma-informed health education, and access to recreational and cultural activities in a way that is customized by and for each unique school community. We're also seeing gradual shifts in how schools are approaching family equity and inclusion as key hubs and touch points to connect with our most vulnerable families, link them with resources, and build community resilience. The core targeted impact funding is also allowing C2C to deepen parent leadership development through our new countywide family learning and leadership circle, where we are building a coalition of family leaders from Santa Cruz in the north to Watsonville in the south to gain advocacy skills and build collective power to advocate for families and children in our schools, government, and health systems. The core process helped reinforce equity, data, and evaluation as central components of our work bringing more capacity and rigor to help us work with school partners to track and monitor equity outcomes and indicators. This is setting up our organization to have more robust technological tools and data systems to understand our reach, identify gaps, and pave, the way, pave new ways of data sharing between partners. C2C is grateful for your foresight and leadership to design a process that is allowing our community to invest in strategic collective impact strategies that address the root causes of inequity. So thank you again for your continued support and for this game-changing opportunity to keep our community moving forward through the core movement. Thank you very much for your testimony. We have another person online, correct, Ms. Bush? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Martha Seha, and I am the Santa Cruz City Schools Community Organizer for Cradle to Career. Core funding has enabled C2C to expand its innovative model of systems change to reconfigure how decisions are made by putting community voice at the center. This opportunity to do things differently is a chance to uplift equity and move upstream to create lasting positive change. To support the health and well being of our community, parent input must be included how systems are set up in order to serve their dreams and needs. Through the support of CORE, C2C will bring greater diversity of voices into schools, the creation of local programs, and even policy priorities. In a recent advocacy workshop we hosted, we asked parents what their vision of a resilient community was. Parents shared the values of love, peace, unity, gratitude, connection, and empathy, where families feel connected to their community, their schools, resources and support, and to one another. This is what thriving families look like, and this is our vision of what we hope to achieve through this grant. We are excited to continue to pave new pathways, uplift equity, engage the community, and build countywide connections with the support of CORE. At Santa Cruz City Schools, we have begun to provide parent leadership committee meetings and computer literacy workshops to uplift parent voices, unite parents, and teach them how to advocate for their families in person and virtually. One of the parents we work with stated, I have only known about C2C for a few months, but already feel immensely supported and connected to my community. I'm starting to learn about what resources are available to me and how to access them. Thank you for this game-changing opportunity to unite and transform our community through core investments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, that is the last person online. That's all I have, yes. One last call for anyone here in chambers who wish to comment on this item. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. Councilmember Kalantar Johnson is recognized, is recognized rather. I'll um, move. 
the staff um, recommendation to accept Santa Cruz County's Human Services Department four or five year look back lessons learned 2022 mid-year assessment and alternative funding source summary update and direct staff, do you want me to read it all? If you will. Okay. <laughs> uh, direct staff to coordinate with HSD to return on or before December 12th, 2023 with a progress report of the FY22-23 annual summary of core investments, funded programs with an update on community engagement, and three, approve the proposed timeline, next steps for the RFP process. And I, I do have some comments. Motion and I a will second, second by Council Member Bruner. On your motion. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Randy, Kimberly, your entire team, and, and everyone who put so much work into the work last year and, and in this past year and, and gathering what you did and bringing it before us and um, articulating those three pieces, the misunderstandings, um, the, the moving forward, those three pieces so well. So just thank you for your work. Um, I also want to acknowledge and appreciate the work that you did with organizations after orgs found out that they were not recommended for funding. Um, I know that was that was uh, council direction, but what I've heard is that that process was really smooth and and the community appreciated it. So thank you for all your efforts. Um, I, I did want to um, I wanted to speak to what Mr. Kemp said earlier, and and I take issue with. Um, raising the ageism, uh, young children literally don't have a voice. They don't have a vote. And um, I would hope, if this hasn't happened already, that um, all organizations, nonprofits, go in and listen to those videos and listen to the sentiments, because we're pre perpetuating that again. We're perpetuating this um, us versus them and this competitive nature that doesn't get us anywhere. Seniors are important, so are young people. Safety net um, resources and organizations providing safety net resources are important, so are innovative uh, or, uh, organizations providing innovative solutions. If we only do one thing, it's a partial response and we'll never see outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us as a community to think about the full spectrum response that we need. We need direct services. We need organizations that do systems and culture change, which is what C2C is trying to do. And we need to have it be value-based. Now, we don't have all the money in the world. So yes, we do need to make some hard choices. Um, but I really want to invite everyone in the nonprofit world, it's already hard out there. I mean, I've been in that world, to not pit, pit ourselves against each other and to not use that language with each other. Um, and, and I will just share as a grant writer, um, these innovative solutions and projects start locally. Yes, there are foundations out there. There's federal grants, state grants. There are those resources for safety net uh, organizations as well. And foundations want to see that we're seeding some of that here. So I am really proud to be supporting programs and organizations such as CDC and others um, because then we're showing the rest of the funders out there, state, federal, foundation, corporations, that we're invested, we care about the whole spectrum of our population and the whole spectrum of the types of responses it takes to move the needle on some of these challenging issues. So um, just thank you to all the organizations that are the boots on the ground, that do the work. Um, it's, it's really, really tough, and there isn't enough money out in the world um, to compensate the great work that you do, but we'll keep, we'll keep chipping away. We'll contribute as a city as much as we can and just appreciate all the work that everyone's put into it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, I do have just a few comments that I'd, I'd like to make about this process. I've made many, many comments, uh, many very specific uh, over the time that I've been involved in core as a city council member. Um, wow. and, but I, before I do, I just want to just respond, I think, to um, council member Calendari Johnson raised some, some really important points. Mm -hmm. And I so I want to um, kind of just <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, and I also want to um, acknowledge that, you know, the I guess more acknowledge more fully that the, the 
the process, whatever process we have, is going to have some competition built into it if we do not work to expand this pot. Well, really, even if we do, um, because we know the need is limitless, um, and the you know the the capacity of public agencies to support this programming is is limited. Um, but um, we are. I mean, there is that. Um, that that's built into the process, and so I, I don't want to, um, you know, I, I don't want to blame agencies for their reactions to what was really challenging um, for them, those who who did lose funding, um, because it's not like they're not providing really critical services too, and so I, I guess I just wanted to say that um, and and acknowledge that we're going to have disappointments and we're going to have competition, and we all should be. Um, invested in trying to expand that pie through whatever resources we can, um, you know, mm -hmm. bring together. Um, <clears throat> I want to appreciate the efforts of HSD to manage this process, um, the count, uh, County um, <laughs> Human Services Department. Uh, it's been a tremendous amount of work. I, I know you have really put your heart and soul into it, and so I, I don't want to, um, I don't want my critique to sound like I am um, critical of your efforts and your intentions in any way. Um, I just want to highlight um, some of the, the, the challenges that I see. And um, so, and I recognize, you know, you inherited the process. I just, I'll say that too. Um, it's not that I want to just rep this process or dismantle it, but I do think that um, we, sh there are um, lessons learned that we ought to be, um, mm, acknowledging more fully in this process. Um, the report itself uh, is, is very um, positive, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, and it also, um, I, you know, I, and I, I, again, I say this with really with all due respect, it doesn't tell me much about um, how the, the change process has, um, you know, helped us to achieve these goals. And I know it's early, um, but for example, hearing from some of the programs really provided some substance to, um, you know, this, this question about well, what are they doing with the money and, you know, what does equity mean? Um, equity, is, you, you acknowledged it's used here. It can become a catch-all term and with different definitions. Um, so, um, but in terms of the actions we take to promote equity, I want to be clear that um, you know, we're, we're taking all of that into account. Um, and, you know, I, um, I gave a lot of feedback. I said I was initially very excited about this report, um, and I'm, I'm glad to see it. Um, but I am also disappointed um, because it doesn't really help me understand how CORE has improved the process of, you know, providing services to meet the needs in our community. I want to know that. Uh, and I hope that the next report that comes uh, will will help fill that in for us. Um, and and I, I do, it doesn't help me understand um, who wh who's being served and and how that's different from uh, the previous process. So um, there's a lot of claims about um, you know progress made and and equity being achieved, and I, I just can't get my really understand. Um, through the, the data that's here, um, what uh, the limited data, what that means. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm still um, uh, going to be a, a voice of, you know, of critique here, and I'm, it may sound curmudgeonly. Um, I, I <laughs> uh, but I do, I also want to say that I, I, and this is not to anyone in particular, but I, I do feel uh, a bit resentful of the framing of those of us who have been making these critiques um, you know, some were like in the Stone Age or something. We want to go back to some Stone Age um, where, uh, you know, the, the bad old days of funding distribution where it was locked in. Um, that is not what, I, I mean, I've never said that. I would never say that. What I'm saying is um, let's figure out how to um, make this process more transparent, um, more accessible to um, and and to help people understand um, what the consequences are of the decisions that are being made, funding-wise, who's lost funding? What does that mean for our community? What services have we lost, um, and what services has we have we gained? I want to see that. Um, so I hope that that will come in uh, in future updates. I'll leave it there. Thank you.
Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bruner. I see Randy Morris's hand raised, and I don't know if it's in response. Sorry. I see a hand raised, Randy Morris, and I don't know if he's responding to um, any of the Correct. comments, but um, okay, well, the, I will continue. Us, yes. So whichever yes. comments you wish to make. I just wanted to um, thank Kimberly and Randy for your time today for providing um, this information thus far in this process and the reflections um, and the, the information learned through this process. And I see it as an ongoing. And I really look forward to identifying, um, I think one of the proposed adjustments was to identify values and priorities prior to the next RFP. And I think um, as a city council body and our members of the, the public in the city, community engagement, we can really um, work on that agreement and alignment and understanding um, prior. And I see that as a very, um, clear proposed adjustment. So overall, thank you very much for um, this reflection and this report and um, proposals to go forward and continue this process the best way we can. Thank you, council member. Further questions or comments? Very briefly, hopefully briefly. Uh, this is always difficult. I understand that. I went through the first process, my first time through the process of allocating county dollars at that time. I was a staffer at the Board of Supervisors, and I remember the process at that time was just awful. Uh, it was an endless parade of nonprofits and very, very needy and convincing people parading in front of the Board of Supervisors with the Board of Supervisors having no standards, no anything, and mostly making people very disappointed and unhappy. Then in came a new CAO. New County Administrative Officer comes in. At that point, I had hornswoggled the people of the 5th District into electing me supervisor, and I, I saw another process. And I thought the new CAO at that time, Susan Moriello, actually tried to make good sense out of this. She said, let's have the family, and by that she meant the applicants, let's have them find a way to make peace in the family. Let's have them have conversations with themselves, conversations with people in the county and so on. And that made the process a whole lot better, a lot better. Uh, I think that this core process has an element to it that I've not seen in any other similar process, and that is that willingness to examine and make a self-reflection on the process in real time. I think that that shows a kind of openness and courage and willingness to reflect upon the shortcomings within the system, and I think that that's, that's very, very helpful to what is as I want to associate myself with the comments of Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, who made, I think, one of the best public comments and observations uh, I've heard in a long time when she made her statements a few minutes ago on this. And I, I think they're very thoughtful and, and they're right. Uh, thank you to you, Mr. Morse, and Ms. Peterson and the others involved and our county staff who are sitting in, in the chambers here this evening. Thank you very, very much for your very fine work on this. I think that this kind of self-examination makes the progress, the process rather, better every single year. Now, next year is going to be better than this year. This year is way better than last year. So thank you for that willingness to self-examine the process in what will always be, as the member mentioned earlier, uh, a process where the need is always greater than the, than the resources we can we can allocate towards it. So doing it right, knowing what we're managing towards, knowing what outcomes we're looking for, 
is 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 a, so critical to this process. But thank you to all of you who've been involved in it and done such fine work. And the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom, aye. Brown, no. Watkins, aye. Bruner, aye. Kalantari Johnson, aye. Vice Mayor Golder, aye. Mayor Keeley, aye. Motion passes and so ordered. I believe that what we will do at this time is take a recess for a bite to eat and we will return. It's now, let's call this a quarter to seven. Let's come back at 7.30. So we have 45 minutes for this break and we'll come back then. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. We stand in recess until 7.30.
haven't finished with it. Oh, really? I haven't, I'm not, that's my red wash card. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> After an evening recess, the Santa Cruz City Council is back in session for our April 25th, 2023 council meeting. We will move to oral communications at this point. This will be the opportunity for anyone who is with us this evening in chambers to address us on any matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. We will, I'll acknowledge the gentleman here, and then do we have anyone online? At, we have two right We now. have two folks, so sir, good evening. Hi. Hi. Yeah, there, okay, a few people following me on uh, the uh, Zoom uh, uh, version of the meetings. I, I find it kind of limiting and kind of uh, a little bit strange to use the Zoom uh, to, to uh, make comments, uh, just personal comments. Anyhow, sometimes uh, taking a step forward with technology, uh, there you, know, you take certain steps back. Uh, Brad Snyder, uh, recovering alcohol. No, uh, wrong meeting. Uh, sorry. Let's see. Um, there are two real sensitive spots in the city um, that uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, and there's limited access to these two spots. And um, I mean, I really think I don't know. People should maybe maybe you know base these these particular issues. Uh, one is at the uh, intersection. A lot of people feel really strongly about this. One way or the other, they want to, well, they want to defer, they want to punt on the issue. They don't want to talk about it, or they really care strongly about it. It's uh, at uh, Lincoln and Pacific. Uh, there's there's a little courtyard that used to be the purview of the two TS that served food and the uh, New Leaf. The other uh, place that I want to talk about that's kind of near and dear to the hearts of uh, People who, you know, long time uh, residents of, you know, like grew up, you know, uh, with access to this point, this spot is the uh, sandstone promontory uh, on the uh, right hand side of uh, the river mouth, the San Bernardino River mouth. So I have 38 seconds to kind of sum up my thoughts. Um, I don't know. I feel like where you're limited to by the fencing, you just uh, presumed you're not supposed to go there, uh, could be extended. And I feel a lot of locals will be really, really excited to see that happen. Another thing is that uh, that steel fencing, I, I presume it's a uh, ferrous material that's uh, in front of uh, Lincoln, and that, that could be repurposed. That's 45 uh, feet of steel fence. It's very ornate, it's very nice. You could extend uh, tw 20 feet from where it currently is with that fence. There is, uh, uh, there are rather two people online. Let's take the first one. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett again. Hey, on April 18th, the first of its kind, Berkeley natural gas ban on hookups was overturned by the Federal Ninth Circuit Appeals Court on the grounds it cannot supersede federal authority. While it only struck down the Berkeley law and is uncertain how sweeping that is, I fail to see how our ordinance is all that different or why it would fare any better under a challenge. I think it would be prudent to suspend our natural gas ban prohibition ordinance in new construction here, pending any further appeals and to avoid litigation. <clears throat> this is a great opportunity for a lesson learned not to blindly follow the leftist home office in Berkeley. When anyone loses in court, it usually means they were wrong. I think the timing of your ban was far prematurely too long anyway by many years, maybe decades. You blew through asking for public comment so fast on item 29 parking rates, I was unable to comment, so I'll only make a generalized comment now. Assuming all expenses are related, it is appropriate to establish enterprise reserve fund operating balances or, or rebuild reserve fund balances or create yearly balance uh, watch targets for enterprise funds. The extra balances of these funds smooth out your year imbalances, but it should be two-sided, meaning fee rates should be adjusted up when the trend is that the reserves are always going down nearing zero, but also a high limit established that fee rates need reducing if the year-over-year -year trend is always going up, which is a sure sign you are indeed overcharging. The projections after the parking fee increases for parking fund balances as presented last meeting only went one way rapidly up year after year with no terminus 
indicating you do intend to very much milk the public like a fat cash cow with parking fees. And I fear when large fund imbalance, balances like that are laying around, the money gets inappropriately used for unrelated expenses. Consider two sides, two sided watch targets and uh, create such for enterprise reserve funds. Thanks. We have a second person online, I believe. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Keeley and Council. This is Eric Rodberg. I wanted to follow up with Council on a comment I made several weeks ago uh, regarding the temporary diesel generators at the wastewater treatment facility. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for directing staff to answer my questions. I know they were detailed, and I had a lot of back and forth with Katie Stewart, who you heard from earlier tonight. Um, and I appreciate that and the graciousness uh, with which she handled my detailed questions. I thought I should let Council know uh, how this all works. <clears throat> the two diesel generators together produce up to five megawatts of power. The, that is the peak demand at peak flow times for the wastewater treatment facility. The wastewater treatment facility also has a 1.3 megawatt uh, co-generator that runs primarily off of the wastewater, the methane from the wastewater, but it's also supplemented by natural gas from pg and &E, and I believe you also had an item to supplement the um, funds used to pay for the natural gas. So um, primarily the, uh, the diesel generators, they weren't run to capacity. Mostly it was run off the 1.3 megawatt uh, co-generator, which is appropriate. The reason I bring all this up is I think it's really, it, it goes to Garrett's first comment. Um, we need to be really aware of our, our needs, <laughs> and we're not ready to go completely electric and get rid of all natural gas. This, In this case, the wastewater treatment facility was running off of natural gas, both produced from the methane from the wastewater and supplemented by PG&E and diesel generators. So while I, I think that electrification is great, I'm right now in a Chevy Bolt talking to you, <laughs> I'm parked. But, um, and, and so I'm not a climate denier, but we really need to be fully, we need to look at this in a more holistic way. And I, I really encourage council to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else? We're good. This last call for oral communication. Seeing here none. We will move forward on to item 36 on our agenda this evening. This is draft of the sixth cycle housing element update and review for state submittal. Mr. Butler and Mr. Benoit, no? Who have we got? Yes, we do. Good evening to both of you. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Keeley and council members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city, and um, with me is Principal Planner Matt Benoit. We also have some of our consultants available in the audience and also on our Zoom meeting. And um, I'll kick it off very briefly before handing it over to Matt. Um, we're excited to present this uh, draft housing element to you all this evening. Um, I wanna start by thanking the community members that have participated thus far. We've had a lot of um, engagement activities and opportunities through workshops and um, online comments that have been received. And um, I also want to thank the City Council Subcommittee um, that consists of Mayor Keeley and Councilmember Newsom and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Um, they've put in a lot of effort in also improving this document. Um, it is an iterative process, and um, we've had a great consultant team working on it, as well as a, a great uh, amount of staff work that has gone into this document. Um, we have a better document as a result of all of that input. And so I just wanted to express my appreciation there. Um, we, as you all know, um, achieved our fifth cycle RENA housing targets. That's the regional housing needs uh, allocation targets um, as of a few weeks ago in every income category. And that's, that's quite an achievement that puts us in the top 6% um, in the state in meeting that fifth uh, cycle. Um, we also um, are looking forward now to um, hopefully being in the same position eight years from now 
um, which is a, a, a heavier lift, a bigger task, because the numbers that we have in our next cycle that Matt will be talking to you about momentarily are five times what we have in our current cycle. And um, we've been um, increasing the, the rate of development recently, and in large part, um, the, the state laws um, have, have been facilitating housing production. And that's helped us to achieve the uh, arena targets for this cycle. Um, and with that increased production, um, we recently met the targets, but um, <clears throat> we're going to have to increase that pace of development by about two times as much, a little over two times as much in order to meet that. So even the targets are five times um, where um, we are for this cycle, and the pace of development will need to essentially double in order for us to be in the same position eight years. Um, so a lot of work ahead, but a lot of work that we've been putting into this with our consultants and with the community to set us up to be in position to partner with our economic development and housing department, who produces a, a, a lot of affordable housing on behalf of the city and our residents, as well as uh, partnering with the development community to make these projects happen. With that, I'll turn it over to Matt Van Waugh. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mr. Van Waugh. Matthew Benoit here, principal planner. Thank you, Lee. Uh, so I'm here tonight to present the, the housing element. And online, we also have Inez Gilmesh from Kimley Horn, who's our, our lead consultant on this, as well as uh, Bill Wiseman um, in the stands here. And it uh, should be noted again that you know this housing element especially is, is much more complex than previous ones. And we're really fortunate to have a consultant team that's worked on a lot of other housing elements in the state. Um, and so that, that's been very helpful going forward in this process. So they're here to answer any questions as well that I can. So just the agenda tonight, uh, housing element background and Matt, sections. Sorry to, sorry to pause, yeah, you guys are not yet sharing screen. This is why it's city clerk month. <laughs> clerk year. Year, year, right. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bush. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So for the agenda tonight, we have the housing element background and sections, uh, the candidate site strategy, housing goals, community engagement efforts to date, and then next steps. And so just briefly, what is the housing element? It's really mainly the re a required chapter of the city's general plan that identifies projected housing needs by income category and also provides goals, policies, and programs and objectives to address those current needs and guide future growth as well uh, for all income levels. And then also requires certification by the Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, they'll often refer to uh, with the state to gain compliance with, with those state housing element laws. And again, that's something that's, there's a lot more attention being placed on this housing element cycle than previous ones by HCD in that certification process. So housing element sections, we have an introduction, and then uh, one of the larger sections is our policy plan, and then there's many appendices, and that's community engagement, review of past performance, housing needs assessment, fair housing assessment, housing constraints, housing resources, and then another large section is our housing sites inventory. And then finally, our glossary. Um, and I'll, I'll start with our housing sites inventory. This is the, the section of the housing element where we're taking that arena that Lee mentioned, the regional housing needs allocation that we get from the state and from our from the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, AMBEG. We get a, we get a target number for each of these income levels uh, as part of this arena. And the housing element, each eight years, we have to show the state there's capacity within the city to, to meet that to meet the, that number of units as our arena target. Uh, it's not necessarily that those will get built, but just that we have the capacity to do that. So there's kind of two different elements to this. So one is this housing element, the housing sites inventory, which is this paper exercise showing that we have the capacity. And then there's every single year we're reporting units to the state that count towards that arena calculation uh, in, in us meeting our arena. And so, just briefly, Lee touched on this again. This is our fifth cycle arena, our current one that we're in. 
And uh, as you can see, we've now hit all of our uh, arena targets for that cycle. Quite a, quite a bit over in terms of a low income, especially. But as Lee also mentioned, that number increases substantially in this next cycle uh, by almost fivefold to 3,736 units. So really, again, like I mentioned, you know, where, where can those 3,700 you know, 3, units go in the city? So that's where our sites, our candidate sites requirements and sites inventory strategy comes into play. And uh, so we're looking at sites that can accommodate the city's arena. And then the state's also looking for sites that are located by community resources and transportation, have access to utilities, things like that. And then there's also a new component to the housing element this year, which is affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH, as you'll often see. And uh, that's where the state is looking at uh, more equity in where housing is placed. So they're looking at some dispersion of units to allow for some amount of housing in higher resource areas. So site, so housing isn't just in one specific part of a city, but uh, can, be, can be dispersed to give people more opportunities in, in these higher, higher resource areas of a city. And so those candidate site strategies, uh, there's, they're, they're, they can really be broken down into four pieces. And the first one is a big one, that's the pipeline projects. Those are projects that have already been submitted to planning or have been entitled by, by this council. And uh, there, there's a little more, uh, uh, they're a little more definitive. And HCD appreciates seeing these in our account because it, it shows that there is development interest on these sites. And uh, there's, more, there's a little more guarantee that there will be units built. So we count those. And then we also have uh, projected ADUs, uh, vacant residential sites. And then another large one is infill opportunity areas. And so these three areas are areas where we use more of a projection to show, based on past history, how many units might be built on these sites that we've included in the site's inventory. And, and those four are added up essentially to show the state that we have this capacity. And so again, just briefly, the, the infill opportunity areas to break those down further are, are downtown areas, including that expansion area, and then our corridors, uh, churches and other sites, and uh, churches, I'll, I'll just touch on briefly, we included that in there um, because there has been recent state legislation that has made it a lot easier to develop housing, especially 100% affordable housing uh, on church sites and on church parking lots. Uh, and we do expect to see more of that development, including the, the, the Cedar Project downtown right now has, it has utilized some of those uh, the state, uh, state allowances. So we do expect to see some more of that. So we have included some church sites in the inventory as well. And then all those are broken down into the number of units between our project, between the pipeline projects that have you know, a, a discrete number of units attached to them based on what they've applied for, and then these projections. And this is a slightly different uh, table than what was in the, the public review draft. It's been organized a little bit differently. So if you're, if you're, if you previously looked at the public uh, review draft that was, uh, um, that was available about a month ago now, uh, this table breaks it down slightly differently, but the numbers are are very similar in how we've done that. This this now we've taken just the pipeline projects, and then everything else below in the in terms of those projections. So some other key differences from that public review draft were some sites that we've removed and then also sites that we've changed as well. And I'll just touch on those briefly. Uh, again, that it changes our numbers slightly. Uh, the golf club, golf club drive sites, those were sites uh, that are in our general plan uh, that uh, require an area plan to be, to be part of them for, to develop this area. And we, we really found that because of this area plan requirement in our general plan, there was there was some uncertainty in, in, as to whether this, these sites would actually develop over the next eight years. Uh, and, it, and it made sense at this time to take them out based on those requirements. Uh, there is a great opportunity for, for a, a good housing project on this site, uh, but it's just not something we wanted to include in the, the housing element sites inventory at this time. And, and again, I'll mention too that these, these sites were also uh, I should add that we have a council subcommittee on the housing element. We've met with them 
and talk through these sites as well. And these were also recommended to, to be removed through that subcommittee as well. Um, a couple others there are the County of Santa Cruz site, uh, another great opportunity and something that the county has mentioned, or there have been discussions in the past between the county and the city on doing housing project on this site. Uh, but again, it's something that there is a lot of uncertainty whether that's actually gonna happen in the next eight years. And uh, we chose to take it out for that reason. And then uh, finally, Antonelli Pond site on this slide. There, there's a, a few concerns over this one. Uh, one being uh, Coastal Commission has raised concerns about development on this site. And then there's also sensitive species on this site as well. So there's a likely a more lengthy uh, environmental process. And, uh, again, you know, a little more uncertainty in terms of the development. So those three sites, uh, which, are, which are larger sites that did have a lot of units attributed to them in that draft, uh, draft uh, review, or draft a update were, were removed. So that did change the unit count a little bit. And then finally, this, this again was a discussion we had with the subcommittee. And this was uh, uh, removing the existing library site as a housing site and instead adding lot seven, the city's lot seven. Uh, so we swapped those two city properties essentially. And again, that had to do with uh, you know what what was deemed most uh, most ideal to include in the plan as far as these downtown city properties go that have the development potential. And so with, with those changes, uh, you can see that the numbers did change a little bit from the public review draft to uh, the updated total. Um, they decreased just slightly, except for the, the very low or low that increased just slightly based on those changes. And there's one other, uh, there's a few other, uh, few other changes that we're considering that aren't yet in these numbers that you see before you right now. Uh, a big one is the, the downtown plan expansion in the, in the draft, we, uh, the public review draft, we had talked about the downtown plan expansion as a rezoning project. We chose to remove the rezoning component of, of that just for the housing element itself just because there's that additional uncertainty about the rezoning process and how many units we, we end up with, things like that, um, and what that rezoning looks like. It was much cleaner to just have no rezonings in our, in our housing element for HCD's review. Um, and so we, we removed the rezoning discussion and we went with a base capacity of units in that downtown plan expansion area. And uh, that, uh, that was a, that number was also revised since the numbers that were in the council packet. Uh, there was actually one mistake in that base capacity uh, uh, calculation. So it's about 100 units less than that 1,145 units that's in the, the council packet before you. So that, that's one change. There's a few other changes too that you know, we've had a, a really engaged uh, public that have submitted a lot of comments and looked very closely at this, which is wonderful because they're catching stuff that that we didn't in this first draft. Uh, you know, some of those are like our you know our pipeline project affordability edits. Uh, for instance, 190 Westcliff, the project in here uh, that was fairly recently approved. It had a the project description was correct in our site's inventory, but the units were attributed in the wrong category. So it was a, it's an 89 unit project, and our our table had eight, those, all those 89 units all in low income when there's actually only 10 units in low income. So that, that's one big change that hasn't been reflected yet. There's, there's gonna be an you know, instance or two like that as we go through this to finalize everything before HCD submittal. So just note that there are changes like that still coming, uh, as well as pipeline projects. We've heard from the community, you know, double check all your pipeline projects, make sure they're you know, still actually moving forward, they're active. Um, and there's a few that we've caught that you know, we realized you know, this really hasn't done anything for years or it's expired you know, and shouldn't really be on our pipeline project list anymore. Um, and so that for instance, five, 525 Ocean Street, there's 56 units of low income attributed to that in our site's inventory that will also be taken off. So there are still changes like that that we're, we're doing. One final bigger piece that we've talked to the subcommittee about are, and, and this is briefly alluded to in the, the staff report to council, is that 
Sites that are included in a housing element sites inventory uh, two straight time or two times in general, if they're in two housing elements, it automatically triggers a ministerial approval process for that site. Uh, and what that means is uh, if, the, if this site has been in two housing elements, uh, if, it, if their project comes in and meets all the objective standards, it would only need a building permit to be constructed, uh, including no environmental, uh, the, the California Environmental uh, Quality Act, CEQA process. Um, so we look through our site's inventory. There's currently four sites that have been included in previous, uh, previous uh, housing elements that would qualify for this ministerial process. And the subcommittee recommended that we remove those sites uh, from, from this to not trigger that ministerial process. Another thing too is just to consider that uh, there's a number of sites in our site's inventory that only have above moderate market rate housing assigned to them based on their size. The HCD requires, typically requires sites of a certain size to allow affordable housing to be attributed to them in the site's inventory. And there's a number of smaller sites that only have above moderate income uh, assigned to them in the site's inventory. And as you saw in the previous tables, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of above moderate income housing percentage. So that, that some of those sites could be removed so that they could be in a future housing element and not trigger a ministerial process in the next housing element, for instance, without really hurting our, you know, the buffer and the percentage that we have of those above moderate sites. So those are some key changes to, uh, to consider going forward. I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about the policy plan chapter really briefly. Um, we have, it's broken down by seven goals and then there's policies under those goals and then uh, objectives under those policies that are more, uh, that have more uh, discrete tasks assigned to them to meet those policies and objectives. Really quickly, goal one, housing production. Goal two, affordable housing. Goal three, special needs housing and homelessness. Goal four, housing assistance. Goal five, neighborhood vitality. Goal six, affirmatively furthering fair housing. That, that's its own separate chapter in this, and uh, our own separate goal in this. And then goal seven is uh, resource conservation and environmental stewardship. And so I just wanna to touch upon a few uh, policy objectives that uh, were added also since that public review draft was completed. And these, these have also been uh, reviewed by the, by the subcommittee. Um, so we have in here uh, a more streamlined process for, pro for uh, specific projects that have actually been approved already. Their building plans have already been approved on another site. Um, so essentially a pre-approved plans. Uh, so if someone submits the same plan, that there's a streamlined process for that because it's, it's already largely been approved on another site. Uh, another one is working with partner agencies to, to advocate for uh, homelessness response services. Uh, within the county, but outside the city's jurisdiction. Get other jurisdictions in this area to do, be doing their uh, fair share of the homelessness services. And then uh, establish a program that promotes rental protections uh, that are in effect and, uh, and utilizes a variety of our communication means that we have to actually get this information across better to people of those rental protections. Um, and then another one, I think this is the last one, that uh, uh, we're currently applying for an AARP, age-friendly community designation. And we wanted to memorialize that in our housing element as well. It's kind of a, if we get that designation, it um, just opens us up to a community of, of these age-friendly communities. There's benefits to that. Finally, there's a few additional policy uh, objective recommendations that we're considering based on what we heard from the Planning Commission and the comments at the Planning Commission. And that is uh, additional discussion on extremely low income units. Our policies currently have a discussion on uh, uh, supportive housing, which is an extremely low income unit, uh, but we don't talk specifically about extremely low, low income, which is 30% or less AMI. Uh, and that is something that the state is 
is looking for us to report on the, in the future. So it is, uh, it is, it is an area we want to just uh, specifically touch on in the policies. And then also uh, consider refinements to housing preservation and renter protection and displacement policies. This was something we heard a lot at the Planning Commission, uh, both by the commissioners and the commenters. And this is really just saying we want to look more closely at, at our policies over the next couple of weeks before we submit to HCD and really make sure those are refined and you know, have best practices included in them uh, to, to best meet those, those goals here. Community engagement efforts to date. Just very briefly, we had workshop, survey last year, tabling events at uh, uh, beach flats and lower ocean neighborhoods, uh, stakeholder meetings. We had our uh, city, the, the subcommittee meetings that have been uh, uh, around monthly uh, since since uh, early this year. Uh, public review draft release. So we had that review uh, period for a month. Our community workshop a couple weeks ago, planning commission, and now tonight. And again, just that public review draft was available for one month uh, for comments and questions. And we're, we're taking comments and feedback on this, on the housing element at any time, but specifically comments received during this public review draft period will actually go into our submittal to HCD. We do have to show the state how we're, how we're addressing and considering those comments. And so just really briefly, a summary of that community feedback facilitate more affordable housing, uh, consider the impacts of water traffic, or consider impacts on water traffic parks and parking, uh, seek uh, state and federal funding to assist affordable housing and homelessness, um, consider design and bulk of potential developments, uh, plan to exceed arena for the lower and moderate income units uh, as in the uh, higher buffer and then uh, recommendations to support mobile homes, uh, especially for seniors, uh, consider the effects on short of short-term rentals and vacation homes, uh, upzone single-family zones to allow multifamily development in them, maintain existing city character, and consider flood, flooding and wildfire risk uh, for new development. That's just a flavor of some of the comments we've received so far. And we're, we're at our tentative project schedule here. We have our meeting tonight, and then our HCD submittal will be a couple weeks from now, uh, the second week of May, most likely. And that's followed by a 90 day HCD review. And we will then address those HCD comments towards the end of summer and start the process again with another HCD review. And, uh, and at, the, at, at that time, when we're getting together that next HCD review, too, that'll be another. A touch point with the community as well to address the HCD's comments and comments we've received over the summer on this too. Um, and then finally, uh, there would be a second submittal to HCD and then, and then going back to Planning Commission and City Council by December of this year. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you both, and thank you for all the people in the planning department. I know that you sit in the seats here, and there's a lot of other folks involved in this. And thank you, thank you very, very much for for this. We are under certainly new set of of uh, state laws, and, and uh, have not been through this process under this set of state laws. And and thank you for all the fine work that you've been doing on that. Let me uh, ask council members if they have questions or comments. Ms. Brown. I have, I have a lot. So. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll do it. Um, I'm going to try to move through, through these quickly. Um, and I, first, I just want to say thank you for the um, very clear overview of a lot of information uh, that I know has taken a lot of work to bring together. And I want to thank my colleagues uh, for being a part of that process through the subcommittee. Um, I do have some questions that I am hoping to try to get um, answered some of them are clarifying questions and then others are more about the possibilities for including a potentially ad additional uh, specific uh, elements in in the draft housing element so um, the so first um, I page six of the staff report 
um, discusses the a possible outcome of being included in this the inventory. Which, so we're talking about the inventory here. If a developed site hasn't been included for two consecutive housing elements um, and is not redeveloped, that a new proposal may use a ministerial process. So I and and I appreciate you pointing this out for us. Um, I did just want to check though because the government code that cited I couldn't find that language in there and so I'm just wondering I just want to make sure I'm clear about where it is it's I'm a policy nerd and I talk with policy nerds and we're, we're just trying to make sure we are clear um, so the so that's one and and I'll just I've got a few more um, and then and I know I've I think we've heard this before but I, I just would love to know where in the state law the restriction is that we can't use student dormitory units to meet, help meet our arena it just feels very. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't feel right, <laughs> um, given that uh, you know we're we're looking at building projects that are um, you know essentially going to be not student dorms but essentially meet the same need, and those count, but the the others don't. And so I just wanted to ask about that as well. Um, and then I have three more that are just clarifying. Um, the so the the staff report also um, talks about realistic capacity, um, uh, the the need to project the number of units that could be produced on the element and using this idea of realistic capacity. And I'm just wondering where that's like how, how we come to understand that that's what we need to do. I, I I believe it, and I'm glad we're doing it. But I'm just wondering how that works. And then, and that's sort of a bigger question. So, if it, it may be um, not appropriate to go through all of that here, I don't want to take up a whole bunch of time. Um, and then, a, a, another question: uh, What's the role of the Coastal Commission um, in terms of approving amendments to the city's LCP for housing element policies in the coastal zone? Does that come next, or is that part of our? existing local coastal plan or just so those are some and then the recent ADU study that you conducted I recognize a small sample I know this is something that um, and this is on page bottom of page six top of page seven um, of the staff report um, that what you the reported data tracks with the assumptions that are made about how aid the percentage of ADUs that are affordable and I know we've taught, this has come up at other council meetings, and then we got more additional information. I'm just wondering, is that can we see that study? Um, not with the names of respondents or anything, but is that information we can like access? What was that study again? The survey of ADUs okay. to determine affordability. And I really appreciate it that you do that. Um, it's just we got one, we got a, some additional information one time, and I'm just wondering if it's possible to get that. Okay. So those are, um, and then I have some questions about how to move forward. Thanks. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, and thanks for those questions and comments, Councilmember Brown. Um, I'll take a first swing at them, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Matt to see if he wants to fill in anything else. Um, the answer to a number of those um, items is um, the HCD guidelines. So you asked about um, the outcome of inclusion in the inventory and the ministerial process. Um, I, I want to clarify um, the way that I've read the guidelines. It's not actually two consecutive um, sites inventories. It's any two inventories. And that is for a developed project, or excuse me, a developed site. Um, if it's a vacant site, then three inventory listings uh, upon listing in the third and I want to be clear here because for um, a developed site, it's upon listing in the second that it becomes a ministerial review. And so that at the beginning, yes, that's correct. And, and that was part of the conversation with the subcommittee with respect to many of the um, uh, sites that Matt uh, referenced for uh, that are only providing the above moderate um, income, the market rate units, those. Um, if we if we don't need them right now because we've got the excess capacity in in that above moderate income category and so by taking them out if we need those sites in a future inventory we might have to add them and they wouldn't automatically be ministerial um, approvals at that point in time um, we pulled the government code from those guidelines so um, <laughs> 
there might be a, a typo in those guidelines. Um, uh, but we are happy to go back and reference that and, and follow up with you on the um, specific um, code section. Um, same thing with the student dorms not counting. Um, we've had uh, also a conversation with Councilmember Golder who expressed that same thing. We have a, um, a policy that um, recommends, and I'll get the actual number here so you can reference it, but it recommends that we work with the state in an attempt to have them uh, count more uh, non-traditional housing types towards RENA. So it's policy 1.4C, encourage the state to recognize non-traditional types of housing units for RENA purposes by providing feedback to HCD and state representatives. We've already had conversations with both UCSC and um, they have connected us with some of our state reps with uh, Gail Pellerin's office. And so, um, you know, we're jumping right into that because the sooner we can make that happen, the better off we'll be, especially as UCSC has a number of um, housing projects on the, uh, in, in the pipeline um, that we wouldn't be able to count. There are quite a few that we are able to count based on the, um, their independent living units. They've got a kitchen, they've got a bathroom. So um, it's our review and analysis, and, and we've um, also seen HCD presentations and uh, looked, pieced that together. So we believe that those can be counted, but not the dorm rooms. The dorm rooms, we can't count, and that's a big chunk of what the, the UCSC housing production is. I completely agree with your comments. We should be able to count those um, because they are providing housing for our residents. Um, so, um, let me get back just to really quickly while you're um, no. going on to the next one, I, I, I just I realized that question three was really about this question about realistic capacity yes. is kind of a little bit more ephemeral, and I'm happy to talk about it with you offline, so we don't have to spend well, a lot of time on it yeah, here I, unless you have a quick answer you yeah, want to give. I'll, I'll try to. So again, the guidelines speak to that, but um, one of the things that we did is we looked at land to um, building value ratios and. We also um, brought our own local knowledge about what developers and what, what developers have said to us. And also, you know, some of the properties that showed up, we knew the property owners were not interested. We've talked with them about project and they're not interested. So, so it's a combination of um, statistical analysis and local knowledge that goes into that. And really, it's telling the story to HCD so that they can understand that, yes, these sites, they, there is an actual potential for them to develop in the next eight years. Um, what's the role for the Coastal Commission? We've coordinated with them on this. The, the Coastal Commission, um, there are provisions that um, essentially took housing out of the hands of the Coastal Commission um, in the early 80s. And so this is not a local coastal program amendment. This does not have to go through the Coastal Commission. And um, we've we've coordinated with the Coastal Commission to confirm that we're on the same page there. So that's a good thing that it's it's our document. Um, and then the recent ADU study, absolutely, we're happy to get you the the information from that latest study. Thank you. One last thing, I believe um, <clears throat> Matt or Inez may be able to. Um, Inez is our consultant on the line here. Um, the ADUs, um, we have our own um, breakdown of affordability levels, and um, the state has their own breakdown. I believe we use the state breakdown for this. Is that correct? I'm seeing Matt nodding. Correct. I, I believe the, the state breakdown is 60% uh, low, very low, 30% mod, and 10% above mod. Uh, whereas our ADU studies, granted it's a small sample size and it's uh, – uh, self-reported, uh, but we've we've seen about 90% low, very low, uh, in that self-reporting. Uh, so we're we're hoping that our ADU projection uh, in the site's inventory is actually conservative. Okay, so now I have a few um, more substantive questions related to potential additions, um, and so the. So I, I'm, as you all know, I'm very much interested in um, doing everything we can and, and using this document being one of those everything we can in that, in that category to uh, promote possibilities for affordable housing development and uh, 
the protection of affordable housing stock and really as a part of that tenant protections, keeping people housed, um, as we know, is just so critical uh, given the crisis that we face. And so I, um, I wanna ask about uh, the possibilities of, and some of this I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be a little general here, but I, I have a few proposals that I'd like to put forward when we have the opportunity later, um, just to discuss with you all as part of a motion. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering about, um, in particular, inclusionary, um, is there anything that would like legally prevent us from including consideration of amendments to the inclusionary? I know it's in here to, con to look at that, um, but to require higher levels of affordability for density bonus projects. Um, so that's one. Um, and the others, maybe they're not quite as legal of a question, um, but also including uh, considering implementing a program to require workforce housing units in market rate uh, projects um, and looking at that workforce housing uh, and also uh, supporting and facilitating the efforts of Santa Cruz City School District to provide housing for its employees. There, I, I just don't know because some of that involves other agencies and the density bonus issue is very, um, uh, fraught, <laughs> we'll just say. So um, those are questions that I just wanted to see if I can get your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I, I can speak first to the, the inclusionary uh, question. So as, as part of the housing element, uh, one of the chapters, we do actually have to uh, show the state impediments to housing. Uh, HCD actually views inclusionary as an impediment to housing. So that's a, it's one, it's, it's, it's something we can obviously have as a city, but we also have to show the state that it's not an impediment to housing as, at, through this housing element. So changing that inclusionary right now without that study or additional review uh, would certainly be a red flag for HCD as part of the, this review currently. Uh, so we feel based on that, uh, it makes more sense to include still a policy in here that it is something that we'll study and look at uh, but come back at a later time. Uh, that's how we're currently addressing, looking at the inclusionary and whether changes need to be made to that. I gotcha, I, I, that's kind of, that was my question was about including consideration of this, not that this is something we were gonna pursue. Correct, okay. yep, Great. yep, Thanks. objective uh, 2.1B. And then the others, city school partnerships, workforce housing. So I think um, the workforce housing component actually falls within um, that 2.1B. Um, Matt, since you've got that pulled up, I was just searching for it. Um, it specifies review the inclusionary ordinance to determine if amendments are needed to ensure that the inclusionary requirements provide the maximum number of affordable units or deeper levels of affordability without being a barrier to housing development while considering implications for how developers will use density bonus um, analysis will evaluate affordability levels to incentivize deeper levels of affordable housing or more moderate income units, depending on needs. So that last um, bit, the more moderate income units, is where we could look at a policy that says um, there are trade-offs. And some, some cities actually have this. They've got um, different ways to meet the inclusionary requirements. So you could provide fewer very low and low income units. You could provide more moderate income units and that or, or some mixture between all of those um, and that provides more flexibility for the developers to look at the specific product type that they're putting on the market and to understand um, what's going to best meet their needs um, but i think your your point is a good one about how can we incentivize the um, the workforce housing um, we have some things in here that relate to housing production particularly at that um, the smaller project scale, so the one to four uh, units, for example. And um, it, that contributes, but um, it is certainly a gap because right now our inclusionary is at 80% of the area median income. And those people that are falling outside of that, Councilmember Golder is nodding because we had this conversation yesterday about her teachers. Um, they fall outside of that 80% um, AMI, but they don't um, make enough money to um, really live comfortably with a rental or to purchase a residence. And so 
that is something um, very important and, and that comment is well taken. It's something that we can look at even with the council subcommittee in advance of submission of submission to the uh, HCD of the first draft to see if there are ways that we can strengthen those policies. And then um, the last one that you had was the schools. And um, we did, as, as you all recall, we um, made some updates a year or two ago to, in, in some respects, address that workforce housing issue because the schools were falling outside of that, um, uh, that 80% um, income bracket that our inclusionary would um, otherwise require. And um, we uh, have a provision that was um, put in place to facilitate those school district projects, but that's not to say there aren't other things that we could do. And so we can certainly look at that as we're moving forward. And um, there may be some opportunities, even if we don't get things into this draft, because we do want to get the draft to HCD um, sooner rather than later. Um, but there still may be some opportunities, and, and they're going to come back with comments and have uh, um, requests for us to make modifications as well. So we don't want to introduce a whole slew of new things if we're coming back with a second draft, but if there are some things that are targeted that are um, affirmatively furthering fair housing or that are um, really promoting a, a, a objective that isn't adequately covered already, then that's something that we can also consider. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate your your comments there. And um, I so and I uh, I just have a so now I have a couple of questions about things that I would gesture to the, some things I would like to not see in the housing element, but this is, again, just just me. Um, so my questions are, uh, one, around particularly SB 10, and it comes up in across different parts of the housing element draft, um, but the under the policy plan uh, on page 2-5, five, five, objective 13E, um, we're going to adopt SB 10 provisions. Is that is it really necessary to do that? Um, given that we are in the process of Im implementing SB 9, we don't yet have a clear picture of how this will affect development kind of within the context of, of neighborhoods. And and so I'm just wondering, do we is that necessary? Um, there, this is, and I'm speaking a little bit in shorthand, I'm trying to keep it <laughs> quick here. Um, there's a reference on, so it's page 2-5 um, of the housing element draft, um, objective 1.3E, uh, that includes reference to adopting provisions of SB 10, another state law uh, related to um, increasing density infill. And um, so we're in the process of implementing SB 9, and so the question is just, is it, <laughs> it I just feel like we're, um, we're really pushing, and I appreciate the, the need for that, but given where we're at and that we've got a housing element that shows we have the capacity um, or an inventory here, it, it, I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank, thank you, Council Member. Um, this, this is one we, we definitely talked with the, the subcommittee on. Uh, and we knew it would require a softer touch. And uh, we, we feel like we came to a place where uh, this policy objective in particular uh, speaks to, you know, looking at this and considering it and bringing back council options for how this might happen. Uh, but there's no specific decision on, on implementing itself. Uh, so we, we felt that was, that was a good middle ground uh, between exploring the possibilities of it without uh, implementing it. I, I do want to point out in that um, SB 10, as you noted, is um, mentioned in a number of places. And one of the places that we also mentioned is 6.2D. There is a greater level of specificity in 6.2D. And um, that is expressly looking at how we might affirmatively further fair housing. That is one of the things that the state is going to be looking at very carefully and making sure that we are taking great strides um, at um, improving the great work that we're already doing. But this is one of the areas where we felt um, we can utilize that um, state law. And just so that um, the members of the public understand what SB 10 is, SB 10 allows for um, the city to change the general plan designation and or zoning designation of parcels such that they can allow up to 10 units on each parcel. And that 
would be exempt, that process itself would be exempt from CEQA, but the subsequent projects would not be. And so the thought here was that where um, in 6.2D, we um, uh, speak to focusing on higher resource areas, and that's a way to get at the affirmatively furthering fair housing is looking at some of those high resource areas and identifying places where we could utilize, in this instance, flexible density units, which are small units of 650 square feet, 650 square feet or less um, that um, could um, then, you know, they're, they're, um, they have the potential to allow for people to move into areas um, that have uh, traditionally not been accessible to them based on um, the, the prices there. Thank you. Um, I have one last question, and then I'll <laughs> pass it off. Um, and I will just say, just given what I'm what I am hearing, I have to just make this comment because I don't know if I will get a chance to make it again. It just feels like a lot of the the, the way HCD is, is approaching this is more af affirmatively furthering more housing. Um, so I, I'm not. I, I'm just. I, you know, I, I want to see the fairness. I want to see the equity in it. Um, so just more units. Is, to me, it doesn't it feels like just more housing. Um, but I appreciate your thinking about the approach and the resource, high resource areas. Uh, um, the last question I have is related to owner occupancy requirements for ADUs. Uh, this has been before us uh, in the past. Uh, the, we did not opt to do that, and then the state uh, made the decision for us. But that's a temporary, uh, temporary uh, law may perhaps will also be taken care of for us if the state highly likely. But for now, we have some uh, ability to make that choice uh, for the longer term on our own. And so I guess I'm just, um, I'm wondering is if that is desirable, and I'm, I'm really asking the question for of all of us to think about, um, do we have any way to evaluate, this is a question for you, do we have any way to evaluate the effects of this policy and I'm going to make a comment, commenty question, just to say I'm I'm particularly concerned about this because I um, I feel and many do that it um, incentivizes speculative investment in our local property market in a way that um, has a negative effect on people who want to buy a home and live here and um, and perhaps build an ADU to house a family member or have additional income to help pay their mortgage, that's a very different uh, dynamic than the what we know is the wave of, um, you know, highly leveraged, spec ha leveraged speculative investment in our community, and we can't stop it. But this is one thing that, that kind of mitigates that, I feel. So um, is it really desirable is a question for you all. Um, do we have any way to uh, assess the impacts of the, the at least five-year um, elimination of that rule. Thanks, Councilmember Brown. Brown, that's a great question, um, and um, I'll start by where start where you started, where you said uh, we may the choice may be eliminated for us. There is a bill pending at the state right now um, in this legislative cycle that would um, it have the current expiration of 2025 extend indefinitely, so that we could not apply owner occupancy standards to. ADUs. Um, I believe that that is going to pass, and I believe that that is going to pass because of what plays into your second part of the question, do we have any statistics? Our ADU production has ramped up substantially, um, and um, I, I do believe that that is in part based on the fact that um, we have no ability to um, require owner occupancy during this time frame. Um, anecdotally, I have heard that from some individuals that have constructed who have said, now's the time, I got to do it in these five years. Um, and your point is a, a very valid concern. That was uh, a question that was uh, debated um, uh, years ago, 2019, I believe, when we brought the um, ADU owner occupancy considerations forward. And council said, go off and study that. And then we had in 2020, the um, state say, well, no owner occupancy requirements for the next five years, and so we've kind of put a pause on that. But council has given us direction to go off and um, study 
that and um, to um, talk with the community about it. And so um, if there's concern about the way that uh, the policy is currently worded, I don't have it in front of me right now, but if there's concern about um, if, if it's uh, more definitively stated than the, than the council is comfortable with right now, then we can certainly dial that back and adjust it in advance of our submittal to HCD. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Council Member Bremer. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's see. Thank you for thus far, and um, I was part of working on this last summer and the resolution, and so seeing it come to this state, um, there's a lot in there, and my question, um, just to kind of summarize, I shared it, this information and the links with a lot of people that are very interested in housing in our community, and it's really hard for a lot of people to digest everything in what is in here, and so, um, my um, couple of questions I have, um, I think there's an, the next community meeting for input is in summer. Is there? That's correct, August time frame. Okay, and so nothing until then, it goes through this draft process. And so the next opportunity for public input on this would be summer. Yes, and um, if someone still wants to make comments on the current draft or the draft, you know, we'll post the draft that uh, we submit to HCD, um, mm -hmm. which will you know, be revised based on what we're hearing both from the Planning Commission meeting and tonight. So we'll be posting that draft. And if individuals want to comment on that during the interim, we're happy to receive that feedback. In fact, you know, the earlier the better as um, you know, we're going to be working on things while HCD is undertaking their you, but the next big push for additional outreach will be in August. Okay, and I, I guess my um, that helps because um, one thing that I'm always trying to um, help with is education, education, and understanding on um, these topics that are very important um, and that people in the in the community really want to weigh in on. Um, and so, um, for example, I've been giving it a lot of thought about how we can make it ex more accessible for people to understand. Um, and so we throw around the term um, low income, very low income, moderate, low, affordable. To us, in this context, and I know from sitting on, for example, the Housing Authority Board for, for many years, that term is a defined term that we're following a state table based on how many people in your household, based on your income level, based on the area. And for everyday people, the term affordable means can I afford to live there? And when we just at our strategic plan meeting, our top industry is tourism and hospitality. So those people in those industries, when I did a quick search on the internet for that salary range, we have retail workers, restaurant workers, hospitality workers, and a lot of them are, are downtown and in, in these corridor site areas. Um, People want to see that maybe language called out so it can identify with them, teacher, bus driver, our own city workers, not, not the terms that we use. And I don't know if there's a way to get at that between now and the next community input, creating a little video that's just a layperson, clear, um, here are some sites and in, in a way that someone can not feel intimidated and know what they're commenting on. Um, and so I just, that came up several times with several people and, um, and then some of the housing groups that work on um, 
are more familiar with these terms and state law and whatnot, it took a while to get through all that too. And so I just want to um, ask that question for consideration as we move through this process and, and to think about how we can reach by the time the next community input is being asked that we think about our language that we're so used to using but rephrase it in ways that are more accessible. Um, so um, I guess that ended up being more of a comment than a direct question or clarifying question. Um, and so I really, um, um, I appreciate all the questions that were asked thus far. So I will pass it on um, at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. More comments? Ms. Watkins. I just have one. I just have one. Um, well, actually, I, have, I just have two. Did, I, did, I, did you have some? Go. Okay. Uh, two, um, you can't leave until I'm done anyways. Okay, you're right. <laughs> there you go. We're all, in it, we're all in it together. Good point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, one is just like a weird nuanced question. In regards to the county site, my question was, would that be a double count for their arena numbers as well? No, it would just be the city specific. Okay. That that's that's that. correct. It would just be ours, um, but um, we don't anticipate that it's going to happen. No, I know. So we, we're recommending that that site be taken. Right, right. Okay, gotcha. I guess, so my other question was about the university. Um, you know, in terms of the context of the ADU conversation that was brought up by Councilmember Brown, like, you know, bringing it way back, I think, to our housing kind of blueprint work and our community engagement strategy, what we heard is that our community is really supportive of more dense housing happening in our downtown and places away from the residential areas. Therefore, like having ADUs being, you know, produced through an owner, that kind of context was like, okay, well that will keep the integrity of that area. So, I mean, just to kind of provide a little bit of input that all came really from the outreach efforts that, it, that took place to help inform our strategies. And then um, I guess lastly, it's sort of just a larger, um, question is, is something that I hear often is, you know, how come Santa Cruz is producing all this health housing? How come it's these big buildings going up in Santa Cruz? What about other communities? And I'm just wondering how you would respond to that. Or, or you know, I mean, how do I, ex how do you explain that? That's a great question. Um, I think there is a confluence of factors okay. uh, affecting this here. Um, you know, we're all here because we love many things about Santa Cruz and it makes it an attractive place to live um, with whether it's the, the natural environment or the climate. That's certainly um, one component. Um, UCSC and the, proximate, the proximity to UCSC is another significant driver um, to that. And when you, when you look at some of the neighboring communities, you know, you're getting further away from UCSC. And so um, w w even right now before the um, the UCSC expansion, they've got um, n roughly 19,500 students and um, a little under half of those are um, not living on campus. So uh, that's a significant number of students that um, are in, in all likelihood looking for places closer to campus than um, some of the other uh, cities. Um, and then uh, our proximity to Silicon Valley an influence there as well. Again, we're closer to Silicon Valley than um, uh, other neighboring communities. Um, and um, maybe finally, I'd go back to um, just uh, a, a tangent from the first thing that I mentioned. Um, there's a, there are a lot of um, uh, attractive things in Santa Cruz, and not just related to the natural environment, but also. Um, there is a higher concentration of jobs in Santa Cruz than elsewhere in the neighboring communities. And so people looking to live close to their jobs. Um, we also have um, better transit options um, than neighboring communities. And so, and, and a, a more walkable and bikeable um, uh, location than others. So people that are looking for that lifestyle um, are also looking to move here. And um, I will say that um, the, it, said finally, but I've got one more thing, um, because uh, 
the, the work from home um, uh, dynamic, I think, has made Santa Cruz more attractive um, uh, in that, um, you know, people that were working in San Francisco or the South Bay or the East Bay um, wouldn't necessarily commute five days a week to that job, but if they only have to commute in two days a week, well, that becomes a more manageable um, uh, commute. And I'd say that is bearing out in the development proposals that we are seeing. Um, I've talked with colleagues over the Hill, and um, they have seen a slowdown in some of the residential development applications. And um, even with the interest rate hikes that we've seen in the last you know, eight months or so um, in particular, we've had um, a, uh, a lender um, authorize uh, development and, and lend on the Front Riverfront project, which uh, I'll throw a number out there, is probably a, a $70 million project, right? So the lending community is um, very much uh, still believing that um, our local market um, is strong because of all of those factors. Well, given the university and, you know, the influx of population from the university, I think having the dorms counted <laughs> makes a lot of sense and um, would definitely benefit our community. So however we can advocate for that at the state, um, I'm all in. So anyways, thank you. I know that was a, not an easy question. I appreciate your response. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Vice Mayor. I want to thank the subcommittee and I want to thank um, Director Butler and your staff and thank you. Uh, for spending an hour and a half talking me off the ledge yesterday as I <laughs> as I read through it over the weekend and I was like, did, I don't like to bother them on the weekends, but I was like, heart attack, heart attack. And I'm also wondering, where are all the people that don't want uh, the tall buildings? Where are you now? <laughs> so you're just leaving me on my own. Um, so one thought that I had throughout these conversations that I didn't think of till now was, um, is there a possibility, and not now, but in the future, to limit the square footage in a single family home in town. And the reason being is I think we can all agree that at a certain point, a house is, people aren't having nine kids anymore. Like how many bedrooms, how many square feet do you need? And then it would force people to put an ADU if they wanted additional square footage or force people into building duplexes in single family neighborhoods if they really wanted that additional square footage. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Has anyone yeah. thought of that? Um, so, so a couple things. We do have a, um, a large home ordinance right now that adds a different uh, a different process um, for larger homes. Um, I think it's it's fairly large. I'm going to look to Eric. It's three thousand square feet. Is that correct? Yes. He's um, nodding there. So, you know, homes over three thousand square feet, quite large, right? Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you that um, there are some innovative models out there. Um, and um, I think that Portland is doing that well with respect to. Um, Sorry, I just think of Portlandia when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we um, we could it, maybe not their their base square footage, but um, I believe if I if I recall correctly, twenty five hundred square feet is their base square footage for a typical R one lot. And then if you wanted to add another unit, they allow up to four, I believe it is, you want to add another unit, um, you get um, you know, an extra 1,000 square feet. And if you want to add another unit, you get an extra 500 square feet. And you want to add another unit, you get an extra. So, so that's along the lines of what I, I think you were contemplating is you know, add these additional units. And you know, if you need them while, say, your kids are here, then they're in a they kitchen and counted for us. Yes. That's and what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I don't know if we could explore something like that, not in this, but moving forward with the subcommittee or with your staff. It's just a random thought I had. There, there is absolutely that, um, that possibility um, in terms of um, also how it fits in with some of these other objectives that we have. What's that? Non-traditional back yes. there at 1.4 or whatever and, it was. And even uh, the things that we were talking about with Councilmember Brown earlier with respect to um, flexible density units in um, areas of high opportunity, it, it could be that you know in those areas we're um, uh, requiring a, a smaller house, um, but then um, you get additional uh, flexible density units. And one more thing um, that I would want to say um, related to that 
the SB10 allows for up to 10 units. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we've got to go with 10, but it would allow for some flexibility there. And so um, I think that's also what you were getting at, Vice Mayor Gilder. It was. Thank you. <laughs> done. Council Member Watkins again. <laughs> Sorry. No, not a problem. Since uh, Council Member Gilder brought up kind of creative options, you know, one thing I wanted to know, and I'm not sure if it fits here, is in terms of like the passive housing concept and how we're really wanting to move forward with environmentally strong development, how does that fit into a potential um, policy? And if, if not here, then potentially where? I mean, and that will have impacts on our grid and other, um, asset, you know, carbon outputs, et cetera. Thanks for that question, Council Member Watkins. So, um, Policy 7 um, speaks to supporting green building principles and building decarbonization efforts to reduce and respond to global warming and the impacts of climate change. And so we do have um, some objectives um, related to that. Um, and um, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't specifically call out the passive house design, but we're calling out um, green building objectives and allowing for flexibility because things are going to change over time. Um, so um, we we could, if, if the council chose to have us pursue a passive house approach, then we could look to these policies to support that because you know, they're talking about um, building decarbonization and expanding efforts okay. related to that. And that's exactly what is happening with the passive house design is, is looking to minimize the energy use and capitalize on natural ventilation and, and um, uh, shade and shadow and so on to help decrease the costs. Well, I, I mean, I'm definitely all on board for that, and I think that'd be really forward thinking given that we're anticipating extreme weather and extreme heat. And so, anyways, if we're thinking it for the future, that would make a lot of sense to me. But thank you. I appreciate that avenue. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you. I have more comments and questions. Um, I also just want to acknowledge and thank the staff for all the tremendous work and all of my colleagues here for all of your great input. I've been sort of vigorously taking notes on everything that you said, and I think we'll have some thoughts and ideas to take to the next iteration of this. Um, but I want to name, I think, some of the core things we were really trying to do um, as subcommittee and staff is to meet our, provide a housing element policy draft that not only meets our housing arena goals, but um, has us be innovative and be bold in housing production, as I said earlier, to really meet these emerging needs in our community. Now, doing that while balancing the integrity of the values of our community. That's a tough balance. Sometimes they're in contradiction with each other. But as we were looking through the policies that were presented to us and kind of hashing through it and pulling it apart, um, in my mind, those were the things we were trying to balance. Go beyond meeting our house, the arena numbers because we are forward thinking. We are in the top 6% and we're proud of that. We should be proud of that while really hearing the community concerns that are real and, and taking that into balance. So I just kind of wanted to name that. In my mind, I saw that as our goal. Um, it will take partnerships. So I'm glad that that was brought up. Um, city schools was brought up. I wanted to mention that the Metro, one of their top three goals is to build 175 units of affordable housing on Metro transit centers. So there's a lot of opportunities. There's other agencies and entities in the city and the county that are thinking about this now, because we have to be. So I think as, as we continue to work on this housing element and continue to do this work even beyond when we get approval right away from HCD, because we're so awesome like that, um, to continue to have these conversations and to, and to think about, um, like, we're not alone. People, people are thinking about this. People are designing differently. Um, people, I mean, you know, groups and entities and agencies. So just, just for us to, to keep that in mind, sorry, I'm slipping. It's 9 o'clock, and I went to bed really late working. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is I brought this up in our strategic planning sessions, and I think we talked about it in our housing element subcommittee, is um, to also make sure we have policies that work towards home pathways to home ownership. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember where it's at in the housing element, but I know that we talked about it and it came up in the strategic plan. So we'll make sure that we 
um, that that's there in the next iteration. So just that's it. sorry for rambling. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, and I uh, want to thank uh, Director Butler and uh, the staff for all the work that went into this uh, document and to uh, my colleagues who were on the uh, subcommittee uh, and to uh, uh, the rest of my colleagues who for all uh, your uh, questions today. Um, I uh, did want to uh, briefly or just ask a question, but if you could please uh, speak to um, just briefly to so there's a chart on 36.7 that shows the very low income, low income units, affordable housing units, and above moderate income. And I was wondering if you could speak to uh, how those numbers will potentially be higher than what are shown due to how HCD uh, counts uh, those numbers. Thanks so much for asking that. Um, and um, that is something that uh, we meant to incorporate into the presentation. So. Um, it, it, and even if it was mentioned, it, it bears repeating um, because the above moderate units, uh, so the market rate units shown in that table, um, do not account for our inclusionary. So um, HCD, Department of Housing and Community Development in the state, doesn't allow us to count inclusionary towards uh, uh, from or take it away from the market rate and add it into the lower income category, which is where our inclusionary currently has 20% of those units. So I really appreciate you raising that point to the forefront because even as we're looking at this um, uh, buffer and the above um, market rate, 20% of those would be going into the low income. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mr. Butler, uh, thank you for this. Uh, for my return to some ground that's been gone over before this evening, uh, the relationship between our general plan and, and its housing element with all of the components in it and our local coastal plan, let's assume a fact not in evidence yet, which is that we get through this, HCD has approved it, now we have an approved housing element to our general plan. Now along comes an application for something. And in analyzing that, uh, we believe uh, when looking through the lenses of the general plan and the housing element, that something that is being proposed is consistent with that. And yet, when we look at our local coastal plan, there may be a conflict. How is that resolved? The local coastal program will take precedent. The local coastal plan will take precedent. So in the coastal zone, we have to conform to our LCP. And um, we'll have um, an analysis related to the general plan consistency, which will include the housing element consistency, but we also need to make the findings in the coastal zone that the project is consistent with the LCP. And so if we have something in the LCP that's, let's say, more restrictive than something that we have in the housing element, then um, we would have to conform with both, being, meaning the more restrictive LCP. If, it's, if the LCP is more lenient than the, uh, the housing element. You know, you have to conform with both is, is the answer in the coastal zone. So in the instance that there is this conflict and we determine consistency with our general plan and our, and our housing element, we look over at the LCP and we say there's conflict, we now have to in the instance you raise, I, I see that if it cuts one way, but the way it cuts is always in favor of the LCP. If the LCP is more restrictive, it's which more is generally the case, right? In the LCP. Say it again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The LCP, if it's more restrictive, that's generally the case. The LCP is going to be more restrictive. I would imagine. And so um, it, in that case, the LCP, we would need to find consistency. And there may be some alternative ways to find consistency. For example, um, 
we've got a provision in the LCP that allows for density bonus projects, right? And so um, maybe through the density bonus um, uh, provisions, it could conform with the LCP, but we're going to have to find consistency one way or another. If the, uh, so we've got probably a couple of hundred cities along the coast of California who have LCPs, and maybe 258, just to throw a number out, uh, that are along the coast of the 460 cities in California. You've got a couple of hundred of them at least that are, that are on the coast. So they're going to be dealing with the same thing we're dealing with. Does the Coastal Commission locally or, or at the commission uh, larger, uh, does either the staff or the commission get involved in the process we're engaged in right now? Generally, no. Um, as I mentioned, the, the early um, 1980s provision to um, housing um, was originally in the Coastal Act. And in the early 80s, um, it was removed from the Coastal Act. And um, the, the Coastal Commission has a list of prioritized uses. Um, housing isn't high on that list. Um, they, they generally stay out of that. You know, they're looking at visitor serving accommodations um, as, you know, their, their primary uses and also coastal resource or coastal dependent industry um, and so forth. So, um, why wouldn't a developer, a, a question, why wouldn't a developer, if faced with a situation where our local coastal plan is more restrictive than the housing element, the general plan, the zoning law, then why would a, I'm sorry, let me rephrase the question slightly. We've got some local authority up to a point. We, we had this discussion in January at the very first meeting. We can do everything we can to manage towards, for example, south of Laurel, 12 stories, 1,600 units, 20% affordable. That's what we're managing towards. We're going to try to put that policy together, make it hold. But you've cautioned us that there may be occasions where the state says, uh, for this set of reasons, uh, that isn't going to hold. So let's imagine that that is then, uh, you know, it's all of a sudden no longer consistent with what we think either. Uh, developers propose something that either we say no to and the state then says yes to. Where does the local coastal plan come in then in that instance? It seems, it seems like then you've got two state entities fighting with each other rather than us. Great question because you know there's are there certainly are instances uh, where um, we would say there are um, state policies coming down from HCD and from the legislature that are seeking to really promote housing production, um, and yet there's um, a, uh, a tighter level of controls on uh, the coastal the coastal zone and through the coastal commission. Um, and you actually see this in some of the legislation itself because um, a lot of the legislation in recent years, SB 35, for example, mm -hmm. which we saw with AP1 mm -hmm. Water, SB 35 does not apply in the coastal zone. Okay. And so there are specific carve-outs that the legislature makes to say, yes, we want to promote housing, and we recognize that the coastal zone is a special place. They don't do that for all of the bills. AB 2097, which we discussed earlier today, the parking mm -hmm. restrictions, mm -hmm. those are um, applicable inside the coastal zone as well. So um, the, the state is recognizing that, um, that challenge and is sometimes seeking to um, directly exempt the coastal zone from those laws, and sometimes they're making the stance that they expressly want to make sure the coastal zone is included. So. Um, Yes, there is that tension that um, continues to exist um, between some of those state-level policies as it relates to the coastal zone. I predict this will not be the last time we discuss this topic. Um, let, me, let me move on to another issue. Uh, it, 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 thank you for that answer. The uh, Councilmember Brown raised the question about 
uh, workforce housing. And uh, I think we're, I don't think there's anybody here not interested in that. Uh, if we were to add language in, in objective 2.1D that said, I'll let you get there first. Tell me when you're ready. Point one B, you said? Two point one D as in e. dog. Okay. Is it a new policy? Wondering about this. Okay. If at that point, uh, what would you think of adding language that said, consider implementing a program that increases workforce housing in market rate multifamily projects with adequate financial incentives? I'll be glad to go over that again if you'd like me to, because I know it, it, it was a few words, yeah. Consider implementing a program to incent workforce housing units in market rate multifamily projects with adequate financial incentives. <coughs> so the incentive is the financial incentives. Yeah, I mean, wondering I if, if 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 that is any heartache in terms of how the state would view that. Is that a that's not a barrier an imp, an impediment that might actually, as we're saying, about considering. Right. I think um, a couple things. Um, I I do think that um, we'll want to wordsmith it a bit to um, be more definitive about okay. what because HCE. We actually have a lot of policies that are crafted in this manner, and one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next week um, is refining how those policies are very definite in terms of what the action okay. is. So that would be some, and but we can certain the the base of that is just yeah. fine, and we could wordsmith that and uh, work with the subcommittee to come up with okay. uh, language. Thank you. When we get to a motion, uh, whoever is going to make it. Uh, uh, I'll ask you to either in your motion or I'll ask you if you would accept a friendly amendment to the motion, whoever makes the motion to, in, to include that. Uh, let me go to another issue here. Uh, this whole issue around protection of tenants, uh, we do some things in that regard uh, programmatically here and through the budget and so on, uh, providing, providing assistance there. Uh, my goodness, that's a you know, a subject matter where there's a lot of folks with uh, a lot of needs in that regard. I wonder what you would think, again, whether or not you imagining that you're HCD and you're trying to determine whether this concept would, would fly or not fly. If you put in something, for example, on page 2-18, adding, adding a policy 4.3, and I'll wait till you get there. We have, um, oh, adding a new policy. Got it. Yes, so this sir. Would be a new policy. Great. So, we good where you are? I agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, w if we were to add something which said to the effect uh, that uh, providing protection for tenants from unaffordable rent increases or excessive, excuse me, or a excessive application fees, uh, this doesn't. I want to be very clear. This community has fought over the question of rent control. This is not a rent control, you know, being run in uh, 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 in the dead of night here. That isn't where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to see that when it comes to these two issues, is there anything we might be able to do that is not called rent control? Because we're, we're, we've been there, done that several times in the community. So I'm trying to look at a somewhat different issue here. Sure. So um, we do have um, some protections right now, specifically right. related to um, large in rent increases that the council has approved, mm -hmm. and those are in place. And, and I think 
um, we've got some policies in here that speak to how we can help um, promote that, um, uh, that uh, protective policy in uh, uh, low-income areas of the community in particular, but throughout the community in general. Um, and then um, the excessive application fees, um, that is something that we've heard from COPA um, with yeah, respect right. to um, the uh, uh, individual applying for a, right. a apartment having to fill out and pay a $50 mm -hmm. application at multiple. I, I do think um, there could be some potential opportunity there. How that is implemented, I think we might uh, look to some community partners um, to assist with that, but um, I think in, uh, on its face, that sounds like something that's worth um, exploring, and, and we can work with the subcommittee to um, to um, wordsmith any other you. language as needed. Let me move to page – let me stay there and ask a question about if we were to add an objective 4.3.B that would read something to the effect of considering an ordinance to ensure that rental application fees comply with the provisions of state law. There, I want to make sure you get that first and then I'll implement an ordinance to ensure that rental application fees comply with the provisions of state law. Yeah. The, the issue there is similar to the issue above. And uh, you hear from more than a couple of renters, uh, people searching for rentals and uh, so on about, uh, about these application fees, which some folks see as a, and in fact it is for some folks, a barrier to even getting in the game to rent a place. So if, if there's no, uh, do you think that uh, has any, would be objectionable in any way to HCD? I don't think that would be objectionable. Okay. I also think that it, um, it reminds me of some of the things that we heard. We heard a speaker at the Planning Commission say, for example, that, um, that they see advertisements that say no Section 8. And as we all know, there is no discrimination based on um, income. Uh, and so Section 8, you cannot discriminate against individuals for that. And so um, I think that we may even be able to expand a policy in this respect to, um, to address um, multiple aspects of um, consistency with state law. Thank you, sir. Uh, go to page, if, if you would, if you'd go to page 6-24. Which uh, objective or policy? Uh, under the Fair Housing Policy. Okay. Objective 6.1G. Add, add a G to it. Okay. Uh, again, uh, consider this. I, I will read it to you then. What I'm looking for is, is some assessment as how HCD may receive this. Uh, establish a community-based Displacement Housing Task Force to advise the City Council on the potential displacement effects of proposed policies or projects and recommend policies to reduce the potential displacement impacts of new development. I'll be glad. I know that was a lot of words. You tell me what, how much more you need, and I'll, I'll go back over it again with you. Uh, I got it. Very good. Um, You're better than I am at that, then. So um, we have a policy, and, and actually, let me go back to the, uh, I wonder if it's the same one here. Um, we have a policy in here that speaks to displacement and bringing information back to the council. I want to come to. Um, so that is. Um, it's actually, I was looking at 5.5B. Um, evaluate in relation to HUD's upcoming equity plan requirements, evaluate the effectiveness of existing anti -displacement, displacement strategies and tools, and present to council best practices and recommendations for additional 
anti-displacement policies and programs, such as additional anti-retaliation policies and a revised first right of refusal to tenants displaced due to new development. I think that we could Rather than do mine, could you simply add into that policy and consider an anti-displacement <laughs> task force? Put that in there. That, that may fit better where you're talking about, because I think that's the only new idea suggested in the in the sentence I read right, to you. Generally, I think okay. it's. Okay, good. Uh, let me uh, let me wrap this up with a, with a couple other questions. I know wrapping up meant stopping. Um, this business, uh, we've been over this, and the, and the council subcommittee has been over this, and every member of the city council has gotten input on this. So I want to do it once here uh, in open session. So on those site inventories that you had where you showed at Nelly Pond, and th there were three, I think, right? There was, a, there was a map with three on it. Yeah, Golf Club Drive, well, it was and Golf Club Nelly Drive, Pond, and so on and so on. And so, uh, the county building, thanks. And the county building, right. And so my recollection at the subcommittee and in our discussions also on this is that with respect to the golf course, golf club drive uh, parcel uh, or parcels, that the issue there is that from planning's point of view, this would be very, very difficult to have an area plan put together. If I understand it, at least the, the current thinking is that one of the property owners at least would seriously object to that, to having their parcel included in an area. I think it's an area plan. Am I right about that? The, yes, is it, that the, does, what it's called? it does call for an area okay. plan. The general plan calls for an area And then there's another, I'm sorry? The general plan calls for an area plan. Yeah, okay, thank you. And then there's another property owner who says, I really want to do that. Mm -hmm. So you've got one that says, I really want to do it, one that says, I don't want that done. So my f threshold question is, can an, area be, can an area plan be undertaken if a property owner in the area doesn't want it? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's what I thought. So who is the moving party when that happens? Who, who starts that area plan process? So, for, so several ways that that could okay. um, start. The, the council could give direction and allocate funding um, we would typically um, bring in a consultant both to assist with the um, development of the plan and a consultant, typically a separate consultant, to assist with the um, CEQA analysis, the California Environmental Quality Act analysis. And so the council could um, give that uh, direction and um, allocate the funding towards that. There are also opportunities that a, and, and we have said in this instance, and looking right. at your reaction, mm -hmm. For, for this particular site, um, we've looked at um, grant opportunities for um, citywide uh, uh, projects, mm. and we have focused those in areas that have greater citywide benefit. For example, the downtown plan expansion mm -hmm. to the south, which mm -hmm. is grant funded, right. um, uh, and our objective standards process, which were grant funded. Um, there was advocacy on behalf of the uh, um, some property owners in that area to um, seek grant funding for that. Mm -hmm. And what we've sought is um, looking at um, dedicating those grant funds and, and seeking to acquire those grant funds, which are limited in nature and staffing is limited, to areas where there's a, uh, a greater public benefit there is a very significant private benefit and uh, out on Golf Club Drive. Mm -hmm. um, and the provision of housing also is, is a benefit to the public. But in, in terms of um, amenities that um, mm -hmm. the greater community will enjoy, things like the objective standards have a greater citywide um, benefit. Mm -hmm. So we've focused our efforts in those areas and said um, that the developer can choose to um, uh, propose that they fund the staff and consultant work and um, present that if they if they want to do that, then we could present that to the council and say, here's the proposal that's before us. The developing community is looking to fund this. Um, we would take the lead on that effort 
um, so that we stay in control of the process and direct how that area um, is shaped in, in coordination and communication with the community. And then um, uh, we would um, present those findings to the Planning Commission and City Council. So, you know, it can happen in multiple ways. Um, we have suggested up until this point that it, it is a privately funded matter and that if the developer wants to come up with the funds related to that, that um, we will then look at how we would be able to potentially accommodate that or hire a consultant, um, even a consulting staff member to um, supplement because as you can see from the housing element that's before you, we have many tasks and we will have to report on an annual basis on how we're accomplishing each of those tasks. And so inserting large um, uh, work efforts that are in addition to what we have in this are gonna be challenging to achieve and that's where we would also look for that uh, developer to likely fund a, a consulting uh, staff member that comes in house in addition to the consultant. So. Um, Probably more than you needed to know. No, no it isn't. No, uh, thank you for that. I, I appreciate your your nuanced responses to these questions. These are, these are not simple questions. They, well, mine might be, but other council members ask complex questions that deserve complex answers. So thank you for that. Staying with that subject for a moment, uh, looking at it through the lens of the property owner who would like to develop housing there on that site, or, or part of that site anyway, the part that that person owns. Um, if I understand it correctly, I think what you've said to me is, if we were to put it in now, if we were to put the golf club drive in, and nothing happened on that in this, re uh, I'm sorry, in this, this round, and then next round it stayed in and nothing happened. The developer then has a by right ability to develop that property, is that correct? Those sites, I believe, each have development on them. It's like a single family house. Um, right. And yep. so I would expect that the, um, uh, the HCD would uh, characterize those as developed property and not undeveloped property. And so upon those sites' inclusion in the next inventory, they would become ministerial. Third. No, second. Second. As soon as they're in the second, as a developed site, as soon as they're so in the second. In the second. There we it go. It becomes then ministerial. So it'd be from day this. one. Say so it again, Matt. I'm from, sorry. from day one, they would be ministerial in the next element, so eight, okay. eight years from now. So, so, uh, So nothing. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. That would no, no, that no, would. No, I got what I got. What I okay. need to to get on that. I I, I think I, I have a better understanding of what you're talking about. Let me. Uh, the matter is. Uh, let me see. Have we gotten public input yet? I don't remember if I did or didn't. All right. Anyone with us wish a comment? Anybody online? We have how many folks online? People with their hands right? Okay. Good. Let's go with the first one. Good evening. Yes, hello. Hey, it's Garrett. Hey, uh, MBAG's 3700 plus housing unit extortion building demands only make sense if the communist indoctrination facility on the Hill, AKA UCSC, completes its plans to load the asylum with thousands of new extra comrad recruits and the groomers to add many thousands of such, which I personally would not look forward to. We know some of the MBAG allocation was because those racist deemed Santa Cruz too white, and thank God we weren't considered too affluent, or the number would have been even higher, as they think injecting poor people, which they also assume are, are people of color, into wealthy or white communities is some kind of virtue. Now, you haven't yet, but you must acknowledge California is in a decade-long uh, population growth rate decline, which has now turned negative for a number of years, as well as the county, and now the city has. Without UCSC housing demand, Quantity demand otherwise is a big fat lie. The recent city population drop confirms this. The reasons for continuance of this trend are many, including a decades-long decline in male fertility, 
boomers dying off, an aging population, a rising age of firstborn, COVID deaths, a troubling persistent new excess mortality, lowering lifespans, and a lot of people leaving California due to sky high taxes, a horrific business regulation climate, and an odious politics. These are not replacement units. They are new additional households, which without UCSC growth could easily result in a massive permanent increase in vacancies, even 13% without more people. If that occurs, it's a disaster. But hey, maybe there'll be a lot more affordable housing done, done the hard way. Note, massive vacancies are not the ticket to prosperity. The timing could not be worse as interest rates are causing housing to be on the verge of a bubble bursting. Overbuilding into a financial housing bubble burst is about as dumb as a rock. Think Stockton in 2009. There could be mass casualties. The idea of solving overcrowding by stuffing people into historic record density housing in block long, six plus story high, monoliths with cigar box studios smaller than my garage is a very strange thinking. The idea you solve my rent is too dang high by offering people to rent half a sandwich instead of sharing a whole one at the same price isn't my idea of a bargain. Yes, it is possible the housing mix, mix should change or that the cost efficiencies of high density will attract people out of their present housing situation, but a very poor permanent vacancy could easily occur without UCSC. The idea you should assist by giving away public land belonging to all as subsidy to further this risky cause to benefit the very few is a government meddling in the free market and quite socialist communist in method. Government subsidized low income housing can invite poverty into the city. The states and now your seemingly brainless push for density, removal of travel freedoms, and social justice warring smacked of Agenda 21 control methods, which seal a crowded jail off with the inmates inside. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, we have one more. Three more now. Three more now. All right. Next person up. Good evening. Good evening. Good, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to Table G2 and Appendix G, which um, it, it lists uh, UC Santa Cruz housing as uh, all of it is in the very low, low or moderate. And uh, that's just flat out wrong. There is no undergraduate housing on UCSC campus that is not completely exorbitantly priced. And so I'd like, I'm looking at the 2023, 2024 apartment rates. So for example, a double room in an apartment, which is an independent living unit, which would count in the arena um, numbers is $1,735 per person. So that's 3,400, almost $3,500 per month for two people to share a bedroom in an apartment with multiple bedrooms. So there is nothing that you'd have. I mean, there's different configurations. They do not list the prices um, per apartment. So you have to do a whole bunch of sleuthing to get that. But I would like staff to address that Appendix G. That's an error and it is in line with UCSC's um, false narrative that they're providing affordable housing for undergraduates it is the most expensive rental housing in Santa Cruz are none. And that is part of the problem because they will never build enough housing to house more than 50% of their undergraduate student body because they can, can't fill it at those rates. And um, <clears throat> so that's also, they, they also made false representations in front of the regents in terms of their new LRDP about the, the price of housing. Chancellor Reeve has promised 30% below market when in fact their own cost of living studies show that the on-campus price of housing is significantly about two to three times above the off-campus rates. So I would like staff to address that. Where did they get those numbers? Why did they use them? You can look up, it's online on the UCSC site. Just go to UCSC and put in housing space rates and you will pull up the, the current rates for apartments. I don't even bother with dorms, but just for the apartments, which include kitchens and bathrooms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Two more, Ms. Bush. Good evening. 
Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. This is Robert Sonnenfeld. Um, first, I just wanted to uh, thank all the, the hard work that the staff and the subcommittee have been uh, uh, doing on, on this project. This is uh, uh, not an easy task, and uh, I think we're in a, a really good place for being this uh, relatively early off in, in the process. We still have a long ways to go. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, remind the council that uh, uh, the rate of production that the ex state expects of us is nearly double our, the, the rate that we've experienced in the last few years. And just really wanna encourage the council to, uh, to, to think boldly about what sorts of policies we can, uh, we can implement to continue that uh, or to, to accelerate um, essentially unprecedented uh, growth within our uh, uh, existing zone capacity. Um, the, uh, the sites on the site inventory, we're not planning on rezoning any of these sites. This is already what we're already allowed to build. And uh, at the planning commission meeting um, last week, um, one of the commissioners brought up a, an interesting point, which is like, why do we spend so much time um, uh, on the review process for projects that already meet all of our standards, all of our general plan and zoning standards, and uh, that we actually can't legally disapprove. Um, so we really should be thinking about ways that we can streamline that process when, when we have to approve them anyway. Um, uh, we've made some recommendations to do that. I think there's a number of ways the, 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 the council could go about doing that, but I think that's a really uh, helpful way that, that we could um, encourage production in Santa Cruz that, that not a lot of other cities are looking at and help us uh, accelerate our, our production to meet our, our housing goals. Um, I also also wanted to agree with the last caller about the concern about about uh, UCSC's low income numbers. Um, would like to see some some more evidence from from the university that that uh, those units actually will be as affordable as we're hoping that they will be. But overall, uh, and finally, just one more thing about the affirmatively furthering fair housing. People have mentioned uh, using SB ten, uh, and uh, I think. Um, uh, Director Lee for pointing out that, that uh, SB 10 requires uh, a finding of affirmatively furthering for housing to use it. And uh, and we really should be uh, thinking creatively about, about uh, uh, replacing our segregated living patterns with integrated living patterns. And that's that's what using that tool would allow us to do. So I hope that we continue to, to push for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonnenfeld, for uh, for your participation in the process. Ms. Bush, one more? Two more, all right. Good evening. Good evening, Darius Mosinin here. A couple of uh, comments, one framed as a question. Is this basically this whole arena cycle, housing cycle, uh, essentially a paper exercise? It, it basically lays out a housing inventory. So, you know, where where units can be built but at the end of the day the city does not build housing developers build housing how many of these sites are either a too small for the big guys or too big for the small guys and then there's and then how financeable are some of these programs take a look at projects take a look at the urban uh the herb whatever the urban uh project with no parking requirements I, i'd be concerned if there's a lender out there that would finance such a potentially risky uh, endeavor yeah. housing with no parking so um, again it's comment slash question is, is this really uh, will we realistically see I, I predict maybe a quarter of the arena numbers would actually get built the second um i would be careful on using adus as a um hero of meeting uh helping the um Rita numbers, particularly in the climate of increasing tenant protections. We have now have SB 567 um, on the, on the uh, table where it looks to close loopholes in AB 1482, the Tenant Protection Act, in terms of just cause eviction. Tonight, as we, there are landlords in Oakland and Alameda County going to bed, going to sleep for the third year in a row 
with a tenant that hasn't paid rent in three years, committed numerous violations, breached, and they cannot evict them because of the moratorium. And, of course, Oakland, Alameda County, extreme uh, data points, I get it, but they are progressive cities, as is Santa Cruz. So it just established a, you know, a precedent that, yes, it is possible to have someone in your house as a roommate or a, or a junior ADU or on your property as an ADU that has you cannot get rid of. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. One more, Ms. Bush, is that correct? Good. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Ryan Meckel with Santa Cruz EMB here. Uh, to start with saying I agree with uh, whatever I agree with everything that Rafa said and with the caller prior to Rafa said about uh, accountability for those cost estimates for the university housing. You know, it'd be great to see some proof that they will be that low, and I do hope they are that low because we need more affordable housing for students in the city. Uh, I just wanted to add, well, first of all, I want to congratulate the city and staff for meeting the fifth cycle target. That is great work, and I believe, what, it's 6% of uh, jurisdictions have done that. So serious pats on the back all around. That's that's awesome. Um, just to make sure that we do hit that again for the sixth cycle, and I really hope that we do, but in order to hold ourselves accountable, I would love to see the city commit to a mid-cycle review. Uh, so at that four-year mark, halfway through this next cycle, looking at you know, how much production are we seeing and are we on track to meet that at the end of the eight years? And if we're not seeing that, have some policies, some incentives, maybe a rezoning plan, whatever staff deems you know appropriate to make sure we can up our production at that point and at the end of those eight years, meet or exceed our goals. Um, that's just one more thing I hope you consider. Uh, we also sent a letter in. I hope uh, you'll read that and consider those policies as well. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Very good. Matters back before the council. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, would like to make a motion, and I've sent multiple versions to Bonnie, but I, hopefully you got the last one. Um, just trying to respond to some of your questions and comments, Mayor. Um, and so, and it, I, I recognize the hour is late. I recognize these are new for you to see uh, here, and I. Also, just want to say they've mostly all been covered in our conversation here in the Q and A, uh, with the exception of one item, which I'm not even sure is in the right place. But um, yeah, I'd, li I'd like I'll... you to make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. There That's right. Go. I meant. I, I thought. I, I know made you meant to. There it is. Sorry. Uh, um, okay. So here's the motion. Um, <laughs> so the motion is to accept the six cycle draft housing element update with the following additions um, on page two dash eight under affordable housing. Uh, this is uh, a revision to the inclusionary, um, to objective 2.1, uh, to state, review the inclusionary ordinance to determine if amendments are needed to ensure that the inclusionary requirements provide the maximum number of affordable units or deeper levels of affordability without being a barrier to housing development while considering implications for how developers will use density bonus. I have included here uh, in italics and blue, the revision, including considering higher levels of affordability for density bonus projects and so on. That's the language that's in there. Um, add objective 2.1D uh, to state, consider implementing a program that increases workforce housing units in market uh, rate multifamily projects with adequate financial incentives. On page 2-17, add objective 3.7B to state, support and facilitate the efforts of the Santa Cruz City School District to provide housing for its employees. On page 2-18, housing assistance, we have a series here, uh, add policy 4.3 to state, provide protection for tenants from exorbitant rent, exorbitant rent increases or excessive application fees. Uh, I guess maybe that's an and. Um, add objective 4.3A to state support programs that provide legal assistance to tenants challenging unlawful rent increases. Uh, objective 4.3B to state consider an ordinance to ensure that rental applications follow the provisions of state law. And this is the one that's 
maybe out of place. Add objective 4.4 to state, consider rent stabilization measures for mobile home parks in accordance with new state law. And then um, on page 2-22, I believe I have found the location uh, to add language to objective 5.5B to state, in relation to HUD's upcoming equity plan requirements, evaluate the effectiveness of existing anti-displacement strategies and tools and present to council best practices and recommendations for additional anti-displacement policies and programs such as additional anti-retaliation policies and a revised first right of refusal to tenants displaced due to development and consider the establishment of a community-based displacement housing task force to advise the city council. There is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Under discussion, you may open, Ms. Brown. So I um, have included, uh, I've asked some questions about this. I know that uh, the mayor also asked some questions related to the possibility of including some of these um, more specific references. And um, so I, uh, I thought I'd give it a shot to get some of these into our, the language for the draft housing element uh, as we move forward. Annabelle. On the, on the motion, Ms. Contari Johnson. I just had um, questions about, sorry, can we put the motion back up, please? Speak on the motion. Speak on the motion. Uh, Where is it? I'm sorry. No, it's quite all right. Take your time. Take your time. We're fine. Oh, I can't move it. <laughs> okay, so uh, policy 4.3, provide protection for tenants from improvement rent increases or excessive application fees. Um, when you brought that up, Councilmember uh, Brown, um, Lee, could you remind us of what your response was? Was that in there? Was that covered somewhere? Go ahead. Mr. Butler. Thank you. Uh, we do have a large increase rent increase ordinance on the books. Um, and um, with respect to excessive application fees, I think there um, is a, the way, I think that frankly for every one of these, we need to have flexibility to wordsmith them okay. because yeah. um, this as, as written, it seems that um, the, the city might be doing some of these things and we may be working with partners to do some of those things. Um, and that's what I had mentioned previously is that if, if we were to look at um, an application fee, an individual um, uh, application fee that is um, used with a universal application, we would be seeking assistance likely from the housing authority, for example, mm -hmm. to see if they could help implement a program to that effect. And it, I don't see that that would be implemented in-house. So um, that's where, you know, if the council finds agreement on some or all of these policies, I would still be asking for uh, the council to give direction to us to come back and work with the subcommittee to work through how the actual policies are drafted. Okay, because I, yeah, what, I just. wonder if what we might do in that regard on that point is add to the motion uh, exactly that that uh, whatever direction is contained in here that we have added tonight is for the purpose of general direction here, you would come back with, with uh, the appropriate language after consulting with the subcommittee and so on. Is that how so it would work? Would that work? For yeah, you either a friendly that? amendment or if you want to amend your motion. Okay, either yeah, way. yeah, I'm happy to amend the motion. And, and I was going to say, you know, I had thought about uh, setting this up as a direction to work with a subcommittee on it so we can change that initial okay. part of the motion uh, too. Great. Right. Yeah. Ms. Bush, I, did you track that? Are we? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. I want to make sure. So, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so 
I, I think what we just did is said that these additions that are in blue that are being added by the council are being essentially referred to the council's subcommittee uh, and to the planning staff uh, to take the spirit of these uh, uh, directions and bring them to the council subcommittee with your recommendation for appropriate language <laughs> and for us to then consider that as whether we integrate or don't integrate that as we move along. We, Ms. Contar Johnson, you see where we're going with that? Is, yeah. Would that be okay? And it's all of it, right? No, the ones in blue are what you've added to what's in blue. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then I had one. That'd be all right with you? Yeah. Yeah. Be and I, ju you? I just, just to make it, to hopefully make your job a little easier here. Um, so the, it, the first sentence in that motion would be accept the six cycle draft housing element update uh, and uh, dr uh, um, direct uh, staff and the council subcommittee to consider the following additions for the final draft or for the draft. I, would, I like that. We start with that, then we go what the, through what those are. The direction is clear to do. Is that direction clear to you, sir? That, that is helpful as um, then we can wordsmith these and, yes, and exactly. come to um, an agreement both with the subcommittee now. I want to make sure you seconded that motion, I recall. Did, you, did you, you did. <laughs> you did. I knew it was somebody smart. <laughs> so, uh, I was about right. to, but you beat uh, me to it. I did. Well, I'll agree to it then. Um, uh, but I want to make sure that gets your issue. That gets to the issue, and so I won't ask a lot of the rest of the questions I had because I think that gets to the issue. But um, I, I do want to just say something about the, um, uh, if you could scroll down, the housing displacement task force that you brought up, Mayor. I think we just need to, and we will, we will all be really thoughtful about how that's formed, if if it's going to be formed, how that would be formed and, and what that looks like, because so, I have some concerns about that particular piece, but we can continue to discuss it in the subcommittee and then okay. move back. Very good. And Mayor, uh, Council, if I may, just yes, weigh sir. in on the motion. Um, I might also request an addition to referring it to staff and the subcommittee for consideration. It's also exploring feasibility, what's being recommended well, here. I just didn't hear Explore it. the feasibility, feasibility of what's being recommended, right. which is, you know, it's implied in consideration, but I want to be really clear that Objection, there's- Objection, Ms. Brown? No, no, no. no. Objection, Mr. Keeley, no. <laughs> All right, further on the motion, debate or discussion? I didn't Colder, I, think, certainly. I think the question was more for you just and maybe it, it doesn't need to be asked because it can be discussed at a later time but when you said excessive rent increases there's already some state law around that and there's like a certain percent so do you mean mm -hmm. in excess she looks like she wants to say something really what um, I think my intention in, in trying to address this is um, yes we do have an exorbitant rent increase ordinance on the books here and we ha there is statewide rent control and it is violate that those rules are violated constantly and tenants have no way to address them if they can't afford uh, an attorney and so we're talking about how um, we can support those kinds of protections being operationalized okay. in practice with okay. community partners. That, I mean, that's my intention. I'm not suggesting this, that we, the city start considering a program yeah. as I much just, as I would love it. Yeah, I just, for me, the word excessive just seems vague. And then, um, and I'm not gonna belabor the point, but we have had a rental in town for 19 years and we just started breaking even this year. And so when you say rent's expensive, mortgages are expensive. And on top of that, we pay the water and that's going up 100% in the next 10 years and I can only raise the rent a certain amount. And I don't wanna raise the rent, we don't wanna raise the rent more than that because we like the people that are living there and they're wonderful. And, and having said that, I know there's a lot of people in the community that ha are mom, pa, like landlords that are trying to do the right thing and I wouldn't wanna, unnecessarily penalize people with vague terms like exhort, I don't know what that means, like if without a percentage, and I know there's a percentages and we follow the percentages, and that's that's what I'm saying. Okay. Can, can we get Ms. help Brown? from staff on that? Sorry, no, um, because we have an ordinance on the books that's been adopted, and so whatever those figures are is what I'm talking about. Um, I wonder it's, if it's the already way exists. to go on that might be if that sentence read, provide protection for tenants from unlawful rent increases there uh, or that makes me happy. unlawful 
application fees. Perfect. Okay. I like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, you got that? Uh -huh. Or unlawful application fees. I don't know that there are laws on the application fees, but... Uh, It'll give us something we'll to see. research. Give us something yeah. to talk about in the subcommittee. That's what I'm <laughs> dying to find more items to talk about. All right. Hey, further comments? Uh, Ms. Bruner. Yeah, um, I... Some of my questions, I think, are being resolved in the fact that we added that intro first sentence because otherwise we'd be here wordsmithing. I see some duplic duplicative um, uh, direction potentially, and I have several questions. So thank you for um, incorporating that first sentence, and um, I hope that staff and the subcommittee can explore each of these um, uh, suggestions that are being asked to be considered. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, very, very last comment. Uh, thank you and all of your staff. Please get in contact with Ms. Donovan. Yeah. Tell her yes. that we all said thank yes. you. Yes, thank you We're for saying that. We're happy about her retirement, oh. not happy about her retirement. So, uh, but thank her. She was terrific during this portion of the process. Thank you very much. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Mr. Bruner. Aye. Mr. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Holder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. Is there further business to come before the council? Seeing and hearing none, a motion to adjourn will be in order. The vice mayor moves to adjourn. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Newsom seconds, not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Aye. No. We stand in recess. Sandy, Sandy, all night. What a kid. No. <laughs>